Wie war er? Hi, Emily. Hi, Jim. We have some mysteries to solve at the museum today. Are you ready to investigate? I am ready. Let's do it. As you know, we've been around for over 125 years. Yeah. And this is a big building. There are hidden uh, rooms in here. There are cabinets that we have to go through. Okay. And it's part of a, like a bigger question I want to talk about, about like what makes a museum collection museum collection? Because you know we have artifacts, we have dinosaurs, we have mammals and plant specimens. We have all sorts of things that people are actively researching. But we also have collections in this building that people aren't actually researching. They don't really fit into what our museum does. Yeah. So what do we do with those specimens? We make YouTube videos about them. Yay. <laughs> what we're going to look at today are, are objects, objects that I found in the collection that I had to sort of identify and figure out what its value was. Not necessarily monetary value, but scientific value. Yeah. And if it's something that we want to keep at the museum. I'll tell you, I'll show you how I went through that. I'm going to put my ignorance on full display to the world because I know nothing about this stuff. This isn't my area of specialty. So when I went down to the mineral collection one day, I looked in one of the cabinets that had no specimens in it. And I looked into the upper shelf and I saw, saw two Hey you, what's up, Cast? Out of the drawer. So I climbed up on the ladder, pulled it out, and it ended up being this large. Yes, this is what I want. Obviously, something. Chapter three is microbiology. Um, so I, I flipped but I was it just over looking at page sixty. Is that in the section? Yes. Okay. I did find a tip. I have all these old MCAT books from one of my mom's friends at work. His son went to med school. And but we also have this collection called. He gave me like all of his study books, so I have a bunch of like physics and chemistry ones in here. Um, I'll get to okay. those at some point. I need to freshen up on some chemistry. I desire no physics, though. Collection from Tiffany and donated to the museum when we first I'm write about some bacteria. Specimen. This card quartz disc. Wow. And you can see a crack running through it. It was like it when I found it. It looks like a like a baby scene. Uh, apparently, it's Moses uh, being put into the river. And yes, the this is what I want. That I found was actually bacterial envelope by Tiffany and Company in New York. But at some point, the two pieces got separated from one another. And I don't I remember the difference the between so I can't gram positive and gram so negative the frame envelopes. Was around 1880 or so. So how old is this disc then? So well, I don't know. And and the object next to me over here, this carved jeweled casket, as it's described as, is a kind of a similar quartz carving. So this material. Under this one. Yes. So the the carvings in the in the clear material itself, that's actually quartz. Wow. So and the rest of it's in brass and it has jeweled inlays. Like this one's kind of a random video. I want some. Yes, I want eggs. I want to learn about egg. I love Emily. Eggs! There's so much more than just a breakfast food. Each egg tells the story of a bird's ecology and behavior, and the Field Museum houses one of the largest egg collections in North America. Dr. John Bates isn't just I'm baby, baby and I don't understand bio at all. Dude, I got you. Bio is the one thing I know. Bio and geology. There's gonna be some geology videos at some point, because I love me some rocks and, their appearance. and, and earth. I took like a... one of them was like about the earth and stuff well, not a lot and of people have mostly a lot of focused on like it's different a, types of rocks like sedimentary really and igneous and, time, and metamorphic and so like it was just like different sections of that throughout the semester and then the next semester I took one that was like on like rocks and climate which was really really interesting I think I have the books for both of them too so that's really exciting. there's a lot of variability in eggs themselves. I will try my best to help you. can look at just the extreme differences in size. I like geodude. We brought Geodudes, out some of the largest cool and smallest things, so you can start small. Let's do that. These are long-tailed sylphs, which are some hummingbirds mm -hmm. from the Peruvian Andes. These are their eggs, and they look okay. like little chicklets. This yeah, they look like the little outer breath layer. mints or, you know? or gum. Or, they're like the size of a Tic Tac. Yeah, much. and you think about this basic Brand. biology of these birds, and you know, they're all hummingbirds lay only two eggs. Really? And then you go up in size, and you get to something like this. This is an elephant bird. It's a real Capsule, one, which, which is, is very rare, layer. actually. Uh, these birds evolved on Madagascar with no predators and so they invested everything into one or two zoom. eggs okay. they were easy pickings when a big predator like a human came along that was able to find them these are birds that Dude, were living I in love Madagascar this so much. until it's the time so the first cool. humans got there about 600 to 700 years ago and they went extinct camp. pretty quickly yeah. after that so you call it an Blanger. elephant bird how big was this bird Compared to a modern ostrich, these things were taller and about twice as wide. And as a comparison, yeah. this is like 
an yeah. ostrich egg. It is, and, and so ostriches. Sure. I've been doing so many MCAT flashcards with lots of predators around, and they tend I have to, to remember very what large all these clutches. terms mean. Yeah, it's like in the same I have nest, a notebook. And so they often see of about that 20 I'm gonna to never have eggs. to buy then you a got this little anomaly over blows here. Blows my mind. Do you know how much paper I go through in here? And in some ways, they're sort of like me as an individual. I go through so many notebooks. Zealand, and they have no predators to speak of, and so they could afford to invest everything in this incredibly large egg. And it takes up to forty percent of the female's body cavity by the time they're ready to lay. Wow. Got to figure so out. So that's what like that the means. equivalent of me giving birth to like a fifty-pound baby or something. Yeah, absolutely. And it's and so it's you know, birds have figured out lots of different ways to do things, and a lot of that's related to the different pressures they have on the natural history of the area from the area they're living in. There's a lot of energy that has to go into making an egg, but then you also have to make sure that Cytosol. it hatches. So clutch size that eggs is. in I'll birds is, is varies quite mm -hmm. a bit, and sometimes it varies for really bizarre reasons. The other reasons. things so need instance, like texture, but cytosol is just uh, collection a of smoothbilled annies. That's fine. And this is a species of cuckoo, and actually that's again a I nest think where I want multiple this females and I want definitions the same below nest. it before I draw the next one. There'll be a hierarchy among the females, and the oldest female will be the last female to lay. The Successively, more dominant females Dude, will throw out where are my of, uh, other species or the other individuals up until the time they get. Oh my gosh! Did this the really just give me a drawings and no so definitions? How many eggs does one? What kind of MCAT book is this? Like? So six Nonsense. to seven or so. Nonsense. So six to seven, and then the bird A lays six. There's pepsidoglycan. Thank you. And is like, mm, I was about to get real mad at this book. I was like, how are they supposed to study? Eventually, six or seven birds that are all laying in one. Yeah, because you got to incubate the eggs and you got to get them to hatch on time or, or in a situation where you can actually feed them. So one bird is laying on a Remember when I wanted to get my PhD? Once, trying to get them all to hatch? Yes, mm -hmm. and then the, the group will actually feed them. There's 25 eggs in here. Yeah, you know they, that old saying, all your eggs in one basket? Well, it basically came about because there are all these various strategies for how to do things with respect to, to how many eggs you computer. should lay. So this That's is so a strange. Laysan albatross and a bird that just showed up on Laysan Island where these albatrosses breed. And it's 60 well, I just downloaded Windows. Laid an egg and hatched a chick successfully. And so it just goes to show you that birds oh, can do this. Oh, I guess when I got the computer, I thought you meant like, oh, Microsoft and stuff. I don't think I'll be, no. oh, okay. <laughs> not, Why? I'm not, well, I'm certainly not going to be laying That mean I have to reinstall all the games and everything, too? I have the little USB thing that it all goes into. Yeah. And then what about this clutch here? Because four of these eggs look similar, but one of the eggs is not like the other. And this is a species called brown-headed cowbird, which is a member of the oriole and blackbird family. So the blackbird with a brown head like is a there. male, and then the, the female is the brown outside. bird. And mm -hmm. she's what's called a brood parasite. She's incredibly okay. good at basically mating Theories with the male and then going around and looking for places to lay her eggs. And in this case, she laid her eggs in the clutch of a yellow Dye warbler saccharide. nest. The yellow warblers most of the time will not recognize the egg. That egg will hatch. Okay. That chick will actually force the other chicks out of the nest and the yellow warblers will raise oh, a brown-headed cowbird chick to adulthood, which will then go off and actually find other brown-headed cowbirds later. Are they not at all confused? With amino acids. On, like, these I have to remember the amino acids. Laying on this giant egg that, was a that thing hatches I and looks yesterday. nothing like, I was like what shit. their baby should look like. Do you think that they question it for a second? Oh, I think they must, but at the same yeah. time, it's like I think there's an innate desire to feed your chicks okay. that overcomes that amino. and they just go ahead and, and will feed that chick without even thinking about it. And you, when you see the fledglings, I mean, they're so much bigger a lot of times than the adults that are being parasitized that it's really something. Mm -hmm. Then we also, you know, wanted to point out there's a lot of role reversal in birds with respect to, to what happens. So this is a wattle jasana, which is a bird has got these very long toes. They live on lily pads and they're found throughout the, the neotropics. And you'll notice this mm -hmm. is a bird that has some very big spurs on its okay. wings and it's a female. And what? In this bird, the mm. females are bigger than the males. They set up a territory, and the males come, and they mate with the males, and they lay these incredibly beautiful eggs, which uh, are Thank laid you. on wet vegetation, so they blend in perfectly. So the males are actually doing the incubation, and the females are actually out defending the territory. Yeah, they're, Oh, those are lethal. Yeah, and these are the same kind of things that show up in birds like chickens. And, and in chickens, it's actually the males that have them. And, they have uh, spurs on their ankles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really wouldn't want that flying in my face. Yeah. That would be... That'd be dangerous. This just means 
So, John, like, how many birds are there? There's like so a about 10, connection here. There's like a birds. connection here. Do they all they're have both different eggs? Yeah. Like they're, they all they're and, interlinked. And some of them that's are actually that's pretty what similar. That means. So you can make mistakes identifying and some of them are just plain like, white. We decided to two of them, like, stuck go together on like a chain plain white eggs today. So here's a year or two, and they live in these family groups in the open countries of South America, south of the Amazon basin. And the eggs start off powdery white, and then the powder wears away, and there's a blue brown color underneath. So you get these spectacularly looking eggs. Then you look around and, and you can see there are okay. lots of birds that lay blue eggs. This is a wren-like rush bird from South America. Is there any explanation for why blue is such a popular there, egg color? There really isn't, um, you know, and so they're all different curious. families have blue eggs, and so it may just be that the byproducts that are being used to make color in eggs are actually pretty easy to get. But then you'll get something that's completely different, like this is a SETI's warbler from uh, okay. Southern Europe. Wow. Yeah, good for I've never seen like an egg that color. Yeah. There's also this glossiness, so this is a great Tinamou, which is just part of this big family oh, of South annoying. American birds that run around on the ground and eat fruit and insects and things. They just have these spectacularly oh glossy Thank eggs you. of different colors. I will try. What about an egg like this? So this is from an emu, and emus are emu. Australian birds distantly related to ostriches and elephant birds and kiwis, and they I know my favorite country says, and why they're but the guy who had this book good before question. me. Wouldn't it just cook the I know what the heck. embryo inside? So His handwriting sometimes says over here. that can actually be a good thing, even, right? Because one of the things that has to happen is that egg has cursing? to be kept warm. Or like, maybe that's just a way that the female can like lay on it. Maybe not have to spend so much energy. She's like, these are going to be toasty either way. Yeah, that would be an interesting hypothesis. My guess would be that you'd find that there would be less time spent on the nest than there would be. Why do these look like magnets? Ostrich or a Rio or something. Like I can't even understand his handwriting enough to like really get this. There's a P and there's like a pie. Sort of painterly looking. Are you talking about the link? Yeah. So these are belong to. This looks like diffusion to me. One of the interesting things about the way eggs form is they come out of the ovary into the. I like. I don't want that. This is actually twisting in the ovary as it's coming down, and that leads to these patterns. And then there are shell glands that put on the shell. And in addition, there are other cells that can put on melanin to give color. I don't know what that is. Something like a common. Okay, so it is diffusion because over here it's talking about osmotic pressure, hypertonic, and stuff. These big colonies. Okay, egg at a time. you can get and away with that. the ability to do is actually lay that egg and actually have it's it look diffusion. unique relative to the other individuals around it. I have to remember it, all the diffusion stuff because that's really you know important with little cells. Back and forth to the colony as they incubate. Possible oh, wow. yeah. This is another aspect of eggs, which is shape. These guys have what's called a piriform mm -hmm. shaped egg. Blah, 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 One of the hypotheses blah, blah, blah. for this is that these birds are nesting on cliffs and that this keeps the egg from actually rolling around on the cliff. And it's another it's one of those great mysteries in general. Test. Am I going to have to look this up? So John, in the beginning, okay. you sort of mentioned how egg collecting has gone out of fashion, largely part of, um, Blippi because Blippi. of increasing protections for birds. What I guess that's why we have the tablet. This question in particular have, have I feel kind of attacked that there like aren't as many definitions yeah, well, it's easy to forget for what I want. a tremendous amount of information in the historical It's like I should already know this. Actually having a presentation of these in collections can be really useful for documenting all kinds of and things. Like you and probably these should, eggs are a perfect example still. of that. These are modern peregrine falcon eggs. This is one of these stories that most people have, have yeah. heard, which is that back in the 60s that. and 70s, peregrine falcons were laying eggs. It's like a serial killer's last note. <laughs> would sit on the eggs and they would crack. The scientists Felt seemed cells. to realize <laughs> that they thought this eggshell thinning was being caused by a pesticide called DDT, which was percolating up Leave through up the there. food chain Dude. into the yes. things that peregrine falcons ate and leading to eggshell thinning. And peregrines basically went extinct huh. in the eastern part of the U.S. And I remember how by, to do things. Uh, 1970 or so. Since then, Is people have like actually him? made a and real I concerted effort to Aeroplast establish peregrine space. falcons in major metropolitan areas across the Midwest. And so our own Mary Hennon, who works in birds and uh, is a assistant collection manager for the last 30 matrix. years, has been monitoring the peregrine falcon eggs across Chicago. And we can also compare them to historical eggs and look at what the changes have been since DDT has uh, been banned. <laughs> wasn't, yeah, wasn't the Field Museum's bird collection sort of one of the collections that was consulted to go and measure the egg shell thickness of birds? Uh, that peregrine falcons that laid eggs before the use of DDT versus during the time of DDT? It was, and, and, and I always like to point out that, that one of the interesting things about egg collections is ours is one of the largest in, Ooh, in North America, but there, there are lots of other small collections, huh. and these guys had to yeah, go around yeah, in order yeah. to assemble a big enough database. They were able to narrow it down both within the species that <laughs> were affected 
and in the I'm still like trying to figure out like how I have to hold down the reasons why DDT was banned. That's pretty good science. It was. It was. There we go. Really expe- <laughs> I no? loved, it's a great example yes. of scientific design. Yeah. So this is a pretty fragile collection that. Aha. That needs <laughs> a lot of we got it, guys. Yeah. We got it. You know, there's just things we don't know. And again, I like to call it avian pediatrics because <laughs> this is literally like you know we all go to doctors when we're kids that specialize in young uh, people. <laughs> Consistent two and three these are three young birds. Yeah. So uh, oh, come here to the field museum. Good doggo. And check out the egg collection. Make some yes, discoveries. Do some science. Hang out with John. Me. See the eggs. Yeah. Ooh, Royal Society. That's going to be a great definition. The region between. He still has brains on him. We have a very special guest here today on The Brain Scoop. We are visited by Kendall Long, Hello who there. was a contestant <laughs> on The Bachelor and The Bachelor in Paradise. And uh, today we're going to dissect some owl pellets. They're actually from yes. Kendall County, owl Illinois. Owl pellets. Mm-hmm. Meant to be. Yeah, and they are from a long-eared owl, we learned. Kendall Long. Kendall Long. So it's yes. double meant to be. Like, I can't show you guys anything yeah. gory because um, it's yeah, against these are just, uh, US, collected from a single roost, so. This is fun. One first pick. It's owl pellet. Pick your pellet. This guy looks really... I remember so my. You uh, are a lifelong lover of it? zoology. Yeah. Has taxidermy always my been a part of that? My lab partner in yeah, uh, my freshman year of biology in high school so was a total was wimp, a and uh, kid, we couldn't get like certain pieces out of the bones. I think the first um, museum I went to and I was actually like, along a hiking trail. And got in there with like my hands so that I could there, get stuff out. California, so they had um, bobcats and mountain that was fun. lions and all kinds of really cool Oh yeah, you there. dissect so owl pellets a lot. Did it in really middle school, did it in high school. Seeing all the details of everything. My did first mountain I ever got was this forehead uh, and his name Oh, that's another snow. time my that uh, my partner almost threw up. So we did that in seventh grade. My sister took a picture of me and I'm like, Chris <laughs> almost really grew up so because um, I feel like I make our frog was the only one that was pregnant, so there was an egg That's sack in there. The you're, you're and then, uh, <laughs> yes, yeah, oh, my lab partner in yeah. senior AP like bio, uh, who was like, also named Chris, yeah. um, we were dissecting the pigs, yeah, it's like and the smell of the pigs really got to think. Oh, just a taxidermy phase. That was a fun time. It, you, you still haven't grown I, still I was like in charge of dissection. Yeah. <laughs> you also, mm-hmm. as we mentioned, were a contestant on, I believe, season 22 of The Bachelor. Yes, with Ari. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, how did you, one, become a contestant on the show, and two, when did your interest in taxidermy sort of come brought to light? <laughs> come out? I never really imagined myself being somebody that would be on the show because it just seemed like all these girls going for one guy, like, why would I do that? Um, but I was watching the show with my sister, and I might have had a glass of wine. Um, and I was like, I don't do it. So I did it, and I signed up, and they called me the next day, but the words that I said were, I am a ukulele okay, so playing taxidermy collecting Okay, so I don't because this win. is... And I think right then they're like, that's someone that's... Yeah. It's intriguing. We haven't, we haven't had that yeah. type yeah. on the program before. We've had taxidermy ukulele <laughs> playing people who aren't twins. But not the twins, no. so that was the key element. <laughs> But, and I think they encouraged taxidermy throughout the entire experience. Yeah. So they had my roommates, like, you know, let them in and they brought, like, some of my taxidermy to show Ooh. Ari and, uh... The Bachelor. Yeah, Bachelor. And cool. he, you know, I, he was, he wasn't, he was kind of into it, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> and then you had the opportunity to oh pick God, a one-on-one date with Ari, yeah. the Bachelor. Well, and can you tell me a little bit about all. that hometown. experience? I remember yeah. 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 The hometown date is initially supposed to be something where you can take The Bachelor to your home and show them more about you and your life and your family. Yeah. And so um, I initially wanted to do a picnic at a cemetery because they're really beautiful. A and picnic then at another a cemetery. Idea, well, I've never done taxidermy before. I've never actually physically made taxidermy because I've always wanted to do it. Yeah. I mean, I had tried before, but never really succeeded. And they're like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's a good idea. So, um, yeah, we just ran with it. What was yeah. your taxidermy just that you made with like The goo. Bachelor? We made little bride and groom rats. <laughs> I actually came in a day early to learn how to do it. So mm-hmm. I actually had made a mount beforehand. And so I was like pretending to be like a big professional, like, oh yeah, you just do this and this. Sure. And yeah. You but were like, you're learning on the fly. Yeah, I'm like shaking as I'm like stitching it up. <laughs> yeah, they look great. <laughs> Maybe I made that one. <laughs> that might have oh, been the one cute. that I made. <laughs> yeah, okay. Might not have been. <laughs> sure. Do you think that 
that experience um, helped him to better appreciate taxidermy as an art form? I think so. I think initially he was very weirded out by the whole taxidermy thing, um, as most people okay. tend to be. This and is so how I this works. I'm going to have to draw another drawing of this and then have like, and she yeah. has like an appreciation for it. Like so round I think thing. he learned to appreciate my yeah. love of taxidermy. This is yeah. like... I, I see taxidermy as almost like... That is me. the capsule. I don't know if I see it as death. I mean, of course, they're dead, but it's... And then there's like, like the thick peptidoglycan layer. Yeah, it's you know. the representation of, yeah. of you know, not just this individual, but all and all this is cytosol. Exactly. So cytosol what would be and the, the stuff. audience's reaction? Okay, that makes more sense. I imagine you saw. I was like, why can't I visualize this? It's the goo. It's, it's the goo that everything flows in. It's the social media element of everything because it's all kind of happening live as the show's being aired. I mean, you have to you put your life publicly out there for everyone to have an opinion about and for people feel like such a strong connection, almost like a friendship with people mm -hmm. that are on social media. And I did not get the best of reactions. I think a lot of people saw me as like a hunter or a killer or someone that like tortured animals. There were actually a lot of people that were saying thank you for being somebody that is not afraid to express your interest in taxidermy and for celebrating it. But um, mm -hmm. yeah, it's not really a popular for the bachelor demographic to <laughs> there's a bunch well, of that's I think was so interesting that that you use this platform and and use it to educate i mean you yeah. know if you, you, you didn't have to have to do that so it's disaccharide sort of unit and then all these are going to be the right? you're amino acids out there there's yes not, you're not, oh my like, gosh I remember an audience something. around this topic but you're introducing this topic that Vitals has a lot of stuff guess, most cells are just yeah like goo yeah. lots of goo and, and you're taking a chance they're made out of a lot of cytosol and admirable every little cell got a little floaties in there educate people about taxidermy and its importance and appreciation. Just think of like the capsule is like the skin together. Do you get any hate for loving taxidermy on your profile? Not not really. Um, but I think it's just because when I started making YouTube videos for the Brain Scoop, which was amazingly six years ago, it was sort of like from the very beginning that this is what I wanted to talk about. Because like you, like I couldn't change my passion and so yeah. I also didn't know if there was maybe something wrong with me because I'd never seen that sort of the enthusiasm right or right love there. demonstrated for death or I was like, why did I want like to do the decomposition I process and I was really into it and so I sort of realized when I had the opportunity to start making YouTube videos Pills and structure, maybe ooh, I would just do yeah this is exactly the stuff that I know. Thought, There's a lot of stuff in bio like, that really doesn't interest you know, me. me off the internet, I'm just internet, at really least excited about like tiny like, stuff. I and that's why I yeah, like, um, was, I, I was it? also in the same boat. That's why I like geology like, on like a structural way. People like the same thing that I like. Way. Watching Brain like when you think about amazing rocks because I was and, like, oh, it's actually the platform that shows things know, I'm really interested in. And things. not only like, is it just like a female that's into this, all the structure of them is so fascinating depending on like the heat and yeah, the particles was, and the pressure and everything. Very fascinating. <laughs> it makes me so happy. I'm a big fan. Yeah. <laughs> See, now I'm going to crack. Yeah. <laughs> but there is a lot oh of my God. <laughs> running the taxidermy rebrand. I agree. There needs to be a taxidermy rebrand. You're so much more impacted when you see something in life as opposed to on TV. I know. I've been watching the brain scoop since literally so Hank was interviewing like Emily in that one video. Watching things vicariously on the screen. Yeah. Never as I've met as Emily. Real thing up He's close. cool people. Like, can you really see what's inside? The saccharide, and then yeah. you're gonna have all these. <laughs> you can't, but I can't because it's all over my hands. <laughs> yeah, I'm touching it. Is uh, ooh, I, I found part of a skull. Ooh. Well, that's exciting. Hey now, see, look at this fun adventure. <laughs> I strongly encourage everybody to pick apart an owl pellet one time in their life. Yeah. Oh, it's so much fun. You never know what you're going to find. It's like an Easter egg. The skeleton is coming together Holy nicely. I know, I'm finding all, all sorts of little pieces. Oh wow, pieces. you're really going at it. That's really good. Mink. I think I'm just too picky. Yeah. <laughs> that was a pun. <laughs> so now that we have, we've each dissected out a little owl pellet, they need a little bit more cleaning. I know, what's happening? They're going to be uh, identified and put in the museum. What That's is fun. that? Mm -hmm. So glad you I don't know what that, that is either. Yeah. Isn't that fun? The why bio yeah, stuff? Because yeah. well, I'm doing a whole yeah, science yeah. channel really called Microsis. Let me plug yeah, it. Awesome. <laughs> I haven't made yeah. a video in two years. Um, Microsis, Facebook, Microsis, YouTube. This is my channel. I don't want to watch my own video, but you know, there will be new videos probably starting in September.
Um, I oh, plan to film everything in August. I plan to have hey, five scripts we're gonna done. Do an Ask Emily video by the end of um, questions and I July. If that doesn't work out, I want at least three. Let's go. But um, yes, microsis, microbiology, wolf general wolf biology, love, science, mostly Hi, tiny Emily. things because it would interest me. Items such as fossils, the things like or historical items um, from private collections, what is it? vaccines or like and rocks. And like I said, artifacts. geology. And the answer is it's a, a lot of bacteria, a lot of viruses, donations if the diseases, of that material is sound. stuff like that. Probably nutrition at some point. That the item or but you know, has that general area. That's why it's called microsis because it's generally like the tagline is science starts small. Went down to Munsey, Indiana to pick up the I've been working on this, so I have to actually study because I haven't been a bio major in a bit. Late Dr. Byron um, Tork, who was a long-time yeah. faculty member at Ohio State research. University, and remember a all my basics. Of shells. His widow Sally oh my gosh, those sweaters! I see, I see. Tasteful version. I gotta see the but not so tasteful version. Is that that one that? Yes. Oh my god, too. I've seen that Last sweater year, before. A field museum trustee went to an auction and picked up an original pancake camera. That's hilarious. The style that was invented by the field's first chief taxidermist, Carl Aikley. Okay. That's good. That bacterial envelope. One more sub to a hundred. Invented one of the first motion Wait, did you sub? In order to <laughs> did someone sub? I saw 98. 99. Aw, tank tank. Such a history at the field museum. This and video has almost 13,000 views, which I think is just like wild. I don't so, know you know. That. Ten. Nice. Asked, got any Microbiology. My niche. The general public I must return to it. <laughs> oh, definitely. We relocated Sue last year, and you wouldn't believe what happened during the move. Thank you for supporting my it endeavors. It was wild. <laughs> just kidding. Sue was carefully dismantled in the field's main hall and reassembled in their own gallery space last year. Some mm, updates okay, were made so to the we skeleton's did. bones Grand and positive. the crew on Sue's Australia, aka belly ribs, because it took researchers a few years to figure out how they were supposed to fit on the body. Unless you're paying really Reading's close attention, pie, slides, you might just miss thank you, Edgar. Aw, oh, thank you, Cassin. <laughs> on the you guys are good people. I love you. <laughs> thank you. We hit 100. <laughs> Do you have oh my God. any idea Just how many meetings they must have had to discuss the details of that pooping scene? Many. Many. It's the biggest many. Many. Anyway, yeah. You come want see that so. microbial content? And also super scary. Aaron Ambrosiani at Aaron Ambrosiani yeah. asks, My and kid, six years old, is wondering how the researchers figured uh, out the age of the T Rex. I need to go back to die. the black pen. So, scientists can figure out the age of a dinosaur and, and many other I'm vertebrates by carefully looking at their bones. As you age and grow, your body puts 100 out new layers special of is your comeback. <laughs> counted when you cut a cross section of that bone. Just like Stop. At <laughs> this field of research is called ontogeny, Edgar is never okay. It's the study of an Shouldn't we know this development. By now? So, it was thought that. Sue was about 28 years old when they died. Juan Perez at Get Some Marines asked, back to what are the chances of, all, of an so interview with inside. Sue the T-Rex? I'd love to see my two favorite field museum residents in the same video. We are here in the Griffin Dinosaur Experience at the Field Museum That's interviewing enough. Sue the Tyrannosaurus Rex, the largest, most complete Tyrannosaurus Rex ever found, excavated outside of Faith, South Dakota, where my family happens to also have a ranch with uh, cows on it. And I'm um, here to interview Sue about there. what it's, uh, how they're feeling about being in their new posh sides. space in okay. their, in their, their humble abode. Sue, what, what do you, what do you think? Um, we'll put that in blue. Mm -hmm. That's right. Uh, Sue can't respond because they're incredibly dead. Kevin Bakkenstein's, I'm sorry, Kevin. Hot uh, Cheetos Sue and Renegade watermelon asks, and water. What animal would you most like what to dissect on boy. camera? <laughs> I want to know what the inside of a platypus looks like. They're so bizarre that in 1799, when George Shaw at the British Museum was writing up a description of a platypus that had been sent to Europe, he was fairly certain it was a hoax, it saying, was quote, it naturally excites the idea of some deceptive preparation by artificial means. You know, I would have really loved to have we'll been there when Shaw was writing up a description for this thing. Between. There was no literature to consult, no images or artwork, mm -hmm. just a dude in a museum in England with this bizarre mm -hmm. dried animal skin from a place else. he had never visited. We'll it's like the 18th remember. century version of looking a at lot an image more pieces today to and trying this. to figure out if it's photoshopped or not. Like, the first time someone sent me a photo layer, of a lobster moth caterpillar, that. I thought it was faked. Someone who worked in the insect division told me for sure Absolutely. it was photoshopped, but it's not. 
Lobster moth caterpillars are real and they're weird and they don't even look like lobsters. Cheyenne Schneider, Che Shu, asks, I started prepping at my university's museum. Really hard being on your really guest. Frustrated. I'm constantly worried uh, about messing up Dino. and I feel like my work will never be as good as you, as but also Did you ever Dago's feel like this? And how long did it take you to gain confidence in your preps? Of course, Dan I Schneider, felt like no. this. It's don't bring up the feet thing the again. Beginning. You're learning a new thing that requires a really unusual set of Dramatic. skills. Plus, there are sometimes weird smells and the squishy insides of an animal can be kind of gross at first. There's a lot going on, but it does get easier over time with practice. When I was in art school, I remember complaining to my friend Lewis that I was unhappy with my paintings. Oh yeah, I love that Emily is like an art better. student who me, does all the science stuff in a museum. Done. There's hope for and me. I realized it was probably I'd love to work in a museum. Honestly, probably that happens less than with it. that point. Feeling secure in something takes time and repetition. It's something it I really to looked into in high school. So you could keep a journal and write down one new thing you've learned that day, and in a few months, you'll be amazed by all of these little incremental Better victories. Man. I believe in you. Kevin gets a twofer in this episode. Kevin at Zoo Renegade asks, there have been a lot of alarming messages about a worrisome global decline in insect populations. What can museums do to help combat this yeah. crisis? In the last few years, there have been a number of not just alarming, but hyper alarming reports and studies that indicate insect populations have plummeted in the last 40 years, sometimes by as much as 60 or 75% of overall biomass. A recent report from the journal Biological cool. Conservation estimates Indeed. that 40% of all insects. At one point, um, what is it? Just because you said cool decades, and that spelling and reminded me of Jewel. And, and um, distributions of what many is it? animal groups, including insects. I so want to do a video about uh, not only. Only like comparing different types of caffeine, species have been which I find I find really interesting. So like in tea and coffee changing. and like in sodas and energy drinks, um, like pills and concentrated caffeine. Uh, but so really I want to do a video on that. But then I also want to do a video on like smoking and, and the different kinds of smoking. So like how um, what is it? cigarettes affect you, jewels, vapes, and environmental pollution. So you as a voter and a citizen, and then like marijuana, how like all those things affect you. Make a heroin video. <laughs> representatives that care about environmental policy. In the meantime, you can help by creating habits yeah, maybe how they affect insects, different like types of cells gardens. in you. You can support nature centers in your community and help educate your friends and family on why you insects are not only and super out the poem. cool animals, but of vital importance to any habitat. They're the foundation on which biodiversity thrives. Have you filled you ten dollars as an apology Percy for John stealing Percy your poems? Asks, what are the best ways to support your local and national museums? <laughs> if you can, you should <laughs> gotta, visit gotta them. Get that participate in their programs and go to their events. Many museums make budget projections for the coming year based on fun guy, dude. I love me some fun guy. So if a museum gets extra foot traffic one year, they might expect the same traffic the next year. But if there are visitors, then programs, departments, and people can get mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell. Can also support their work by following the chloroplast is media, or the mitochondria the of the plant. <laughs> traffic, like foot traffic, is often yeah, those are brain things. Well. At one time, so I'll talk, talk about brain about things, but I need to get a brain. Facts, neat That's when that video is going to come up. I have to. I probably have to go to like a butcher or something and see if they or have like if you can, a brain of any animal. Just give us money. I just need something to cut up, guys. Technoplasm, aka Fun guy. Millen asks, "Do you ever find it hard to stay positive <laughs> about nature video natural history?" I'd love to just do a dissection video of a mushroom to like show all the pieces. Yes. If you haven't noticed, I really want to dissect really things hard. on the show. <laughs> on those days, I stay home and watch the birds. Fun like guy. <laughs> Every single day of my life, I learn something new and fascinating okay, so we got that makes bacterial me envelopes. Let, let's do some fungi. All over again. Why not? Whether it's researching lobster moth caterpillars or Let how platypuses fungies. secrete mm -hmm. milk right out of their skin or how scientists figure out how to The fact that they use like spores to reproduce is so fascinating. But it also sometimes brings me sadness to know that there are people who do not appreciate this information or find joy in learning about platypus mm -hmm. lactation. But what makes me really happy is to share this wonder in the hope that it helps others who didn't know they cared about this stuff to care oh, wow. too. Because learning about something this is actually cool doesn't have that much on it. Thing. So when you watch our yeah. videos or share I have cool more complex on notes on fun guy. Maybe there'll be something that, that I do next week. Hope and keeps me positive. Thanks Being to everybody clear. who sent in questions. Sorry if I didn't get to yours, but feel free to leave one in the comments I have to below find someone. We'll try to who can give me a uh, brain? The next couple weeks we have but I also live in San Antonio, so like people eat brains of animals, so like are going to I should be able to find something. A place very close to my heart. Gotta be some pretty soon. And that's all I'm gonna say. Endospores. OG brain scoop fans are gonna be super jazzed. That's all I'm saying. Okay, anyway, yes. I've said too much. Thanks for watching. Bye. <laughs> Go hunting for some brains. <laughs>
four cut. Hmm. Hmm. It still has brains on it. Analyze chlorophyll. This episode is brought to you through animals. collaboration with the Smithsonian's oh National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. That's the most me thing DC, that you've written. And the Field Museum in That's Chicago, wild. Illinois. I feel like I want to write a poem from that perspective now. Someone DM'd me yesterday. He had never read any of my hey, poems, so my and so I told him to send some to him. Capital, but and one of my poems, left, he thought, he was like, oh wow, that was like really deep. Was that like about like racism? And I was like, it was actually just about a really sad rock after being uh, on the top of a mountain who didn't like his view. Five mm-hmm. years. When it's done, but visitors yes. will be able to learn <laughs> about the history of our planet from the formation of the Earth to present day with a look to the future. To help us understand this concept of time, let's use the Washington Monument as a scale bar. Here's the formation of our planet down here at the base 4.5 billion years ago. The earliest evidence of life took the form of single-celled organisms around I forgot, a billion there was this later. really then, good the first multicellular book life shows up. Very that I'm gonna have to, I haven't logged in to uh, explosion my mom's here. library oh, and here's for uh, the university she works at not a dinosaur, on but my tablet. I know I have it on my laptop, ago, we get our earliest yeah. dinosaurs, but they have really good microbiology books, wiped out by an asteroid here. which is exciting for me. The first known me. flowering plant is pretty late to the party, Different but honestly, protein. so are we. Viruses. The earliest humans, Homo habilis, evolved ah, yes. a little over two million years ago. Let's talk about some bacteriophages. Didn't make it on the map until just this around 300,000 years ago, right up here. To get an Another perspective on this concept of deep time, I went to chat with Dr. Kirk Johnson. He's the SANT director of the Natural History Museum and a paleobotanist. He studies fossil plants and has been working on the deep time hall renovation project for years. So how do you deal with that interplay between technology accelerating at an unprecedented rate, but you're focusing on a deep time hall? We live in a world where it's not just changing, but the rate of change is changing which means that this hall has to be future-proof to some degree. And what we're doing is actually challenging our visitors to see themselves in their part on the story of our planet, which is what other halls don't do, and also see themselves as agents for a positive future of the planet. How do you do that? I mean, you as a paleontologist too, I mean, you're constantly looking at the Mm -hmm. fossil record. Your work is in the fossil record. Your research is looking at things that went extinct or, or died you know, tens of millions of years ago. How do you take your background as a paleontologist and interject that into this idea of looking stuck at the on future everything. to make decisions Bacteria. that are going to be better up for our planet? Well, I mean, paleontology is all about bacteria. You're looking for things and you find things, and that's what's so cool about it. And for me, it's really helpful to know the history of the planet because it helps me understand what's going on now. Take climate change, for instance. We know a ton about climate change. You did change make me listen to Revolution 9. And it was wild. All the stuff we're presenting in the exhibit. I wrote a kind of trippy poem, didn't I? I ended up making it about like a mannequin melting. So the science like a record is going melting. There's something is melting. I remember that much. And it's got this future cast, which is quite amazing. On the topic of both the discoveries in paleontology, as well as looking to the fossil record to better understand time. current climate change That's events, That's one of my favorite things about like commissions sometimes is when you guys like Scott want me to write like to a Kirk, song. He's a paleobotanist. It's always very interesting. Is focused on something called the Paleocene <laughs> you never pick a dull song. Maximum, or the PETM All I can say. Short. Simply put, the PETM was a massively significant global warming event that happened around 56 million years ago, or about here on the Washington Monument. During the PETM, something triggered a a huge release of carbon into the atmosphere that lasted for a few thousand years, and it significantly warmed the planet. The global temperature increased by 5 to 8 degrees Celsius, or around 9 to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. This led to a variety of ecological and environmental changes. There was ocean acidification well, and deep sea extinctions. On land, many vertebrates began to shrink in size as the CO2 in the atmosphere okay, caused so this plants to become less nutritious. And is. there were other floral and faunal changes occurring as sea levels rose and the planet became warm and wet. The PETM lasted for around 180,000 years. And although the impact of the PETM's carbon release happened over a period of time that's 100 times longer than the human-caused carbon release that's that happening so today, weird. it's still the best proxy for helping us understand the long-term effects of today's human-caused climate change on our planet. But there's still a lot of work to be done, and as you'll hear from Scott, it can take years to scratch the surface. How was this event even discovered? Well, it was discovered initially in drill cores from the <laughs> Southern Ocean, from <laughs> off of Antarctica. That's a Antarctica shape. is where the oh. coldest, densest water in the ocean forms today, and that really I hate that you kind of have to like restart the whole drawing if you mess it up. In the global ocean. So the question There's probably was, a way of how long that. has that been true? Has that I don't know been what it true is. for millions of years? What about back when it was? 
generally a lot, a lot warmer than it is today. So you have to imagine a big mm -hmm. drilling ship, a bunch of scientists on board, labs, they're bringing up Bullies. cores. So they were there to get a sort of long-term record of what happens over dragons. the last <laughs> 70 million years. And what they had noticed was Necromancy, an extinction event that they didn't really expect Fun. to see. So people published papers on these cores from Antarctica. We got a bunch of squiggles year, in here. A couple here. of other scientists working in Wyoming, where I had been working for a long time, said, oh, you sent me the poem that oh, I wrote you. We Thank see you. what we think is the same event in uh, rocks deposited on land in Wyoming. I thought, well, if there's a warming event, I work on fossil plants. Plants are really sensitive to climate mm -hmm. change. I should yeah. go find plant fossils in the period Twisting of time vinyl when into melting that glass. Warm, that's going to be. That's really exactly how I imagined so it. Instead of like cracking fossils? everything, well, it's just, just like get out of your I imagined and goo walk, and sharp edges, and, and then all of it just uh, expanding no. <laughs> no, as that was happening. Yeah, that would have been really But in nice. like a golden haze. Sort of about you know. what level Normal. I was needing to look at, but I didn't know exactly where, and I didn't know where the plant fossils would be because I hadn't looked for them exactly in that the zone. This warm period is about 100,000 years long. Mm -hmm. 100,000 years sounds okay. like a lot, Hash. but it's 100,000 years in the middle of a pile of rocks in that part of Wyoming that represents about 10 million years. You know? You're looking for a tiny sliver. It's the, it's the a needle in a haystack. It's the needle in the haystack. A PETM fossil deposited in the Bighorn Basin of Wyoming. Right. That's a less relatable analogy, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> not, that, a little people, bit, not yeah. that people are finding needles in haystacks. Right. right. But. Yeah. So I set out looking for them. That was 1993. It looks so weird. Every just because of the fact the that you have to. Years. It took and you 10 years. Yeah. Well, 10 years before it, like, I sits found on an it. area where it looked. But then like it there extends were going back up. Fossils, and like it has. Another two years to find really good ones. It calls I mean, it the tail. I wasn't just You'll see in a second. It just looks like weird. a crazy, <laughs> you know, guy lost in the desert. Um, where are my plants? Yeah, where are my fossils? They must be here someplace. So, what was this moment of discovery like? It was very storybook. This is what they refer to as the tail. The just graduated from college. Unlike the bottom of this. And he'd never been in the field before, and so we walked for a couple of hours. Yeah. Just letting you know, I upped it to six dollars for poems now. Um, I have new commission prices on the thing. Um, just because they take a lot of emotional effort out of me. I was like, I should probably make those more than three dollars. Plant fossil, it kind of looks like this, and I knew immediately I had never seen anything remotely like it. I get down and I'm digging with the shovel on my knees, trying to see what else squiggle. is in there. Out pops another leaf. I just started to laugh because like, this is absurd because it was exactly what you'd expect. Dude, so, so somehow this attachment happens. Because I was really and happy. It, <laughs> like it's stuck and in there and it that pulls that back out. Because and then I it's going to shoot through this piece that they call the tail. It was very exciting. Which I just think in, is odd. In science, I have not had many eureka moments, you know, that sort of, oh, oh yeah. that's it. Like, that doesn't I might need a different exactly. diagram at some point. It's usually like more it seems... incremental. Right. So yeah. like you sort of slowly realize something. And no, no, it was like 4.04 p.m. on July 3rd, 2005. It's not like you committed that date to memory. Right? Yeah, no, I did. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's actually it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So what did you do with that information? I mean, because now the search is over and now the work begins. Right, exactly. Well, uh, we made a big collection. These little pieces. We did that took two years, two summers of work, um, because that's what it takes. Rocks are heavy. Rocks are heavy. They're hard. They're fragile. So Ooh. I spent basically another ten and years and shooting in for more places. So now why is this a significant through this layer in, in our Earth's of history? the bacteria? It is the closest. This is why I find it odd that it's called a tail because it's like past to what simply this is right like now. through here, Along but it doesn't show it in the other photo strong evidence oh, no. for a huge release of carbon into the atmosphere. We think that the the carbon release may well have been triggered by a volcanic activity. Mm -hmm. It's quite possible that that triggered the release of other reservoirs of carbon, and then you change the climate and you may start to cause the bacteria in soils to get very happy because it's warm. Well, Rebecca Black and, and Madison Pettis followed me on it. Dude, that's the little girl from Cory in the house, right? So you basically <laughs> Why do I remember that? 
and it just goes tail fiber. And that's yeah. why okay, it warms so you so call quickly. these tail fibers. Today, fiber. carbon release is a little bit simpler. It's mostly caused by burning fossil fuels. Fifteen percent of it's caused by. Why does that keep changing color? Oh my god, it's like a rainbow pen. Humans, except okay. uh, what's odd. happening now is happening even faster. How does it resolve itself? Does it resolve itself after <clears throat> about one hundred and fifty thousand years of being really warm? Yeah, she it being starts <laughs> to cool off again. A combination of weathering and... I just remember her being, like, super little. Or pulling the CO2 out of So it's odd to me. So at one point, Half you said. mentioned that, um, that it's important for us to think in a geologic time scale rather than thinking in he a human time That's scale. That's so especially weird. Especially as there are policies and, um, and other decisions being made. And this part is the tail. Okay, so this middle piece is called the tail. Does that make me feel any better? I don't know. What does that? What does it mean to think about? The description of it is just odd in photo scale. form or in I think tiny it drawing just form. Means to be aware. We can't just say? think about next year or ten years from now or a hundred years from now. It's because something, something, today, and it's supposed to be a digestive enzyme. In okay, so the pokey part. Thank you, guy who really was here before. Things. Really? <laughs> yeah. What yeah. are you trying to yeah. say? Well, with, oh, it's with great. great power I need better comes handwriting. Great responsibility. It's true. Yeah, and and there's a time dimension to that. It looks like that responsibility. It says so hot, what like the little in between part on the name. Look, looking to the future. Maybe you think about it. These <laughs> do I have to look up like current Madison photos? <laughs> in 1880 and 1920, so they really end of 19th century was the formation of these big temple-like buildings in urban areas, and people were moving into the city away from the countryside. They were learning that there was stuff to be preserved, like herds of bison were disappearing, and people were naming national parks. And then the 20th oh, century see. happened. The 20th century went by fast, but it had the World oh, War, I see. it had the Depression, it had the Cold War, it had Sputnik, yeah, it had rise of science <laughs> centers. And Strange. all that time, the net emissions got lower and slower and lower and slower and lower. I still so have managed to not hear seven rings, they look but like 19th century that's usual for me. But they weren't, because... They were these places where families went to learn about the natural world, and people kept going. So these oh, yeah. really are bacteria page. organizations that are dialing forward into the 21st century, and our message is the same but change, <laughs> right? The same because we're really worried about yes. the natural world and humans' impact. Bikes. That that's that's not what it is. Mission. It's, it's our mission now, something. and we're trying to prepare people to realize what the impact of humanity on evolution on our planet is and this is how we do it by okay so i guess it's telling the story of our planet base fiber. and then base plate that's what that says realize i was like what are what are you saying part of that story. i'm convinced 100. okay so this is done. base yeah. plate you've got my money by your free institution so that's right no we we'll still take your money okay <laughs> base There's a thing that looks like it says coil. It's a collar. Ring on it. Nail. This episode is Body. brought to you through a collaboration with the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. and the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois. We're here at the Smithsonian's Whale Warehouse. It's the largest collection of whale material found anywhere in the world. And when I say I the know. largest, I mean the largest. The whale the warehouse is like located at the down. Museum Support Center in Maryland, like it's in about 45 minutes away from just... the Smithsonian's location on the mall. It's actually two happening? giant warehouses that house both extant and extinct specimens. With over half a million square feet of storage space, the Museum Support Center is home to some of the largest specimens ever collected, like the 23-foot-long right and left jawbones of the largest blue whale specimen in oh, any museum that's what it said. Today, we're going to talk with Curator of Marine Mammals, Dr. Michael McGowan, about cetaceans, marine mammals like whales, it's dolphins, it's and porpoises, it's and see how the Smithsonian's Natural it History like, Museum spikes is using doesn't their sound collections in unexpected ways Black. to better understand this diverse group of animals. Why was this boy writing in French? Also, I just wanted to show this sort of generic bottlenose dolphin so that's questions. in all of the aquaria that people uh, okay. are really familiar with. Spikes and compare right. that to all these bizarre it's just an outer sheath. Over here. So uh, these normal. two guys right here, these are different river dolphins. So this is an Amazon Page river here. dolphin DNA. as well as a Indian river dolphin. And they're actually the not that, that closely related to one another. They do not but have they seem RNA. to have invaded 
river systems separately. So this is a case of convergent evolution. Uh, yes, it is. So the invasion of rivers. Viruses possess either DNA or RNA. But in the case and, of bacteriophage, uh, the really they thing only have DNA. Is that has these growths on the skull? Is that a Which some people have interpreted it as an adaptation for. And trust it for the moment, but also like an asterisk. They can't really sense where they're going with vision. So they use their echolocation, and it reverberates off the bone. What? And mm. focuses it so that they can DNA. see through the water, through their, uh, through mm -hmm. sounds. Mm -hmm. Bottlenose mm -hmm. dolphins have echolocation as well, but they don't have these strange bony protuberances. <laughs> so they can still use echolocation, Protein but they phase. focus it out broadly into their, their environment. Gotcha. So this is in the category of bizarre things in the collection, and this is a skin of an Indian the river pins, dolphin. Why what does you can call do them today things? is sample DNA. I guess it makes more sense that like, you know, you gotta like stab this. through. You get an idea of uh, genetics in the past. I mean, this was collected in 1910, and we can I don't understand the Jimmy Neutron thing uh, that you're talking species about. species today, and for instance, see if there's a reduction in diversity, or in the case of rare specimens, this might be one of the few specimens left of this particular species outside of India, for instance, or Pakistan. So that's a great example of how when this thing was collected and prepared for a museum, it wasn't clear how it could be used in the future, but now exactly. thanks yeah. to technology and advancements through. in DNA, you can, you can make use is of it this in a way that's that going was through. not predicted before. Exactly, and we can do that with bone okay. as well. We can Maybe get that's DNA out of bone. Off. So like all this. of these specimens right here now become genetic repositories of specific points in specific places Forms. all over the globe uh, into the past. That's pretty mind-blowing. It is pretty mind-blowing. That's true. Right. Can I smell it? Is sure. this weird? I'm sorry. It's not weird at all. I mean, the smell of marine mammals Bacteria. is Bacteria. It smells just like leather. It smells just like shoes. Well, it's made out of the same, a lot of the same material that uh, our skin This is smells pretty out. good. So this is a pygmy sperm whale. What? And they probably have some of the most asymmetric okay. skulls uh, in, within cetaceans. So this is their nasal passage right here. So it goes up to the, mm. the blowhole. And you can see this mm. side is much spike. larger than this side. And that's again because of echolocation. When they emit these sounds Thanks. through their Whatever. nasal passages, you know, we they're get it, able though. to tell the direction of sound. What? So they can tell if a fish is coming towards them by this asymmetry. That blew my mind. And these animals are really bizarre. They also have a uh, anal sac that they can squirt ink out of. Uh, yes, like, it's really, really bizarre. Hold up, like a squid. Like a squid. But it's they feed on squid, and, and people think that they they actually say. Ooh, something. that's what I need. I need they amino acids and like maybe wow. a cute way to remember them. I had them. no idea. So these brain. guys are just weirdos. They're weird. They're probably in the beginning. So cetaceans Back have evolved beginning. a lot of bizarre Starches, tooth morphologies. Glucose, and uh, our group. One example is uh, I'm gonna owl's need these. tusk. Uh, that I'm yes, sure everyone is common, familiar with because everyone's most obsessed common with owls. Most common amino um, So the Lipids. tusk is, for the most also part, found important. in males, although 10 I need my table of elements back here. One of the I'll interesting things is, is, is that they use this one. potentially for male-male competition, although it's not really known what they use this for, although there's some other theories like detecting <laughs> sand or okay. sensory organs. But this really is knows. the most common. No one really knows for sure. I mean, we can observe how it's used, but testing, Magnesium, why potassium, is, water. So water is not an question. element. <laughs> Mystery of the universe. No. It's H2O. What is this thing? So this is a model of a different species called the strap. What's your favorite animal. element? And their Helium, tusks actually grow together. It's and called he. It's like um, his own little person. The mouth. It can only open its jaw just I only just made that bit. joke because um, yeah. we have to make like moles. Well, it, eats, it at feeds one on point. squid, it, so it like, just sucks um, the squid in. So it doesn't really necessarily need a compound. Yeah, um, this is just so we had to do that for my chemistry class, and I made mine out of like a little T-shirt. His them. name was That's he. Very it's, a, it's a very, they're very weird. My favorite is animals Earth. As far as <laughs> so we were just talking about like sort of the water. diversity of cetaceans themselves, um, and we're obviously here in a museum collection, but we don't just look at <laughs> the, the skeletal material <laughs> when you have questions that you need to answer. Yeah, so I just brought out a bunch of Why different. Think? other things that we might collect. Uh, one of the things baleen, that people might be aware of is baleen. So a lot of the really okay. large yes. whales What's the difference don't between polar teeth groups and unpolar groups? Like, what's the that's essential what difference? So that's what this is. And as you can see on the side here, um, there's lots of different plates. The uh, water comes protein here, structures. And it gets caught in this Dude, I hate this. 
Uh, like, like I don't remember if I really need this Bailing right now, is one of the different but I hate that this. We can use to tell about I remember trying to remember those diagrams. I had a question around. on a bio test once that, the, that made me explain the difference the between like the whale. secondary so structures, by at different time like the pleated sheets uh, and the tertiary and quaternary. Blah blah blah. That's not fun. So you can look at hormones. You can yeah. look at cortisol yeah. levels, so levels of stress, isotopes to tell what it was feeding on or where it may have been feeding. And we can actually go okay, back in time to our groups. Man, I have to draw a specimens lot. that we have from the 1800s. Oh, and so you can look at, you know, what an easier way to whale life these? was like back then. Not That's amazing. Currently. So it's like a, like a time machine. It is, exactly, like a time machine. Whale. Yes, yes. One of the other uh, pieces of a whale that we can use oh, to I say forgot. about <laughs> their life is the earwax. Their earwax? The their earwax. Is. So it's not the same our as groups. our earwax, but it is a uh, right? lipid-like structure I'm so confused. that exists Why am I confused? in the ear canal Area. of a whale. Three Incrementally, through, the, our uh, through the life of a whale, different layers are put down, so we can actually use this to age really large whales. And that makes so those it puts acid. down layers like a, like a tree, like the trunk like a of a tree. tree. So this is a tree, okay. whale's tree ring. Basically. So we're just doing um, the R groups right now. From its ear canal. R groups. A little gross, but <laughs> I'm okay with it. So in this sort of smorgasbord of interesting whale artifact, we also have this rather fragrant- Dude, bacteriophage look like wild. Resin. What is like this? definitely so this is the things this is that infect the, uh, bacteria. Because just look at that. That's a little robot, like and for sure. Even today, this is used in perfumes because it actually smells wonderful. It smells very musky. Admittedly, it does smell really good. Yeah. It kind of smells like sandalwood or like a yeah, like yeah. an earthy sort of tree-like smell. But I I couldn't picture it. Well, I would say I can actually picture myself going on a beach and picking up something and being like, hmm. Yes, and I enjoy that smell. Yeah, it's basically condensed waxy whale poo. Oh, cool. Well, that's a way to, <laughs> to describe it. <laughs> Neat. So we've talked a lot today about the diversity of whales and the availability of the their specimens and collections, like the one here at Smithsonian. And we sort of have this last little specimen to talk about, which I think hits it home why it's so important that these collections exist and why they're available yes, for research. Yes, it's not alive. This like, how does it know the Vaquita porpoise. everything? Like, that it's making all the these different, like, in Mexico. And at the moment, chemical reactions, because it has, like, enzymes and, uh, that do all these different sort of things. And, like, tale. that's the weird thing but about enzymes, is that they just the react. So, you know, 100 chemical. years from now, oh. I mean, hopefully they won't oh, no. look extinct, freaky. but if they do, we have representations of them in the museum. And this little school can help draw answer in. questions about an organism that might not be available mm -hmm. to study in the wild. Exactly. And we don't know what, you know, interesting new scientific advances are going to happen and what information we can actually get out of the skull. When some of these things were collected in the 1880s, they had no clue that we could get DNA out of them or what DNA was um, or things like, you know, isotopes or getting hormones out of baleen. But it's nice that all of this stuff is is here mm -hmm. and you know every single one of these specimens mm -hmm. no matter how old are valuable thanks museums do the art groups have names i don't remember i just have to remember what each of the art groups he still has brain waves. probably this episode is brought to you through a collaboration with the Smithsonian's National Museum Ooh, of Natural History in Washington, D.C. and the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois. What do you think of when I say worm? My first thought is these guys, earthworms. The one most people are familiar with is Lumbricus terrestris. We'll probably do a video on worms at some point. Worms but I recently learned and like that there parasites. are about 6,000 named and Love described species parasites. of earthworm alone. This is just the tip of the worm iceberg. There's so much more to know about them, mostly because worm is a deceivingly misleading concept with no easy definition or description. Yeah, in fact, there are perhaps as many as a few past. hundred thousand <laughs> species of worms, and some of them are as different from There's one another nonsense. as you or I are. Like, how did we start. happen? To help me answer the question, what is a worm, I came to the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History to talk with Dr. Oh, no, this Phillips, is CH2. one of three curators of worms. We are here, what, what collection are we in? We are in the invertebrate zoology collections at the National
Natural Cube. Museum Natural History at the Smithsonian. This is a room that has everything from mollusks to arthropods and crustaceans to worms. Arthropods. So how many worms do you have in the collection here? I mean, the Smithsonian Museum has some of the largest mm -hmm. collections in the world, if not the largest worm collection. Mm -hmm. We have at least 427,000 specimens three. of worms. Yes. We probably have more. So can you define what is a worm? There are things that tend to be long and thin and they don't have backbones. There's a lot of things that can be like that that may not actually be worms. So it's like, a little bit is, of a difficult what question. What is this it's little triangle? Is that, that a describes carbon? Sort of a body plan. It may be surprising to some people, but there's many different kinds of worms out there. Turns out there's about 12 phyla of worms in the world. And so if you can imagine the taxonomic tree of life, I guess, what, did, what does it mean to be Eye a chain. Uh, separate phyla. So it goes from kingdom phyla, class order, family genus species. Phyla means that they're all within the animal kingdom and they all are very, very different from each other. So what phyla are people in? We're in chordata, yes. So we're more closely related to squirrels and lizards and snakes. And fish. And fish and no than land any of these worms are related to one another. Right. So can we talk about some of these different Dude. worms now that we sort of know yes. that worm, worm is like a catch-all? Just in case we have to like regrow right. everything. Here we have a selection of I need some worms. A better um, some of these are the larger specimens. We have everything yes. from some polychaetes. These are marine worms. And then we also <laughs> Should have I get worms drunk? Live inside of vertebrates. Do you want to? Like <laughs> nematodes, tapeworms, some of the larval stages of, of the, the parasitic worms. Like this one, the, these weird balloon things. So these are larvae of tapeworms. Those are baby um, tapeworms. Yeah. <laughs> really cute. It's a little are different because they have complex life cycles. Yeah. So they're going to pass through this larval stage um, on their way to being an adult in a different host. You wouldn't necessarily recognize that this worm looks very similar to this. Yeah. Like, I mean, this looks like three double bonds. <laughs> yeah. A lot of people can God, I have to remember how these were <laughs> drawn. Yeah, we'll ruin pasta yes. for people. Don't eat tapeworms. Yeah. Um, oh, <laughs> no, carbon. bad idea. Don't. With not a good, free not an approved weight loss method. What other worms are we talking about today? We got this guy. Yeah. This is one of my favorite specimens. Who's I'm this? having a good this night. Yeah. Is That's when you should definitely get drunk. A giant leech. So this is the giant Amazonian leech. Okay. Wow. So you can guess where they live. Generally in the wild, they're a little smaller. Mm -hmm. um, so this guy lived in a lab and had as much food as he wanted. Um, and when you say food, I mean, you're, are you putting kibble in its <laughs> tank? <laughs> no, this one feeds on blood. We affectionately call this leech Grandma Moses because she is quite large. How long did she live in the lab? Like I that? don't know, that? but there's a very that? famous picture of a famous leech biologist oh with Grandma Moses laying on his arm. I, you know, I really feel like I've met a a celebrity leech today. And, and they're part, what kind of worm are they? They are in the phylum Annelida. So leeches, so their closest bad. relatives are earthworms. They look a little different Beach. to a scientist because we know certain characters to look for, namely because they have that blood feeding nature, mm -hmm. whereas earthworms are not. But Urban. one of the things that Redouble makes bonds. earthworms and leeches similar to each Dang other is that they are hermaphrodites. <laughs> they have both sexes at one time. <laughs> oh. Whereas the next closest relatives are the polychaetes. So like your marine worms, your yeah. bristle worms. I've always worms. wanted to gotcha. see a leech Many like of those are person. separate sexes. How, do, how does one collect leeches? Depends on which kind of leech you're going for. Gotcha. So my research was with medicinal That's leeches it. that like to feed on humans. That involves going out to places where you find leeches, That's so like lakes and ponds no, and streams. No, that can't be nitroxide because it doesn't have any wade O's. In, and you make a little that bit of be. movement. Yeah. <laughs> You do the leech dance, as I like to say. Really? Yeah. Is there, there an actual movement? Yeah, you want to make ripples in the water. <laughs> okay. And so the leeches can feel the movement. So if the leech has come up. So there is choreography to this. Yes. Oh, so you synchronize your le leech what dance. What is NH? You do the leech so dance? you're both moving at the same time, and then you both stop. And you wait for the leeches to attach. We're waiting. It's like waiting for but the then, face to drop. NH. So then you have to pull one leg up at a time and examine and see if there are leeches like on each leg. Really slow? Yeah. And of sure. course, you're standing in what mud and in rocks and you're trying to keep your balance. So Nitrogen. it's a very active Does it, does it not have a name? I'm, I'm so tempted to try this the next time <laughs> I'm in a swampy, fresh water environment. You should come out sometime. I can show you where to find leeches. Yeah, we'll do the leech thing. That's not what yeah. I thought. In our yoga moves. This is <laughs> so I mean, awesome. So when you talk about the number of specimens right. that are in the collection, are they all preserved it's in alcohol in jars? Another way of That's preserving MH. worms is, okay. especially for the very small ones, our best shown worms. Because <laughs> gotta, gotta of the 12 phyla of worms that we have in our collection here, um, many of them are very small. Yeah. So these are the charismatic <laughs> megafauna of the worm world. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. And for that, we have the biggest. 
worm I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> this is, on. I think, the largest worm in our collection. This is what we call super worm. So this worm was collected in the Caribbean, <laughs> and Hello. scientists um, who collected it saw For the sake a worm of coming out of a coral reef. And so it was really big, and he grabbed it. But what a lot of these worms will do is when they feel endangered, they will release part of their body. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that yeah, yeah, It must be like see. five or six feet mm -hmm. long. Yes. And this isn't even the whole hey, worm. Look, no. now that I've got this tablet, it's going to be so much easier to, like, draw stuff for the series if I ever need How to draw, like, a diagram on the screen or something while well, I'm explaining something. <laughs> Just imagine what it eats. It would be so good. So you and then I can draw stuff on there, make it better on the computer if I need to. How are there so many different kinds? How are they able to diversify so much? Worms in general, these phyla, are Page very three. old groups in terms of and the history of life and the history of animal life. When you're that old, there's many different environments that they've been able to Page get into. And, and diversify and specialize in. So we have worms that live in the, the ocean. We have groups. worms that live in freshwater. Obviously, worms that live on land because they're in the soil, like earthworms. These are weird even worms. worms that live inside of vertebrates. So just about anywhere carbon. you can think about, there's probably a worm living there. They've been able to colonize virtually every environment on the planet. So there's lots of diversity out there that we haven't been able to collect yet, or that we have collected but we haven't described. So do you know how many different described H? worm species there Wait, are? Wait, so it's so a C with point, an H? So at this point, just doing some rough calculations, it seems like there's around 66,000 the species of worms that are described. That are already described? Right. 66,000. Right. There could be more than 250,000 mm. species of worms. There's like pieces in here that are like highlighted described. and pieces what? that aren't. We need more worms. Is the HN farming? <laughs> So many worms. Is it just the five there, cards? That's a lot of work that has to be done. Yeah, yeah. I understand why and you put I a star really, next to this. Yeah, what pretty is daunting. Rolling? And it's, it's well, it's Rolling. amazing if you think about worm diversity in comparison to like vertebrate diversity. Like, how many mammal species are there? There's maybe I have eight a headache eight and I don't need a worse one anymore. <laughs> just eight or nine thousand, and you're talking about a quarter of a million different species of worms. Yeah. I think everybody should be What's a worm scientist. What's the 66k scientist. for? <laughs> You'll never get all the work done otherwise. We need help. <laughs> yeah. Come help Anna. Yeah. Here I am, leeches. Yeah. And then you gotta stop. And then you gotta stop. And then you have to, have to pull out one leg and look carefully and see if you can see leeches on it. Leeches. And if you do, Our then you group. pull them off. Leeches, leeches, leeches. Yes, you grab all the leeches. This is me at the club. <laughs> Boy, I like dabbing. Is that what people say? <laughs> <laughs> Boy, I like dabbing. Oh, Emily. H. Is it just the H N? It still has brains on it. Guadalajara, Mexico, 1953. During a break from his expedition collecting insects, oh. Field Museum Research Associate Dr. Charles magic. H. Sievers was perusing an antique store when he came across a most unusual Amine. specimen. <laughs> It was a creature with sunken eyes, a protruding mouth and horns, and a long barbed tail. Wild. Is it a demon baby, a fallen angel, or the spawn of Satan? Nope, just a fish. Just a fish. <laughs> Since the oh, 16th century, wait. sailors and seaside dwellers have been selling the manipulated Freeze figures of, of certain or... cartilaginous fishes, like skates and rays, to tourists. They were marketed chain. to oddity collectors as devil fish uh -huh. or dragons and became known as Jenny Hanivers, thought to be a misinterpretation of the French phrase Jeune d'Anvers, or young person of Antwerp. Venice. Many of these Aerial devil groove. babies are Aerial made from guitar okay. fish, a kind of ray in the family Rhinobatidae, which today live along beaches and coastlines and in estuaries. The practice of selling their disfigured bodies to tourists has declined in recent okay, years so it's due to popping conservation out. protections around God these remarkable it. fish. But it's thankfully, still confusing. Due to it's like a 3D you could structure. Say this legacy still has legs. Some things you could just do flat out. Are you the R group? Who are you? Field museum researchers and graduate students Shane DeBay and Carl Foldner wanted to get some dirt on the museum specimens. Really? Literally, okay, so that's the thanks to our bird collection, they were able the to CH2s? find answers to questions about air pollution over the last 135 years. So is just this a weird drawing then? <laughs> 
In the mid 19th it's century, the Industrial Revolution boomed okay. in the so manufacturing have to remember that, of the like, United the States. Black carbon was pentagon. smeared into the air from the coal factories burned to fuel their machines. The As they flew around, some IFCs. of these soot particles became trapped in birds' feathers, in much the, the same age. way a feather duster traps dirt and grime in your house. But unlike a dirty house duster, some of these are bird these, specimens were deposited uncleaned CH2s? into museum collections. And Since shame? these birds molt and lose their feathers every year, the scientists were able to track the level of air All pollution CH2s. in the year the bird was collected by analyzing the level okay. of carbon particles in so its feathers about and comparing it to another bird of the same bomb. species a hundred years later. After examining more than a thousand sooty and not so sooty birds, the scientists found that in the early Hello. part of the 20th century, Trip unenforced okay. regulation on carbon emissions remained tied Double to high levels of now. But okay. interestingly, as cities okay. began to enforce clean air regulations still the on the same businesses, the level of it's carbon just... particles found on the birds decreased, mm. indicating an increase in air quality overall. Thanks, EPA. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. H2A. And this episode part's was made not with the part of it. Field Museum's Keller Science Action Center and the Youth Conservation Action Program, who are working together to get people outside. Humans today spend historical, record-setting amounts would of be time connected? inside staring at screens, like you Bro. right now. According to the Nature Conservancy, this is the most confusing. of American youth say they spend time online every day, and other studies estimate that that amount of time is up to seven and a half hours a day, yeah. about as much time as anybody spends at work. This incredible amount of indoor screen time can have devastating impacts on our overall mental and physical that is the well-being, group. whereas spending I time believe. outside every day can really boost your mood, energy, and health. Although, Pressure understandably, there bombing. often exist obstacles preventing people from accessing the great outdoors. So for today's video, yeah. we recruited our producer, Sherry R, who has never been outside, and field Harvard. museum volunteers, Bucola oh. and Anthony, to help tackle some of these hurdles, so we can all okay. get outside! I believe that is what that one looks like. <laughs> That's the weirdest one, by far. Non-polar. Now well, let's go to... We're here today on the south side the of Rainbow Chicago's Line. Bobian Woods, which is part of the forest preserves of Cook County. It's surrounded by a major highway, a sewage treatment plant, a semi-polluted oh, river, and a landfill. And yet here, life and nature is found in abundance. In the next 30 years or so, it's estimated that 66% of the world's population will live in an urban environment. So it's important for us to rethink what it oh, means to be video? a part of nature today. One misconception many people have is that we think about yeah, nature only outside. as being a big, Generally. glamorous, Instagram-worthy destination, like a national park with sprawling forests, grand canyons, and glorious mountain ranges. But it's important to think about nature yeah, as a thing kidding. you can interact with every day, because we're literally surrounded by it. Whether it's the plants and the cracks on the sidewalk and observing the pigeons on your daily commute or just enjoying a city park. To feel the positive health benefits from being in nature that's is to be practiced as a daily yes. exercise. No, and for most, attention. that just means defining what being in nature means. If you want more information yeah, on this, check out the book thing. Rambunctious Hard. Garden by Emma Maris or her TED Talk. We put links in the description. Also, to find a walking trail near you, check out the app All Trails. Here in Chicago, the weather can be relentlessly hot or cold throughout the year. But if there's one thing that I learned when I moved here, it's that there's no bad weather, just poor clothing choices and bad attitudes. It helps to think about the plants and animals that have adapted to your area. A polar bear wouldn't be at home in the desert any more than a kangaroo in the Arctic. Keeping your cool in the heat comes down to staying hydrated and wearing loose, breathable clothing. If you're super sensitive to the sun like me, bring a hat and load up on sunscreen. I also like to hang out in the shade, otherwise I literally turn crispy. Heat is a big challenge for most, so make sure you know your own limits and take it easy. Layers are your friend in the wind and snow. If you don't have snow pants, you can always layer a pair of leggings underneath a pair of looser pants. No snow boots? No problem. Alternate two layers of socks with plastic bags and your gym sneakers. The sneakers might get wet, but this offers an added layer of moisture protection to keep your tootsies warm. Rain is worse than snow because it's harder to keep dry. So pull out those umbrellas and ponchos and focus on keeping your feet warm. Glutamine. 
Asparaging? Do I remember what asparaging does? Ticks and other biting insects Probably like not. mosquitoes can cause serious problem when you're trying to enjoy the great outdoors. Luckily, what's not serious is this really attractive solution to keeping them out of your shorts. You can wear long pants to tuck them into your socks to keep the ticks out and wear long sleeves uh, and light colors so you get a heads up when you got an insect on you. To avoid getting covered in ticks, try to walk in the center of a trailer path and avoid an brushing up on plants because Lyme disease isn't fun mm. for anyone. And if you've got some, use insect repellent. According to the Environmental Protection Agency, popular repellents like DEET are effective for keeping mosquitoes and ticks away, and they pose no greater impact on the environment or human health. So spray away! If you're in North America, plants like poison uh, ivy and poison acidic. oak can be fun day ruiners. The easiest way to avoid getting rashes from these plants is to avoid all contact with them, but that's difficult if you don't know what to look out for. The rule of thumb is the saying, leave the them free, let them be. Wear long pants and gloves Ooh, when you're working sure. outside, and if Ooh. you suspect you've made contact, wash thoroughly with soap and water. That's good for your pets, too. Emily loves the outdoors. She's really sad that she doesn't live in Missoula anymore. Or just Montana in general. She's so doing a series in South ABC. Dakota, though. We sure are having right? fun, but I had to drink a ton of water That's to where stay she's hydrated, and I home. gotta pee. No public restroom. Doing a bunch of fossil That's stuffies. That's okay. You can pee outside. Just make sure you're about 60 to 75 paces away from trails and water sources to avoid contamination. Want to avoid feeling super exposed and save Ooh. yourself from squatting on poison Ooh. ivy? Choo. Get a pee funnel. Choo. There are lots of different kinds, both disposable and reusable. Just make sure you practice the Those will be easiest to remember. Before go outside. If you don't <laughs> have a pee the funnel and you can squat, here are some best That's practices. Terrible. Brace yourself with your back against a tree for balance. Make sure you aren't but, you leaning know, into any knots. Plants, she cut a to avoid remember. accidentally peeing she on your pants basic. while you're trying to pee outside, make sure your shorts or your pants are bunched up near your knees. You can also grab onto a tree or boulder and lean backwards, or put a hand behind you for balance. There's a lot of info out there for dealing with pooing in the woods if you're going on a long backpacking hike or a cycling adventure. But what if you're just out on a casual stroll in the woods and you gotta go? Now, we're not advocating for recreationally pooing in public, but when you gotta go, you gotta go. Follow the distance rule for peeing above, either 60 or 75 paces away from trails and water sources. Then dig a hole. Since most people don't go walking around with a shovel, you'll likely need to find a rock or a stick. This is if so you funny. can't dig a hole, bring a doggy do bag along and pick it up like you would after your pooch. Nobody has to know it's yours. For maintaining your balance, follow the pee rule. Alternatively, you can always lean back and put your hand behind you. They call this the tripod pose. The For tripod cleaning up, pose. some intense hikers or bikers recommend using sticks and leaves. But I don't want to get a poison ivy rash on my behind, so I'm pro packing in toilet paper. But leave no trace means packing out whatever you brought in with you. And don't try to get creative with your disposal. In 2015, a cyclist started a 73 acre forest fire when he tried to light his used toilet paper on fire. Don't do that. Instead, bring a few Ziploc like bags with you. You can clearly label them as used and unused, and put the used stuff in an opaque sack if you don't want to advertise your business to the world, and then simply discard as soon as you find the nearest trash can. Got more questions about handling menstruation? We made a whole video already about that. <laughs> Periods and field work. It's hard to care about something if you don't know what it is. That goes for both people and things. Mm, field guides are a great place to start if you want to do something like bird yeah, watching and you want to put a name to a species. But other N times it can be H difficult to know what you're looking at. Luckily, S there are apps for that. My favorite is iNaturalist. A you take a photo of a right plant, here. insect, bird, or mammal, tag the location where you saw it, and an expert can verify its identity. There are a lot of other apps and digital resources H for this sort of thing. We put a bunch of links in the video's description. So let Yay. us know what your favorite is okay. in the comments. We hit those Shinrin amino Yoku groups, guys, or at least the R groups. Bathing, which amino acids, immediately I'll think do it with someone another rolling around in a field of wild That's flowers. Too much Turns to out, up. I kind of missed the mark. But forest bathing is an immersion in the environment around you. It's a very structured way of being unstructured in nature. Leave your phone and camera Don't behind, and without Don't any like agenda, it. allow yourself to become absorbed in your surroundings. Don't know what enzymes. to do? Just enzymes are a whole other thing, too. In the outdoors, and the All those little puzzle piece boys. If you want more structured activity, look into local organizations like parks, friends of groups, or other hobby groups for bird watching, fishing, or Black even native planting events. And you know what? It doesn't Fermentation. Really oh my god, you the go notes that this guy wrote just on the Krebs cycle. Some kind of meaningful connection with nature. I just turned here and it's already like a big drawing. There's just a bunch of arrows everywhere. We are here at Camp Shabona in the forest preserves of Cook County in the rain because 
the weather shouldn't keep you from enjoying the great outdoors. So is this your first time camping out here in the in the uh, Forest Preserve of Cook County? Yes, this is my first time. And uh, overall, how was the experience? Operons. The experience is adventuring. As you can see, we're out here in the rain. It has and moves. A lot of mosquito bites. But oh, overall, this is all about translation and DNA stuff. Yeah, fun. I played my favorite Nonsense. sport, soccer. <laughs> it was really fun. Do you have any advice for someone if maybe they're interested in becoming more involved in the outdoors? But Bogocytosis? Kenocytosis? Um, I would honestly say start with your backyard. I don't remember what all these mean. Are they all in this thing? Yes. The membrane. Important. Yeah, so you don't even have to go that the far. The eating and the, the drinking the the of yeah. things. <laughs> If you're outdoors, just do the things you love. I mean, like, and also come out here with people that you love. Cause this one's just called the alone, membrane. It's like, uh, it's scary, but like, just come Transport, out here, have fun, you know, be with your yeah. friends, and like, you know, just have fun, like, play sports, have s'mores, and eat, and just enjoy nature. Yeah, I'm all for that, even in the rain. I would be a terrible weather person. I'd be like, it's wet. It is raining. Uh, the rain is coming from the sky. From this, this is like extracellular to be, uh, acquisition. Hydrating <laughs> the area. Back to you. Will I, will I know what this means later? I don't know. He still has brains on him. It's not like assisted transport or anything. It's just this is the story of I'm outside the cell. Male Australian gonna dual eat beetles these things and, and bring them trash. inside the cell with me. The membrane is my rap name. Julodomorpha bakewelli live in Australia's and arid is western my rap regions. Name. <laughs> They're big, orange, and bumpy, and that's how they like their females too. In the 1980s, I entomologist like my females, Daryl big, Flynn and David Rand noticed a few of these <laughs> male beetles were desperately attempting to mate with discarded beer bottles on the side of the road, apparently thinking that the bottles were the biggest, orangest, and bumpiest females that they'd ever seen. To be sure, the scientists tested their hypothesis by placing four bottles on the ground in an open area. Within a half hour, two of the bottles, the orange bumpy ones had attracted additional yeah. male beetles while regular wine bottles had not as amusing as this might be it was having serious consequences Receptor for the ambitious breeders the males were so determined to copulate with the beer Ooh, bottles that they were master. dying from dehydration and were consumed alive by ants as the years went vacuole. on and people became more aware of That's not cute. littering the ground with garbage things seemed to improve for the beetles until a couple of MC years ago they made headlines again when it was discovered <laughs> that they were mating with orange traffic cones and safety vests Museums house all sorts of interesting ah. specimens. In I keep world. getting stuck on this you corner might think of, of my an keyboard. Bird or a remarkable mammal, but would you think of a rusty car? This driver's side door from a 1984 Ford Bronco oh was collected God. by field museum scientists lichens. and their collaborators who noticed it parked on the side of the road during a field expedition the in Puerto Rico. Car door. What caught their attention was the car's abundance of lichens. DJ Golgi like apparatus in the house. The symbiotic <laughs> relationship between an algae and a fungus. The scientists had spent some time marveling at the lichen diversity that covered the decommissioned automobile, <laughs> and after some serious consideration for how they Ooh, managed to transport thing. the entire truck back to the field museum in Chicago, they eventually settled on Poor taking beetle. the door, paying $20 for the exception to the car's one. very confused but accommodating owner. So far, the scientists have identified more than 50 different species of lichen growing on it, many of which fluoresce under UV light, and one of which may be a brand new species to science. That just goes to show you that scientific Retreats discoveries outward, can be found in the most unremarkable of places. That's how we pack mans, right? Yes. Protrudes outward to envelop and engulf particle. Particle. As he noms. These specimens were collected by Edward Harrison Taylor, who was a herpetologist that spent his entire career working at the University of Kansas. That is, of course, except for the times he was working as a government spy. Turns out field work is a great cover for gathering intelligence information.
Throughout his travels <laughs> collecting and visiting reptiles for his research, Taylor investigated a murder in Manila, war Little crimes the in Malaysia, know. The discovered cone out mercury was his deposits to be used in American ammunitions in World War I, and even gathered intel on the fate of Grand Duchess Anastasia oh. in Russia. As much as Taylor valued the chance to travel the world to study reptiles and amphibians, the spy work took a toll on his mental health. Know, Taylor reportedly sprinkled flour on the floor of his office to deter snoops during his long absences. He became increasingly oh, paranoid and racist over the years, but his scientific contributions were vast. He described hundreds of new species and collected more than 75,000 specimens from his decades of fieldwork. Impetus. Unfortunately, Impetus due to habitat loss, stop, a number right? of the species he collected me... can't easily be found in the wild today. But thankfully, he deposited the... specimens just like these in museums for future scientists to study. I was sitting with right. Something happened. Okay, so the start of it? The driving force. Okay. Subscribe to my crisis. <laughs> On June 19th, 1923, Nathan Lee Fitz collected this rare Kirtland's warbler near Flint, Michigan. A year later, he donated the specimen to the Field Museum, along with a number of others, and included a copy of the spring migration notes of the Chicago area, of which he was a co-author. While the objects in the donation weren't that unusual, the reason for the donation was, Leopold was on his way to serve time in prison for the murder of 14-year-old Bobby Franks. Receptor. Together with his partner, Richard Loeb, the two men thought they could commit the perfect crime. Thanks to a life of privilege, wealth, and access to the best educations, they believed that their intellectual superiority could pull it off. So on May 21st, 1924, they lured Twitch. Loeb's second cousin, hey. Bobby, into a rental car, where he was beaten and gotta, gagged. Gotta plug it all. They drove to Indiana to and dump the his body, but attempted to cover like their tracks guy. and sent a ransom note to Bobby's oh father, uh, demanding $10,000. If I make a highlight a video out of any of the streams, the it's gonna be that one where it was just they were each ABBA sentenced to life plus 99 and, um, years. Loeb was killed in prison. Leopold what is it? Pearled in ABBA and the Left 4 Dead. That was fun. The University of Puerto Rico, where he wrote and published the checklist of birds of Puerto Rico and the Virgin Islands. I'm here constantly. Right True. That's wrong. a good point. How to tell the difference. This is that song. It's for people who meteor always miss, like some people on Twitter. So I need to retweet that like during the day. Psyched. There's some people who are like, I miss all of your streams. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Dude, I don't know. What? Oh my gosh, thank you for the recent hey, chat. have a quiz at the end of the 15 video, months. So make sure you pay attention and then at Dude, the end you can vote either in the I've been doing this for 15 months. Below if you think what we're talking about is a meteor right thank or you a so much. Wrong. We are the here OG today supporter. with Jim Goldstein, who's the collection manager of physical geology and meteorites. And today we're going to talk about I was about just looking at the emotes yesterday. Because I was looking at like Hi. the Ready dab one. <laughs> and I was debating changing <laughs> the hydric so one to what the traumatic, um, okay. meteorites what is it, ferocious beast from that I put up <laughs> <of Eshel. laughs> that drawing that we had. That was a fun night. Day, but uh, if you weren't here for that stream, you don't understand what happened with the ferocious beast. So meteoroid... Meteor. I really can't believe meteorite. that I, I started streaming mm -hmm. last three March. different types of meteorites. There's stony, just wild, stony iron, and iron meteorites. Most common types are stony meteorites, specifically the ordinary chondrites. What does it mean to be a chondrite? Chondrites refer to the feature inside of these meteorites called chondrites. You know, so these, are, these are these uh, spherical inclusions that form in space as these meteorites are forming, and they're captured by the meteorites. And so, what's an achondritic meteorite? That is uh, without chondrules. There you go. But there's another big difference though. What's at the center of the earth? A core. And then? A mantle. And then? Oh, crust. so sometime yes. next so the week, um, and is it the first Cray of Nonsense podcast will be back? I still have to edit it. So I don't know what so day next week it'll be. Core, Probably a Wednesday. And a crust. Yes. So it's um, just like rocks all the way down. That'll be it. What the, what is and then hopefully the, the next week, That's right. there will be a Poets Mixtape up. Is scattered I'm like slowly the getting to so editing we're doing videos, today is figuring out and then how to tell the vlogs the are coming for the Patreon channel. Work has just been okay. Because so it has interesting. 
metal kind of. I don't know. I'm still getting used so to I this pick whole. So I it up and I'm like, wow, this is thing. heavier than I thought it should be. That might be clue number I've been one. Clue Glasses number one that I have for the past tonight. three years straight. Flip it over and look at the out. Having surface, to schedule myself and do stuff. Light, you'll see little flakes of metal inside of it. And that's the iron. And that's the iron nickel. But there are other indications that you might have a meteorite that mm -hmm. you can maybe tell from the outside. So as these things are streaking through the oh, atmosphere, no. it's going super fast. So right? And when it hits the air molecules, it generates heat. And heat. that heat actually melts the outer surface. So if you take another ordinary chondrite like this. Yeah, this one got burned up. That one got burned up. And what usually happens with these meteors as they're streaking through the atmosphere, the atmospheric pressure builds up in, on the front surface of it, and that actually causes them to explode. Oh, wow. And then the smaller pieces then are still tumbling through the atmosphere, and those little pieces get a fusion crust, and that's what that black surface Both is called. So small. when you flip it over to the interior surface, that's what it'll look like in space. Okay, that so this green? one's on the outside. So, it got so this would be like a dip mm -hmm. in the cell. And that's why it's also, it's not completely smooth, but it kind of has smoothed edges. It has smooth edges, rounded little, edges, and it, and it creates different features injury. that are also very common for meteorites. And the best example I have here is another ordinary chondrite. And this has these little indentations in there. Right. And that happens when you have heated air wallowing Dude. out pieces of the rock. So it's like a, in a river hey. where some of the water gets in the bank. I still can't believe that like SP7 started yeah, exactly. two years ago. It's been done by super like source hot ended air. two Typically years ago. Typically these things Like I tumbling. started Twitch streaming yeah, like almost a year after source and fed so ended. what happens sometimes with these things is that like, they don't tumble. They're just traveling ben. straight into the atmosphere. Like and what was I doing that year in between? Bullet shaped. Switch streaming. Oh. And you'll see these features called Just making lines. YouTube videos? Okay. And you'll see little I lines I was. coming out the side. So Mass. Oh no! Mm -hmm. Feels like it was all at the same time. Crust, and they might have these indentations on the surface. I'm having a life crisis. Yeah. Time is passing. But you can't just base it off of like the black coloration because this is a meteorite, but it doesn't have the same sort of crust. <laughs> it's a dead as baby. This one. <laughs> when it weathers for a long period of time, it actually removes Liquid. some of those telltale signs. So the reason that it's kind of rusty colored is because it's been sitting on the surface. I should say fluid. And then it becomes more difficult to identify what a meteorite is. Should we mention what this one is too? This it's is a special a mm -hmm. meteorite. This particular one came from a crust of a local planetary body. Can you guess where it is? The moon. It's a moon rock. <laughs> I'm holding the moon. You are literally holding the moon. Wow. <laughs> this one feels more special than some of the other ones. It's really rare. Really? Really, really. So next, let's talk about the second group of meteorites, the iron meteorites. These are the second most common? Second most common. And that's uh, okay. less than Those 10%. are the main ones. This is very heavy. This is <laughs> these are really receptor mediated. And these are primarily nickel iron. And here's another one. Really I'm going to pick about. up. Oh my god. To understand meteorites. Exocytosis. So this is what we call an end cut. It has Removing most of the outer, outer surface, but it also has a nice smooth interior. You can see that different crust on these too. That one is a lot shinier and black, and this one you can tell it's probably sitting on Earth for a exactly. while. Exactly. So that one is more weathered. But this side has all these really interesting, intricate patterns in it. Vinmastatin patterns. Is that what that word mm -hmm. is? These were discovered in the mid 1800s by a scientist <laughs> who determined that these you know, types of meteorites hopefully have two types of alloys. There'll be alloys. people at and either and these are two different I don't know VidCon eventually, yeah. and those are the actual or maybe they'll come back to, bring to RTX out, like to cut the how people who aren't part, part of that anymore come, like Meg or something. Wow, it's so pretty. Mm -hmm. It's all about if sizes, different widths. They want to just come as like people, who, um, like crystallize or solidify. So if you find one that has really big lines, it takes a long time for it to cool. Wow. I think they would couch up. Will we ever see those boys anywhere again? Will Alex ever leave his apartment again? This is again? the rarest of all meteorites. <laughs> Not necessarily. Really? So this is the rarest of three broad categories, stony, gotcha. stony iron, iron. But the rarest are achondroitic meteorites and other types of meteorites within the stony group itself are even rarer. Vidcon's different. What makes this special other than the fact that it's... It's different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can see it's, it's heavy, right? Mm -hmm. So it has nickel iron. But it also has these green crystals. Yeah. And those are olivine crystals. Yeah. And olivine, this type of olivine is found in the mantle. Not a Core material. I want to actually see what it is. Because another thing besides celly things, or like I said, dissections, I want to see like planes of the body. Neat. It's pretty even on the outside. And on the inside. Oh. 
So this now is like we've the sympathetic the and the parasympathetic nervous system. And next we're going to look at <gasps> some We drugs. have to dissect an eye, and I really hope I can find so, a fresh eye. One. This guy. What do you think of that? I mean, it's pretty Because we dissected it's ones that were kind dense. of like it's old, like cow eyes. And like, if you get a fresh one, you can actually like see right. through. It kind of has like, a darker uh, crust on it. You know, it looks like it's been iris a little bit. Uh, but that's a the terrestrial thingy? rock called a contusion. Oh. It's really? like a bead, What's essentially. It's so like very it's hard. Basically it's like an actual mind. lens mm -hmm. in your eye. So what you have is uh, but ours were really foggy. I couldn't see through them. And you have sediment forming around it. Okay, next one is one we see a lot of. Okay. Ooh. This is interesting. Yeah. So uh, what do you see in that one? Well, it's kind of got a darker crust, but it also has little crystals on the outside. Mm -hmm. You can Ooh. see the sparkle of the crystals. I love the sparkly like ones. Quartz crystals. And you're holding it like, how's it feel? It's very light. It's very light. I mean, it's still a rock. It would hurt mm -hmm. if I threw it <laughs> at somebody. And so this is a piece of terrestrial basalt. I like just the way that they igneous rock wrote mm -hmm. this a because you heard rock. like very small spermatozoa or like just like guy. sperm oh, before. This is way too light. But Spermatozoom. It sounds like it's zooming by. Spermatozoom. You see these deep, deep pits, which are gases that were Spermatogonium. So this is a lava rock. So it's a lava rock, essentially. I've never heard these words. this one? Ooh. Because this one is pretty dense. It's pretty dense. Pretty heavy. Little. So when it's dense like that, at that size, you know there's a metal Ooh, glands. And all the different hormones that they do. something here. That'll probably be a thing at some point. And to just make wow. notes in here and be like, these are it's things magnetic. that I will need to refer to later. <laughs> they Can you guess which mineral that is that's magnetic? Magnetite? Magnetite, exactly. <laughs> magnetite. This is one I get a lot of. Yeah. And look at the outside. Mucus cells. The, the bane so this of is my manganese existence. Oil. People find these, they find them along with train lines and so forth because you see them thrown away sometimes. Mm -hmm. And they end up, you know, here because people will think they're in Europe. And rightfully so. I think that dark surface. The inside metal. The vitamin storage. Okay. The ones we were looking at have been all natural, uh, nature forms. Uh -huh. This one is man made. This is surprisingly light. I can actually look at something different. Surprisingly light, part. exactly. For how big Cross it is. Cross section. And it's dropping and it's shedding all over the place. sand on the table. Right, so this is a uh, runoff from industrial uh, manufacturing. Slag. Oh, or as some slag. people call it, meteors. And for me, this is the most common type of meteor around that people bring in because they find these things. It looks like it's been heated up. It looks like they're melted. As a child, in fact, I would find pieces of this and I would think that they were meteorites. Oh. That was my first exposure to meteorites as a child, finding these things and saying, it's a meteorite. I bet you just had pockets full. Oh my God, my mother hated me. She would wash how many, my clothes. Yeah, how many washing <laughs> machines did you ruin? That's why they call them clinkers because they would clink around in the dryer. Really? No. Oh. I'm so gullible. All right. So those are the most common media wrongs. Okay. You know what time it is? Quiz time. Quiz time. Muscle, bone, and skin. Is specimen number one. Specimen number one. For you and the audience. Ooh, this I is gonna be pretty. Cross section. Okay, this one is pretty. I might have to watch. Heavy. I know there's a crash course um, video. I can't tell if it's heavier than I thought it was. The planes heavy, of the body. It's got a little bit of rust on the outside, and. It's got some shiny metal bits. Yeah, I'm these are just quizzes in the back. This is I do not need you right now. You're right. Really? I need these in different sections. I got them right. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> it's it's magnetized. It's what you saw before. Let's add a new page. Oh, that's the tricky the, one. The one that's page. nail sticky. Wow. Yeah. Cool. Okay. Specimen number two. <sighs> this one. Ooh. Oh man, this one does have that really dark Perfect. crust on the outside. It's kind of heavy, but... I'll pause that one. Subscribe to my courses. <laughs> um, what is it? Crash Course uh, Anatomy and Physiology. Yes, it's one of like the first ones. Issues. It might just your be the life. intro. This really isn't any of my business, but I mean, just and look at your body. It? Hold is up your hand. It? Wiggle it around, take a sip of water, hold your breath, sniff the air. Oh, These things are so simple for most of us that we yes. don't give them a moment's Axies. thought. But each one of those things is it can take that burrito from plate to pooper. And finally, all those previous <laughs> what a, what a great part to zoom from the highest level of organization, the body itself. Me and you and your dog. We're all glorious, complete Axies. organisms made from the precise organization of trillions of cells in nearly constant activity. This ability of all living systems to maintain stable internal conditions no matter what changes are occurring outside the body is called homeostasis 
and it's another major unifying theme in anatomy and physiology. Your survival is all about maintaining balance of both materials and energy. You need the right amount of blood, water, nutrients, and oxygen to create and disperse energy, as well as the perfect body temperature, the right blood pressure, efficient movement of waste through your body, all that needs to stay balanced. And by your survival depending on it, I mean that everyone's ultimate cause of death is the extreme and irreversible loss of homeostasis. Organ Isn't failure, it loss of homeostasis, and I just, I just imagine like cutting your neck and just bleeding out. The insane end by throwing off Lose your some. balances that allow your body to keep processing energy. Take an extreme and sudden case. Your arm pops off. If nothing is done quickly to treat such a severe wound, you would bleed to death, right? But what does that it's really scream. mean? What's gonna happen? How do I die? Well, that arterial wound, if left untreated, will cause a drastic drop in blood pressure that in turn will prevent the delivery of oxygen throughout the body. So the real result is okay, body like there. and communicate what's happening to them. A doctor isn't gonna recommend a patient for surgery by telling the surgeon that the patient has an achy belly. They're gonna need to give a detailed description. Essentially, it's like a verbal map. So over time, anatomy has developed its own standardized set of directional terms that describe where one body part is in relation to another. Imagine a person standing standing in front of you. This is what is called the classic anatomical position, where the body is erect and facing straight ahead with arms at the- That scream was unnecessary. I think Michael's the one who did sound design for this episode, actually. Is Michael the one who haunted us? We'll see in the end credits. I'm pretty sure Michael's the one who <laughs> did that. Anatomical <laughs> position. Ew. Little body. I like this thicker one. Like it's not as clean, but I like it. The sides and palms forward. Now imagine slicing that person into different sections or planes. Don't imagine it too graphically though. The sagittal plane comes down. Okay, so that is that. Um, the sideways one. Go for little stick man. Those are his arms. Yes. I'm gonna pretend like he has a little little hand sticking out. The sagittal plane. <laughs> Got a little piece of paper running through him. <laughs> vertically and divides a body or organ in left and sagittal right parts. Plane. If you imagine a plane parallel to the in plane. sagittal plane, but off to one side, that plane is the parasagittal. The coronal or frontal plane splits everything. Okay, so this is the coronal plane. I'm learning so much. I haven't known this stuff since like senior year of high school. In vertically into front and back, and the sagittal plane, I don't know, further. Further out, got uh, I don't know, pushing forward, pushed further out, transverse or for parasagittal plane. I'm like trying to figure out how to explain these things, and then how to explain these to us. Frontal plane splits everything vertically plane. into front and back. Frontal. back. And the transverse or horizontal plane divides the body top and bottom. Transverse plane. Okay, so we got this little person. Again. Stick man. Mm -hmm. So we're cutting you in half. Transverse. Look at that body again, and you'll notice even more divisions, like the difference between the axial and appendicular parts. Everything in line with the center of the body, the head, neck, and trunk, are considered axial parts, while the Ooh. Oh. Give me boop. Boop. No? Boop. Sometimes this kind of
He's got the longest arms, head, neck, and body. Axial parts. Well, the arms and legs, or appendages, are the appendicular parts. Stick man. <laughs> Wait, so, so the body was on the other one? Oh, I totally missed that. <sighs> gotta, gotta redraw stick man. I have the thick boy. Like knees or axial parts. <laughs> and then parts. Well the arms and legs or appendages. Knees. are the appendicular parts that attach to the body's axis. Everything in the front of your body is considered anterior or ventral. Anterior or ventral, and everything in the back is posterior or dorsal. Okay, okay, things are making more sense again. Anterior. Draw little fingies. <laughs> He's a scary little scarecrow man. Feet go forward like that. He has a smile and eyes. <laughs> Anterior. Than, like the back of him. We'll, we'll color in some hair. He's not bald. <laughs> Deposing scarecrow man. <laughs> the back of his cool hands. <laughs> Massive. <laughs> body is considered anterior or ventral, and everything in the back is posterior or dorsal. So your eyes are anterior and your butt is posterior. But you'd also say that your breastbone is anterior to or in front of the spine <laughs> and the heart is posterior to or behind the breastbone. Features toward the top of your body, like your head, are considered superior or cranial. This is a normal stick man again. <laughs> Cranial. Or cranial, while structures that are lower down are inferior or caudal. Big hands, he should be the president. <laughs> Can't have some small hands in the White House. Not allowed. Aw, he's got a little tummy now. The real boy. So the jaw is superior to the lungs because it's above them, while the pelvis is inferior to the stomach because it's below it. And there's more! If you imagine the center line running down the axis of a body, structures toward that midline are called medial, while those farther away from the midline are lateral. Oof. That is... Can I undo whatever just happened? Yes, okay, thank God. Medial. <laughs> Ew, look at that rainbow happening. Everything on the outside. Lateral. <laughs> Oh, I don't like the fact that it, it literally does it like a highlighter. I'll accept that. So the arms are lateral to the heart, and the heart is medial to the arms. Looking at the limbs, your appendicular parts of your body, you'd call the areas closer to the center of the trunk proximal, and those farther away, distal. In okay. We need a little arm now. So, 
Paroximal. In anatomy talk, your knee is proximal to your ankle because it's closer to the axial line, while a wrist is distal to the elbow because it's farther from the center. Okay, so the pop quiz. I'm eating a club sandwich. I'm not. I wish I was. But imagine I am. I could go for a I'm sandwich. so ravenous and distracted that I forget to take out the little frilly toothpick at the top, and I end up swallowing it with a raft of turkey bacon and toast. A fragment of that toothpick gets lodged somewhere in here, and my doctor takes an x-ray and says I need surgery. Using anatomical language, how would she direct the surgeon to that tiny wooden stake inside of me? She might describe it as being along the medial line, posterior to the heart, but anterior to the vertebra, inferior to the collarbone, but superior to the stomach. That would give the surgeon a pretty good idea of where to look in the esophagus, just above the stomach. I warned you at the beginning. A lot of terms, but all those terms might just save my life. Science. And hey, it's the end of your first lesson, and you've already started to talk the talk. Today you learned that anatomy studies the structure okay, now of let's figure out if Michael's the one who did the Kathleen stream. Yell, edited by Blake DiPestino and our sound designer, Michael Aranda. Yeah, we can Consult definitely blame him for the perfect scream, our which we should hear again. Is the extreme and irreversible loss leave. of homeostasis. Organ failure, hypothermia, suffocation, starvation, dehydration, they all lead to the same end by throwing off your internal balances that allow your body to keep processing energy. Take an extreme and sudden case. Your arm pops off. If nothing is done quickly to treat such a severe wound, you would bleed to death, right? But what oh, does Michael. that really mean? <laughs> Doesn't feel So how does it put Michael heavy, in charge of projects? <laughs> it also doesn't have the pitting on the outside, but it kind of looks like another one of the meteorites on the table. I'm gonna go with this is a meteorite. Wah, wah, wah. Oh no, it's not a meteorite? <laughs> You've seen that one already. Really? That's the manganese ore. Oh, dang. And if you look at it really closely, you'll see the manganese sticking out. Oh, wait. oh like it's shiny. So lesson to be learned, look very, very closely. I was wrong. Specimen That's my number, number three. three. This guy, wow. Oh geez, this is lighter than I would have thought it was. It's got a nice <laughs> crust on the outside. It's a little rusted, so like if it was a meteorite, like I don't know what we expected from Michael. <laughs> should should um, we be surprised? <laughs> and it's kind of got. It looks a little bit like a chondritic meteorite. I'm gonna go with this is a meteorite. Yes. I got it. <laughs> nice. And the last one. This last one. Anything else I want from this one? Wow, this one's really light. This one is like. I think I have so many things that I don't think are in this lighter room. than I would have thought. Well, this is confusing because like this part. I brought is really back my files got that darker crust. that have all this of my microbiology stuff, crusty. but I think okay. those are still. Um, it doesn't have those lines. In the on it, I might have some right here actually. Outside. And it does look like. I have a filing cabinet, an but I didn't put everything in here. Shiny pieces of iron nickel in it. So I'm gonna go with this is a meteorite. Mm -hmm. It is a meteorite, a chondritic meteorite. All right, Jim, so now that we've learned what is a meteorite and what is not a meteorite, what, what should someone do if they think that they've found a meteorite? Well, first of all, don't necessarily trust the internet. You need to take it to someone who knows about geology, who knows about rocks and minerals and meteorites. So take it to your local university, uh, local museum, and have someone identify it for you. Yeah, and they'll do that for educational they'll purposes? They'll usually do it for educational purposes. Uh, we, as a nonprofit, we don't value specimens or pray specimens, mm -hmm. but we do have ID Day here in September where people can bring in their rocks, minerals, and potential meteorites, and we'll identify it for you. That's so neat. Yeah. Cool. Yay, museums. Yay, meteorites, and... Meteorong. It still has brains on it. I think I gotta go. <laughs> Is this everyone? I'm not 100% sure. But I got some microbiology. We're here today with Dr. Adam Ferguson. We're gonna skin some skunks. Oh, I'm scared. There was not All safe right. for work stuff posted in the Discord. <laughs> yeah, okay, perfect. <laughs> Oh my god. 
So I guess before we get cutting, we should probably introduce our, our characters hell. here. Um, we that have two is... individuals here, and even though they're called the Stripe Skunks, you can see oh my. they're mirrored in the Stripe patterns. <laughs> but same species? <laughs> same species. Oh, the I can't show this. I forgot. Which is... I, gotta, I gotta skip past the dissections. People even though they're often very ask me, interesting. What's my favorite thing to see at the Field Museum? And I'll say something like Evolving Planet or the Hall of Gems, where there's this opalized vertebrae of a pleasing Is there a Darwinian star, evolution? Or the These are things from bio. But honestly, my favorite thing is the floor. You know there are fossils in these tiles? The very foundation of our museum is comprised of thousands of invertebrate <laughs> fossils that hung out in an ancient ocean 325 million years ago oh, that today card. is Carthage, Missouri. Are but the these, Wikipedia page for Carthage has no mention shapes? of a past any more ancient than the founding of its county in 1841. And today, Carthage is more notable for the fact that it's home to the precious moments park and chapel. Ooh. And there's nothing about its role as an invertebrate Genus hotspot back Asuria. in the Carboniferous period, which frankly I find to be far They're more grand negative. 325 they are million coxi, years ago, that area Diplo was covered coxi. by an ocean, which was are a long, anero, long time ago. The world arrow, looked very different. There were some of the earliest horseshoe crabs, there are a amphibians that were twice my height, and these short-lived things existed. Before they were fossils, these invertebrates, cavity, colonies of bryozoans, brachiopods, and starfish-like creatures, lived and died, and eventually were turned into stone, uh, where they remained buried gonorrhea. during gonorrhea. the rise and fall of Dimetrodon, of dinosaurs, Saber cats and mammoths and the rapid gonorrhea. evolution of Homo of sapiens until a hundred years ago they were lifted from These are the quarry, cut and polished, transported across state lines, and installed in the floors Emo and stairs organotrophic of And although fermenters. this space changes and transforms, these fossils will still be in the same place on the like, floor for as long as this building yeah, stands. Yeah, like tetanus? More than a million people every year This means it's in them. the dirt. <laughs> My grandparents stood on them when they first visited Sue nearly years ago. which is what they I used stood on them um, during my first for Botox. Voyage here. Which These is like giving you like low key botulism. Every visitor and scientist and exhibition across an entire century. Most people who visit never notice the fossils in here. Oh my gosh, I think my fungi one. There are so many other things to see and conversations to have and objects to ponder. And I don't think their visit is any lesser because of it. But I do think it's the sort of profound detail that can really make you appreciate the fact that we're all on one planet together. And that there's only one planet we've all lived on together. Us and the mammoths and saber cats and dinosaurs and Dimetrodon, way back to 325 million year old Helmets. colonies of bryozoans, brachiopods, and starfish like creatures. So those are wordy what things. I love about museums is that this urge to seek out these smaller notes, these profound details that link us together Other across space and time, aggregate. isn't at all unique to me. It's something that we all experience when we decide to visit a museum. We're each on a constant search for our own version of the fossils in the floor. Oh my like, gosh. Just an example. This is actually Last from Last year, the most viewed blog AP post government? on the field's website came from the collections manager of fossil invertebrates. I made these really the cute notes that were like Lake Michigan fossils and rocks. More than almost any other chairs. <laughs> like I choose you. people's curiosity. I'm in love with the idea that you can visit a place like the field and see the what stationary fossils in our limestone tiles Congress and then walk outside toward the Adler Planetarium and down the steps from atop like the stand on the shore of Lake Michigan you, you can your find your own Everyone's ancient world like, in the uh, loose beach rocks. Reach different down kinds of committees. Up a handful, and you might come I do all these little stick men. I was really into my notes in high school. school. It might be the first time that that rock has been looked at and appreciated for what it really was. I know my notes are in here. I just don't know where they are. If not, I definitely have... Ew. I don't think I took notes in high school. <laughs> a lot of people didn't. You have to know that I had like 110 in this class. Peggy McNamara is a fixture in the halls like and behind the scenes at thing. the Field Museum. She's doing research of the artistic nature. Peggy's the museum's only artist in residence and has been studying. These are actually, I think, most of my tests. Display, and in the collections for the past 30 years. And so you can see if I got Some one wrong. Some of you might not know got this, nothing but wrong on this test. reason I got into natural history museums in the I got first one wrong on this test. Of art. My internship at the Philip Albright Zoological Museum in Montana was for art One. Actually, these are scarlets. I forgot we studied together. Museum. That's how I first fell in love with science and nature. And the Dude, me and Scarlett were like, so this we were there. We special. were ready. We had Avid together, together, so we would always study. She had it, what was that, third period? Yeah, because we'd go to Avid second. 
and we'd always so, study there. Peggy, I guess we'll, yeah. just to, to get chatting while we're sitting here drawing our beautiful paleo art. Out. You've been a, an artist here at the Field Museum Painting for a number curve. of years. Long time. Curve. Yeah, curve. I came in my twenties because everything held still and there was free parking. I'm like, can I find my? I want to find I my fun maybe by osmosis it would They're in like better. these card stock. And notes. I sort of believe that, looking at well-made things, putting them down carefully. And you would look like Yeah. And then they get an idea. And I think my whole drawing method is revolves around having enough time. Ooh. And I crawl from here to here to here to here. Well, that's a luxury. And I crawl I down so many and notes. it's all wrong. And I crawl to here. <laughs> I mean, but the tenth time through, it's right. So when These you hold your, your pencil up, and I kind of I do this too. Sometimes I feel like I'm faking it. Oh, and sometimes I feel like it works. <laughs> what are you looking for? I'm I'm holding like if I'm holding right. When we started the pathophysiology the part. part, the first part the was again. Yeah. Um, so I hold my microbiology, and the next eye, semester was pathophysiology. Right now this, I wouldn't just go. Oh well, that's down. I yeah. This is what we were just doing. Like, and it's right above his eye here. And how far over? And hey, these are really good notes. It's I had all the PowerPoints you know, <laughs> and a museum. Took notes on if them. you could put a piece of tracing paper on the glass mm -hmm. and you gave them a pen and they didn't move, they could draw it perfectly. Yeah. That's all we're doing. You've got an eraser there too. I you? always have it and I first day of class. Some of these are really need to sort through. Them. Some of these things I do yeah, not need anymore. Yeah, the most important tool that I'll ever use. Like Spanish More notes. More important than the pencil. Get it. Yes, I think editing. Knowing when you're wrong. I ever really know Spanish. <laughs> Everybody does it the in The amendments. Writing. Everybody does it in a lot of things. My financial aid for rice. You're supposed to have the drawing right first time through. So when you start painting, I just am putting ooh, like big a case of iron deficiency anemia. It's like me. You know, we're desperate for something, so Excited. any place I can think. Of Did you figure out if the person had you just went for iron it. deficiency? Yeah. You had to like go through like the test yeah. of that. Did sort you? of the complement to the yellow, but I can figure this part of it. His body's in shadow, and this is the whole Brown watercolor. Cells. If I try to work it. This? Mm -hmm. Like if you nag somebody, yeah. So the only way to get him mm. to work is to let him dry and do the next layer. The only way you get into trouble is cerebrovascular accident. Yeah. This is the part that I like. Yes, of course. It's like you're, you can be like a chemist. I start by putting a really annoyingly bright color down in the background, and then I usually go. I'm actually gonna see. There. I have the other one. Just, there's like, there's a lot of folders in there. Yeah. Just look Why at this. Not? This is just like is weird bio, body. mostly. Yeah, it's a big noodle. It's like a Very giant weird. hairy sausage. And then I try to, I don't want any color to feel left out. <laughs> so, <laughs> Like I they talk to, to one another? Yeah, like, oh, she likes you better than me. So I try to get everybody on there. And then I can always bring it back to something dull. So when you look at something like this, you don't just see brown and yellow right. and tan. So I'm, I'm using lots of blues, and and I always am including the compliments. So they'll be violet. Aren't you ever afraid that something's going to turn out looking like Lisa Frank? <laughs> I, I I have enough bad ones, Emily. I have another binder. <laughs> and a whole the thing of chemistry. Ones, except a few bad ones, right? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's a pretty good yeah, lesson, no matter yeah. what you do. Yeah. So still how did you end up uh, in the bird division? It's been like a decade. Painting yeah, after figures. All those, I still don't know how yeah. to like, balance so, it. You know how so much is instinct? <laughs> like right now, <laughs> your mm -hmm. instincts yes. are telling you what to do. Molecular Not orbital some law theory. that you learned in school. Sure. Right? I only care so about like valence shells and instincts. the shapes. So my of theory is you look at perfectly made things. That's all that matters. Maybe. Like a 3D structure or something. How are these birds things? then? You, what's <laughs> what's perfect about birds? Oh, they're not. They're surprised, don't you think? Yeah. Because you can do yeah, math. The color is just like it I'm like what? <laughs> Excuse me. It's like wow. hygiene. The correct like way to wash your hands. This is very important. I might make a video on that. that. It's like birds. Like it's us. Gotta get it's under the great, nails. Great pink hair. And like around your cuticles. Oh, finally. 
So do you have colors in mind when you start? A final going exam going reviews. And, you know, I about put, this. I put out the primaries and secondaries. Pathophysiology. So there's a red and a green, a purple and a yellow and an orange and a blue. I know this one had to have been micro because I don't have to do the pathophysiology. Is, they're all transparent. My grade was yeah. too high. So this is like dating. It's, nothing is permanent. There they are. Wait, and then I put yeah, no cadmiums or anything. We found some more. After I'm committed. I yeah. feel like the, the my cadmiums, my cadmium Primitives, yellows, and my cadmium reds are like my my go-to. Yeah. I just started by putting cadmium yellow in the background. But you can cover up an cardiovascular disease. That's true. Mm. So I do that, but all those kinds of routines. What mm -hmm. is this? I even hate saying them in class because then someone will think they have to do that. They'll be like, Something oh, Peggy said I should. Components. Yeah, <laughs> which, you know, get your own. You can develop your own thing. I mean. You, it's hard to oh, take genius. off a cadmium. One My science art or one? kind of told me too is that Math. a line isn't really like a line. When you see the edge of something, it, there's, there's no lines in nature. Everything yeah. has some sort of shape or contour. So when it comes to Pieces making the lines, brains. you're just on the painting, you're just taking a different yes, value of Yes, dude, I had this in the on, rest of it. on fleet. What did they call that technique? When we dissected hearts. Yes. Yeah. I think I missed one or two pieces. Came up with that word. But they had hearts cut up into like different cross sections and stuff around the classroom. And my teacher would put pins in like different yeah, parts. White and you had like 20 side. things on your paper and you had to yeah, mark so them it's right. Just, it's like waking up. I did up. pretty good. I think I got the highest grade I, in all the classes. I'm alive. Wait, oh, I, I wish I, I wish I knew exactly what it was. A really long time on it. Art dissection. I have all I have all the how to like getting anywhere. Come in handy. I think it's just because he's got this big noodle body. It's because he's a. I was an oh, overachiever yeah. in high school. <laughs> that, that as well. If we yeah. if we didn't know that already. It's his fault, Emily. <laughs> <laughs> and then if I was really gonna gonna do this, like finish it, I I do a lot of the the texture with the palette knives. Woo! Oh yeah. Here we go. I was in like the Northside newsletter with some people. I was in book club. <laughs> now he looks like he's like that running was, out of a you know, prairie fire or something. What's up, volatile? <laughs> Do the final wow. AP Calc class senior year. Why not? Dude. Scratch him in. There we go. Oh, because you were advanced. <laughs> Yeah, not having to do finals was great. Like either if you had like the good grades or you had no absences, and I had both, and I was like, art. "Why suckers?" I think there's much more talent out there that ever gets awakened. I'm learning yeah. tomorrow. I think they get discouraged because they see end product. What are you modeling? Whereas in school, you know, you start you're in first grade and you go to basketball Arcaea, and you Euteria. play all summer. And, you know, but somehow this, they think they got to come ready made. Yeah. With an idea and ability and more case just analyses. It just works as a Meditation did, for you. Spanish ended up in here somewhere. Get out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, um, there's no judgment here. The immune yeah, and, and system, atrophy. These are you know? important. Why not just make a thing? Antibody. Right. Enjoy it. Right. Make a thing. Dragon. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, I'll talk about antibodies at some point when I talk about vaccines. We're going to be doing a lot of vaccine content. Congratulations. Guys. Yes. Yours, There's going to be people mad at beautiful. me. This it's going to be amazing. so much fun. You could complete that in, Actually, I'll put those in just a short amount of time. I feel like place. you really captured <laughs> well, Next to these yeah, helmets. I did animal. okay. I would never, yeah. I never spend a day. It's always five days. This composition worked after all that in the <laughs> Antibodies or yeah. bodies for that? I think so. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I think his body was not interesting. Yeah, because he's got this kind of the yeah. the noodle body and then kind of the, the noodles up here. Yeah, you needed more time to... Yeah. To develop texture. the noodles a little the bit more. Noodle development. This is really where the all the, the fun was happening up in the face. Yeah. I can't say that I, I love this blue now that I'm looking at it, but you know what? You know what? Dude, go back and read do people yes. still use this? Yeah. Nothing is we used to use that. Remind yeah. all the time in high school, like where teachers could like remind us about assignments and stuff. So it's basically like they were texting you. <laughs> There's my other ones. We got we got algae. Oh, we got protozoas. We got fungi. These were what I was looking for. This binder is really nice. I probably need to actually 
hole punch things and not just leave them all in We're undergoing there. some massive changes here at the Field Museum in the next year thanks to a generous donation from the Kenneth C. Griffin Charitable Fund. Among other things, we're relocating and updating the pose of our star T-Rex Sue to reflect new research on these animals. T-Rexes have a set of belly ribs called gastralia, yeah, the but nobody can quite figure out how they were supposed to articulate with the rest of the skeleton. Now we know, so instead of looking like this, okay. we think T-Rexes looked a little bit more like this. Dude, and that got me so thinking a lot about how important art is to our understanding of prehistoric life, as well as the artists who have worked here at the Field Museum over the years. But digging up information about, about general past fun artists and geology first. was no simple feat. I contacted partner museums from around the United States. I even have States like the Europe, economic importance of fungi. Of artists, <laughs> scoured our archives for information and personnel records. I made use of more interlibrary loan requests than any other time in my life. The work oh, from these artists touched dream. millions of people, yet the information about two of the three was virtually unknown, and I wanted to change that. So, without further ado, I bring you the Field Museum. <laughs> Taking out some scooping brains. One of the first prehistoric artists the Field Museum Damn. hired was Charles Knight. He's also by far the best known. Numerous books and galleries have been devoted to his life's work and talents. Part of the realism in his studies came from his observations of animals in life. He spent a lot of time at zoos observing and drawing the animals. And when it came to painting the prehistoric, Knight went to great again, lengths to create three-dimensional models of his thick. subjects, which he then would take outside to see how the sunlight played off of their first Between 1927 and 1931, Knight was commissioned by the Field Museum to create 28 gigantic murals to chronicle life on Earth, which would line the walls in our new Hall of Fossil Vertebrates. They've become his most iconic series, with a few standouts like T-Rex versus Triceratops, which inspired numerous Eucarium. artists and filmmakers at the time, like The Lost World and the scene in Fantasia where the T-Rex was going after the Stegosaurus, even though they lived 84 million years apart, but anyway. One yes, of the most the incredible West. things about Knight's it's literally like pretty, massive accomplishments um, was that he was legally blind. Boy, when he was right? six, he was hit in one eye with a rock, sustaining permanent corneal fun. damage, and later developed an astigmatism in the other. So the murals for the field were completed with his left eye just inches from the canvas. But what I love about Knight's paintings is how he was able to artfully convey the passage of time. The majority of his works are still on display in our Evolving Planet exhibition. And if you look at the murals in sequence, ranging from the oldest scenes to the newest, you'll notice that the images become clearer over time. The more ancient the subject, the hazier the memory, until everything comes into sharp focus with bolder colors in the Pleistocene. Among Knight's admirers was author Ray Bradbury, who said, when we think of these beasts, these monsters that lived in the world for so many hundreds of thousands of years um, and then vanished, right about and mushrooms. Think we're going to be here for a I long want time. Fungi. Well, if the dinosaurs could vanish from the world, gonna be that we have like to be leech. careful with ourselves. <laughs> but when you I do got helmets over here. Live forever. So the work that Charles R. Knight did, it's there forever, it's like and it's and going to stay here. forever. Knight was followed by two other artists who were ultimately much less recognized, but Beatrice similarly Thomas. talented, each with their own personal this, no. story and style. Are, the first so was John worms. Conrad Hansen, who I'm was chronically leeches. shy and somewhat of an enigma. Having emigrated to the United States from Trondheim, Norway, when he was just probably. 12, he lived with his mother in Minneapolis until her death in 1928, when he was 59. In the following years, he moved around, eventually making his Aerobic. way to Chicago, where he worked for a calendar company and painted church altar pieces. Then, at an age when most people are settling into retirement, Warner. Hansen decided on a second career. He contacted the field in 1940 and Baffled was hired as an artist when he was 71. And means. what's truly intriguing about his role of paleo artist is that he didn't believe these extinct creatures had lived. Hansen's religious convictions and his belief in the great biblical flood didn't mesh with the animals he was painting here, and so he referred to them simply as the objects. In spite of that, his imagination in depicting ancient animals was world class, and many tonight. of his paintings hung with the articulated Ooh. skeletons in the fossil hall for many Exciting. Years. He worked for the field Exciting. until a month before his death in 1952, at the age of 84. Shortly before Conrad Hansen's death, another artist was hired by the geology department. Mighty Weenie was born in Germany in 1922, but not much about her early life, life is known, <laughs> even to her family. Amazing. She grew up during Incredible. the most vicious years of World War II, and undoubtedly was impacted by the experience. While her family certainly endured hardships, they were lucky to be German. She was able to pursue a university this, education in Poland This is what's in interesting. Large number of fungi cause a disease in plants. The very few do in humans. And fungi and like mushrooms. 
mushrooms or like what we use as antibiotics. She re-enrolled at the University like, of Frankfurt interest, determined to study art. Plants, Weeby had a sense us. of independence that was still pretty unusual Ranch. for women at that time. In 1951, she departed for Chicago, and later that year was hired enthusiastically by curators at the Field Museum, who recognized her talents as an exceptional naturalist and artist. She created figures for scientific papers, illustrated a number of children's books, carried on Hansen's work painting prehistoric life, and created scale models to accompany the mounted skeletons on display. Some of her work can still be seen around the museum today, especially in the geology cases on the second floor, where she illustrated geologic phenomena, including impact craters macro, from meteorites. Micro and it's in and these photographs of her yeah. looking they so be poised baby and polished, but painting scenes of epic destruction stomach. that first piqued my interest in learning more about her. One of Weeby's biggest projects was designing and modeling new dinosaurs for display in our main hall, a Gorgosaurus, which came to be known as Gorgeous George, in the middle of eating a Lambiosaurus. When it was unveiled in 1956, Gorgeous George was the first freestanding dinosaur mount in any museum. Eugene Gene Richardson, who was the curator of fossil invertebrates, found it so remarkable that he wrote a poem about it, which was delivered upon its unveiling to the public. Mighty's illustrations so well, and like models played a big part of like in breathing life into the project, and her miniatures were on display next plants. to the mounted skeletons until they were eventually removed from the hall in 1990. The dinosaur skeletons were oh God, mounted to display a more modern plants. anatomical understanding and are still on display in our Evolving Planet exhibition. Mighty's work it's continued cool. until 1960, when she left the museum at the age of 40, but she carried a love of art in the natural <laughs> world throughout the rest of her life. Need that, need that good support. <laughs> Many things have changed in the years since the field first commissioned these artists to help tell the story of life on Earth. New research is regularly reshaping the way we interpret extinct life forms. And today, while we might not point to Knight's or Weeby's depictions of Cretaceous apex predators as the most modern representations of them, that doesn't mean their art has lost its value. It's through the work of these artists that researchers were I best think. able to communicate the progress of science and bring That's our ancient important. world back to life. Zygo my sites. I see Black Come mold. and see the Gorgosaurus. Tall as life, though somewhat thinner, standing in the hall before us and erupted in his Okay, so there's four groups of true fungi. years ago, he found a Lambiosaur to munch on. growth and Something habitat stopped his feast, and so he never had that final luncheon. Which is Long a networking ago, platform. Dude, Gorgosaurus roamed Alberta, trying to, ever trying to get these jobs through the YouTube comments. <laughs> what is going on in my life? Then he died, became a fossil buried near the Red Deer River past the years asleep and docile, giving not a jerk or quiver. Found and shipped to the museum with that meal he never tasted. Oh, here he stands, and here uh, you see him. Not a bone on him was wasted. Other skeletons of his bulk I'm must good. be held erect by crutches. Not a post is seen on this hulk, just the floor is all he touches. Engineers may be well baffled by the structure we're reporting. Here he stands without a scaffold. Gorgosaur is self-supporting. <laughs> Gorgosaur, Gorgosaur, Gorgosaur. I can't hear words. Original theme by Michael Aranda. Of course, Michael did sound like that. Brain on it. I think he talked about both this and then after this crash course. This episode is brought to you by the Field Museum in Chicago, and stuff was sold to PBS. For Natural Kunda in Berlin, Michael's like, Germany. do I own this hey, music? Hey, we anymore? are here in the National Park of Teres Odertal, and Poland is right there. We can see it. Ooh. Also, my feet are freezing. Let's go. People have been cultivating grain and farming cattle in the Oder Valley for more than 7,000 years. Alteration of the land ramped up in the early 19th century and continued through the 1990s. During the 1970s, industrialization and expanded agricultural practices had a huge impact on transforming the region. Then the political changes in 1990 allowed for the area to be set aside and protected in the Lower Oder Valley mean? National Park was established in 1995. And Did I know what these the minutes are? National Park uh, was founded. It was uh, divided, uh, that uh, here Cap no uh, agriculture will be done no more, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, area this will uh, develop uh, naturally. This is Dr. Karl Heinz Bermold, the curator of the Animal Sound Archive for the Museum for Natural Kunde. Today, he's right. going to take us into the field Red. to show us how scientists collect field recordings in wetlands to learn more about the animals that call them home. But right. first. A little background. 
The Animal Sound Archive at the Museum for Natural Kunda was established in 1951, and in the last 70 years, scientists have contributed more than 120,000 recordings to this collection. And many of these sounds can now be heard from anywhere in the world. As scientists the music to write to. What's a good like mushroom sauce? To digital You're going on like a forest trip. The first recording so were made in 1951 mm -hmm. uh, by uh, Professor Gunda Tempok. And uh, this was a part of the behavioral study. Ooh, on oh my gosh, October one of my favorite things. 30, um, 1951, Günther Tempok There's this album the tape recorder. And during this time, uh, it's by Andrew Huang. Uh, a housing I still listen to it all the time. It's like ambient noise. Garden, and, oh my gosh, I might uh, have to go to this the Tony Alls started band camp. Live, and uh, uh, when uh, this yeah. Tony Alls Andrew Tony, a white Huang. Tony uh, all came, and uh, was uh, duetting uh, with uh, Andrew so much music. music. Wow, uh, that's amazing. And he caught it all on the recording. We yes, have Magical we Body. We can then listen to that's it. some good ambient music. Buy all of Andrew's music for $115. That's actually a good deal. Andrew has like 67 <laughs> releases. That's ridiculous. Oh my gosh, that's still a pink. <laughs> but I highly recommend Magical Body for what you're writing. Have some wildlife activity here. This is the evidence of a wild boar. Yeah. And they use their nose to dig into the mud. It took me years mess. to like until like I knew today. what hookah was. So say. I was like, oh my god, the caterpillar is doing hookah. No, I mean birds is not boar. Anyway. Yes, we have a second sighting of evidence of boar. It's their little trail. Yeah. I think if I follow it, I could go find him. See you. No, I'm not good. I got the other stuff to do. I gotta go. Dutch elm disease. We have a third piece of evidence from the wild boar. Some uh, hoof prints here heading that way, which is maybe east, I don't actually know. Um, and some roe deer hooves. I appreciate how cool. this video, which is supposed to be about a bioacoustic library, I don't, I don't has become in search of the wild boar. <laughs> Wasn't in the script. Eh, let's get back to Carl. Did you use this? Yes, I have used it. Wow, for your own field recording. For own field recording. Mindset. And how much does this store? Like, how, how long could you record you, you, with Usually uh, you can, uh, uh, with high quality or with good quality, uh, approximately love fungi. Oh, uh, they the party in. Last uh, more than uh, 30, 40 minutes. Really? Kind of but uh, it was uh, fungi. already mm -hmm. at a uh, large uh, advantage. It's probably, yeah, because this includes uh, common uh, mushroom uh, and yeah. puffballs. Uh, the gramophone <laughs> technology. <laughs> it was probably because they are go, uh, with like the in clusters very often. And, uh, this was almost Interesting. Impossible. The first uh, tape recorders of uh, this uh, kind uh, were used uh, by the CIA. So spies. So for, 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 yes, for spies. And you go to the uh, club, the you'll find a fun of, guy. Uh, this is, of course, it's, it's much, lighter. much smaller, much uh, lighter. And uh, the recording uh, uh, quality Blow was some extremely <laughs> good. In the winter, you always have the problems uh, that the batteries uh, will be cold. Oh. And uh, you could uh, put uh, the recorder inside uh, uh, your pocket yeah. and it will be warm. Uh, but uh, it is advantage uh, was it uh, was easier uh, to uh, work uh, with the tapes to cut the large tapes. Obligate intracellular uh, parasites. Oh, okay. So this was just for spying and mm. for, for field like spores work, yeah. in the air for field work, that can kill you. You have um, this nifty little box here today too. This is um, something that you're you're actually using today to record field work. Yeah, it is uh, uh, for. Uh, uh, doing a continuous uh, recording. We, for this purpose, uh, use uh, this uh, small recorder. Yeah. This is not mm, the usual way uh, to yeah. for power supply. Wow. It's self-made. Usually you have here two small batteries wow. and can uh, record uh, with uh, this uh, small uh, digital recorder. So this, you could record for 30 minutes. Yeah. How long could you record on this? Approximately one hour. One hour, and then you're going to 32 gigs. It can record for 48 two hours. Two gigs, yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Well, we have used uh, this uh, equipment uh, uh, to look uh, if uh, uh, corn quakes are present. This is very important. Uh, 
in a sense, uh, the corn crake is a rare species. Mm -hmm. And oh, so when a corn crake that's is interesting. A, a detected Keratoconjunctivitis. in conjunctivitis, the meter will not be used until a, a certain time. Really? So this is what you're putting out there now in these wetland environments to get an idea of, of what's living there? At, at, least, at least one way. See, the one thing about not writing in the tiny pen anymore is okay, that Carl, I feel like my handwriting got automatically yeah, worse. No, it's, it's a space uh, it's where a little bit neater when you're writing in this tiny one. Okay. We have here Never mind, monitor. that's still bad. <laughs> and I don't know, maybe that one's more readable because it's bigger. No, no, uh, <laughs> I was like, never mind, that was neat. <laughs> out any break. Really? Yes, so the, the only break is uh, when we are changing the batteries and the memory cards. Okay. Your and handwriting the idea could get worse. Uh, why we have a Shocker. The recorder here. Uh, in front, uh, was, we have... That was kind of okay on these. Uh, uh, they wanted to be able to read them later. Uh, but I mean, water still pretty bad. Breathing and it's, uh, I have a lot of little diagrams on the algae one, though. A high Which are pretty cute. Of spotted crakes, for example. And those are rare birds kelp. in this area, or? These are, again, in general, rare birds. We is have there recorded. Uh, uh, there uh, isn't uh, much room. There isn't much Three days there earlier isn't much. than any ornithologist <laughs> in uh, Took me Germany a second. Has reported <laughs> it, uh, a wow. spotted crake. Since we recorded this, Carl found another recording showing that the spotted crake had actually migrated to the area 13 days earlier than ornithologists had initially observed, which is a pretty big deal when you're trying to track an endangered species. Well, I love that, that this work is being proactive and you're recording it now with the idea that future generations are going to be utilizing the <laughs> animal sound <laughs> library and helping to uh, analyze that information. I tried my best to be kind of neat when I wrote those. Yes, uh, no, we al already started uh, yeah. to use uh, the sound library uh, for developing uh, uh, recognizing uh, algorithms. Great. Well, we should probably change those batteries. Yes. Okay. Let's. So what are some of the observations yeah. that you've oh. made by analyzing I keep forgetting this where information? I am. Uh, we have already analyzed uh, data for some uh, breeding uh, seasons uh, and uh, at least uh, 60 uh, species of uh, oh, breeding uh, birds could often be detected on the sound wow. recording. It seems like a lot of information to go through though. Are you coming back here then to your lab every night and having to go through the recordings or are you relying on volunteers or, or how are you um, ultimately analyzing this information? Wow. Uh, you're right, uh, that's uh, really a challenge uh, to analyze uh, this huge uh, information. Up to now, Two. we can uh, only yeah. estimate uh, uh, the real uh, species composition uh, by listening uh, to uh, the recordings. Wow. And uh, the other way is uh, to develop some algorithms uh, for automated analysis <laughs> using a pattern recognition <laughs> algorithm. It's all good. <laughs> it works uh, not perfect. Okay. Uh, but uh, just like every single algorithm one. I mean, gives us uh, it's a just tragic. indication. Yeah. If, uh, the bird, uh, <laughs> just rely on it. It will be here. <laughs> oh, that is a large battery. Oh my God, this has to be at least 10 pounds. <laughs> Almost 20. Oh my God. Well, have it you hiked this, I guess you have to, you hiked this all the way with it. Mm -hmm. I, I wasn't carrying anything. I wasn't even helping. Now we are recording. Oh, there it goes. We're back. The next and round. Good for another month. Back at it. Why am I still holding this battery? I don't know. When we only want uh, to check if uh, a certain species is there, uh, one channel recording or a stereo recording yeah. is uh, excellent. Mm -hmm. uh, but Major uh, cause of asthma, to of estimate, course. Uh, Telling us all. Hmm? The density of birds. Uh, we uh, use a four channel setup. You can uh, exactly uh, estimate uh, the, the direction from which an animal is crawling. Jack's Films just uh, uploaded a video called Taylor up One. Different four channel recordings. I kind of is. Oh my god. If you catch me at the border, I got visas in my neck. If you come around here, I'll make a more day. I get one down in a second. What year is this? <laughs> Good content, Jack. <laughs> I 
I don't, I don't even know what to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a food choice. <laughs> I suppose. That's what I got. <laughs> you got me. Then this Ashley Play community is toxic. <laughs> so you can make a triangulation. Toxic streamer, guys. And then exactly vocalize as a bird. So you can, and you just kind of have a 360 acoustic <laughs> understanding wow. of where you can everything leave might be positioned anytime rather than mm -hmm. um, just hearing things on either side and not knowing if it's in front of you or, or behind you. That's right. So you mentioned um, that that first recording that uh, was made back in 1951, anybody can listen to online. So is it just Mainly that terrestrial. recording? Or what how does that mean? Like sometimes they're available ocean? to the public. And are there why ocean fungi? Did you it in the first place? Digitizing what? the tape. What community can we fire right now? I don't know. Go, go spam Ian's videos. comments. He already. Up or not Ian's comments, Jack's comments. Uh, Why did he change the title already? It was, it was Taylor wow. 1, now it's Taylor and underscore switch. I expect uh, that uh, we will finish uh, the process big of yikes, the big oof. within mm -hmm. the next uh, two years. The Pokemon community. And, uh, up, uh, no, we what happened in April? Uh, Dude, I don't know what happened. Recordings. Wow. What happened in and, the Pokemon community? Uh, up to now, uh, we have approximately There's Pokemon drama? 30,000 or 35,000 recordings online. Oh, that's fantastic. So our audience could go on to the library today and oh, listen I to forgot some of the recordings or even the more recent recordings. Yeah, th there's no need to come here. Yeah. You, you I mean, come and say hi to Carl, but... Um, yeah. <laughs> but, but and, and, and to look at, on uh, the magnetic tape. Yeah, which are very cool, by the way. Um, but that's, I think that's fantastic that you're making such a, moist um, an effort to mm, they preserve love this information, to make it available for people. and to um, you know, inspire the next generation of, of people who want to use these techniques to monitor My areas mom bought not a bunch of Germany, ramen but anywhere in the world. Worldwide. And yeah, that's I don't know how not to eat that. Tomorrow. Before we go, I had the chance to I'm speak like thinking with Dr. About noodles. Sarah Darwin about her work on the Citizen Science Project, Nightingale City, Berlin. Sarah and her colleagues are working with the Museum for Natural Kunda's Animal Sound <laughs> Library to share and analyze some drama. The recordings of the migratory nightingale <laughs> song, which are submitted by people from What did you say? Berlin. Oh man, so I hate when I don't see and then people get modded. In Berlin, every spring, these lovely little brown birds like moist to know what you did wrong <laughs> Africa moist. and they come to Berlin yeah. and they sing on every street corner every park along railway sidings in gardens we're gonna have two scientific components one will be asking the public to go and record the nightingales in their local parks and gardens mm -hmm. and put them onto the website and then the other will be in the autumn when the weather starts getting a bit dreary we're going to s hopefully train people how to um, analyze the song. Nightingale songs have around a thousand dif different no, little melodies. Really? really? Yeah. I, so you I try to today. write. Um, you try to transcribe in my this. Tent, and it's not easy. What well, can um, you maybe okay. recite the poem? Well, it's not really. It is nearly a song, actually. Okay. So okay. I can I can perform it. Yes. If you like. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so it kind of goes. Tick, 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 tick. Oh, sweet. Well, it doesn't really sound very much like the actual bird, but it's, I was you know, it's uh, I you was were <laughs> Good. That was me oh, the whole time. I Don't love let it. that oh. Goodbye, cruel flies. <laughs> Goodbye, cruel world. Start. I like playing in the mud. It still has brains on it. This episode is brought to you by the Field Museum in Chicago, Illinois, and the Museum for Natural Kunda in Berlin, Germany. A fossil Germany. arachnid. Fossil Arachnids penis. do not typically what? make it onto people's <laughs> top list for favorite animals, which is too bad. There's so much diversity from camel spiders. How many views did she get on this? Just because well, it's called regular fossil spiders. Penis. We just can't get enough of these amazing creatures. And lucky for us, at the not Museum bad. for Natural Kunda in Berlin, we were Actually able to surprised. chat with another arachnologist, Dr. Jason Dunlop. He's the senior curator for arachnids and myriapods, and his focus is on fossil arachnids.
What really fascinates me is the idea of where did spiders and other arachnids evolve mm -hmm. from? And so what I do is try and use the fossil record to try and answer some of these questions about how do these different groups relate to each other? Do we find anything like a sort of missing link between two um, groups of arachnids? What makes fossil arachnids so wonderful to study is that most of Jason's specimens are encased in amber, sort of like, you know, Jurassic Park. And it means that many of their features are immaculately preserved, which recently led Jason and his colleagues to a rather large discovery. I understand that you became quite the media sensation with a, uh, a publication that you had pretty recently. Well, what happened was a, a few years ago, we discovered a new harvest moon in Amber, and this was back in 2005. Goodbye, and we had a sort of child. suspicion that it might be um, there the days something new, something we don't have today. What does that taste like? But we like? couldn't really prove it. Yeah, like one of the things berry? about um, it's the like taxonomy of spiders and, and, and harvest moon and other arachnids is very often you need genitalia. And then a few years later, a colleague of mine phoned me up and said, well, hang on, I've got one where I can think I can see the, the genitalia, and then the, the male of this harvestman has a, a so-called penis, and he could see it actually stuck out of the body, which we couldn't see in the original specimen. That's and so it's weird. very, very rare to see this in an amber harvestman. And so we, we got sent the specimen, like and we wrote it up, and we Damn. published this. And of course, we had a suspicion that this could be a bit of a newsworthy story. Oh, the so biggest pokey tumor. Out a press release, mm -hmm. um, and we got and quite I a lot of uh, feedback from uh, that, and then people sort of really um, jumped on this idea that they'd found this uh, 100 million year old penis in amber, and, and um, this became uh, really quite a sensation. <laughs> so, so how does this make you feel as like a, a scientist, as a taxonomist? You know, the new pokey tube work, was like no offense, probably isn't going to like make scary community. very often. On the one side, we're very happy when it just like. Pokemon out here. Write a serious article about it, and it does I have a serious side because penis. you could use these characters that we saw to say that oh. this is a new family, an extinct family. It's something really. Whenever I wear and glasses and headphones at the same time, of life as it hurts were, so bad. Thanks to this <laughs> My ears. Penis that we found. <laughs> On the, of course, on the other hand, um, it also yeah. means that we've got an example. The, the tabloid press. I'll continue the rest of those later. Silly stories. It at least it gets people thinking about the subject. It gets people perhaps interested in in the fact that there are these fossil arachnids, mm -hmm. um, and that you can actually find remarkable stories about them. Is there actually a pretty wide variety of organisms that are preserved in amber in that way? Basically, anything that could get itself caught in tree resin has a good chance of being preserved in amber. So it's probably there's so much to tree resin, like a lizard or a bird. It's much more common to find um, an arachnid that the pedophiles take. But you nice don't know who they are study, until though, something uh, happens. Uh, you know, study That's the scary part. You can see on a modern one. There's also new techniques that we can use called computer tomography, where we can really make a wonderful three-dimensional scan of, of the specimen and really study it as though it was a, as a living spider. So how old are spiders? Do you have like an estimate for when they first appeared in the fossil record? The oldest spider that we know of is Any, about uh, 315 before. million years old. So that comes from the Carboniferous period. And we're pretty sure they belong to a primitive group of spiders that are still alive today. The group in Southeast Asia, they're called the Mesophiles. Most spiders don't foot. have segmentation. But these uh, spiders still have this primitive character of plates on the back of the abdomen. That's very well got named. A very nice example here. This is quite a large spider here, which uh, I'm actually going to be working on very shortly. And this is about 99 million years old, so it means this spider would have been running around under the feet of the dinosaurs. It's extremely well preserved. Yeah. Male spiders, you can tell that because of what we Yikes. found. Um, the, the, these um, little I want that kind of fungus. Called, uh, the, the, the palp organs um, at the front of the body. And what's interesting here is that it seems to be one of these segmented spiders, but the position of the spinnerets where the, the silk would have come out is a little bit different to what we would see in a modern spider. So this is why this uh, specimen is going to be quite an interesting example to look at. How many Ooh. extinct species yeah, you would hope. do we know of? You would hope. About 1,300 uh, extinct species of spider. With fossils, you're always looking at, like, we say, windows into space That's like all time. you can do so with, you know, most fossil spiders celebrities and like viewers are just like, I hope that they're good people. Just because we could look at it for 200 years. Um, there's now a new amber coming in in Southeast Asia, but like which we've only known know. about really intensively the last few years. And uh, it may be that in, in, in the future we'll have a lot more data from this particular source. I, I saw that you're involved in a project called the World Spider Catalog. Mm -hmm. It seems to be this amazing global collaborative oh, effort to catalog all of the world's spiders. Where did this initiative come from? And I mean, how many so spiders cutaneous. are we actually talking about here? Oops. Well, we're talking about 47,000 living fungus. spiders. Yeah. Um, and the project goes back to the 1950s when uh, a French guy called Pierre Bonnet actually started sitting down and typing 
taking all of this data in. And, and of course, we've taken that basic data and turned this now into a computer uh, database. And this means that we can know exactly how many species of spiders are described, where they're found, and where they've been mentioned in the scientific literature. And this is extremely helpful for people working on describing new species because at least you have a starting point, you have a baseline and say, okay, for this group of spiders, this is what we know and I can describe new ones and then of course that data gets fed into the catalog and we have a much more accurate picture of how many spiders there are. My hands are going to hurt. So. Find them. How can't do this study for spiders? much longer. There aren't very many to be honest. There's perhaps about a dozen people worldwide who I'm are actually really proud of like my spiders on the algae. Around, so it's it's a fairly restricted group, and of course we all know each other. I can actually change names on this. We sort of help each other out. This is the first time I've used one, though. Think about the fact that that was living around the dinosaurs, you know? Like, they were coinciding at the same time, and yet, I mean, there are all these books about dinosaurs for children, but I don't know of any about fossil spiders. No, I mean, I wrote a book on fossil spiders, but not for children. Oh, hand hanging. But there is, they're not as familiar to people, perhaps, as fossil groups like dinosaurs or trilobites. So, I mean, one of the things I've always been trying to push in my career and going to conferences and saying, hey, guys, mm. there are actually you know, nearly 2,000 fossil species of arachnids as well. They're actually really quite an important group, and, and uh, they're worth studying for understanding where these animals came from. I think that's a good message you named? for our viewers at home. Study Just not? No. So study fossil spiders. Home. You... has brains on it. We don't need to do that. I think we're live. Oh. All right. Yeah, it's exciting. This episode is brought to you by the Field Museum in Chicago, There's Illinois, a live stream. Museum for Naturkunde in Berlin, Germany. 2018 marks the 125th name, year anniversary of the Field Museum. By 1893, we computer. had raised funds, amassed collections from the I World's Fair, have. developed exhibit cases for display to the public, and were ready to open our doors for visitors and researchers alike. But the history of natural history collections like ours is much older than any one institution. People have been collecting and categorizing objects from the natural school? world oh, as long as we've had a curiosity about our planet. <laughs> and it's thanks to museums that many of these collections still exist today. Uh, hmm. What are you wearing? Lederhosen. Take Germany, for example. What are these the Museum for, for Natural in Berlin opened mentioned? its doors to the public in 1889, but the history of the museum dates back That's to 1810, intriguing. when oh the God. King of Prussia, just Frederick have the Wilhelm longest. III, unified three smaller museum Never. collections into Berlin University. That's and cool. since that time, the collections in Berlin have endured major political and changes and have two I shown world you guys wars. The they sustained serious like damage from Allied bombs in 1945, which left the entire eastern wing obliterated well, until well after the reunification of Germany in 1990. The I can't style. even begin Here's to imagine what sort of stories are in and a collection some like videos, that. Probably. I'd love to visit, but it's not like there's some secret door that connects Actually, us all across space and time. Actually, I can do some flashcards while we're watching videos. This is good. Oh my god, a species of butterfly named for Emily. So cute. Oh, not the soon record. Sorry, buddy. Yeah. Ooh, let's go with SciShow. Let's go SciShow in a There was one that I was curious about the other day. I wanted to know what the heck they were talking about. This episode about of SciShow is sponsored by Wix. Go to wix.com slash go slash SciShow to create your own website. Let's go back to the MCAT one. Some things I know. Now, some there's no shortage of classic food bio, pairings out care. there. Peanut butter and jelly, chicken and waffles, spinach and orange juice. Wait, what? Well, that's right. Thanks to a bit of food chemistry, spinach and orange juice are a nutritional dream team. The vitamin C in orange juice can actually help your body absorb the iron found in vegetables like spinach. Now this matters because our bodies absorb certain types of iron much better than others. While you only see the word iron on a nutrition label, what it doesn't tell you is that dietary iron comes in two main varieties. Team iron comes attached to a chemical structure called heme, which is in turn bound up in various proteins, mainly hemoglobin and myoglobin. Non-heme iron does doesn't come with those accessories. In general, heme iron but comes from animal pen. products like muscle or liver, while non-heme comes from plant sources, including leafy Firm greens like spinach. 
Although meat does have quite a bit of the non-heme variety Umbilical also. And no matter how much kale you eat, that doesn't oh. change the amount oh, no, of non-heme iron that actually enters our bloodstream, these. which is also known as its bioavailability. The bioavailability for non-heme iron is much lower than for heme iron. Unfortunately, non-heme iron is way more common in our diets, even for meat eaters. So scientists look at ways to increase how much non-heme iron we can actually absorb, because we need that stuff. One of the problems is that non-heme iron oxidizes really easily, meaning it loses electrons and picks up a more positive charge, and that new form is insoluble in our blood, enough. making it unusable by our bodies. A few different chemicals can help, but vitamin C, or ascorbate, is a common and effective way of bumping up the bioavailability of non-heme yes. iron. It does this sense. by sharing an electron with the iron, taking it from a positive 3 charge to a positive 2. This less positively charged separate? iron is the kind that's absorbed by our bodies. And vitamin C is capable of a second chemical trick as well. Not Similar to how heme iron here. comes attached to a protein, the ascorbate the ascorbate molecule I grabs onto non-heme iron and forms a complex that's way to remember that it. keeps it soluble long enough for your gut to absorb it. But the benefits of ascorbate on iron absorption don't stop there. When the body senses it's low on iron, a protein called transferrin so carries it off to its target action. cells. You might say it ferries it into your system. But at the yeah. cellular level, ascorbate helps again by stimulating the production of Electron ferritin, a protein in the cell that receives and stores iron. So ferritin acts like a storage closet for iron, allowing its release when it's needed. Is so while orange juice might not enhance an the taste of your kale salad, it's doing a whole lot more than you'd think for its nutritional yeah. content. If you're looking to share your newfound knowledge oh, so of OJ's hidden benefits on your own health blog, why not know. try oh, a website wow. builder to make it look amazing? Why With Wix, you can get a professional website created in just a few minutes. Wix is a website builder that offers you multiple Let's levels do. of custom- Ask the sponsor. Rival miss- Ooh, they'll definitely make things worse. I want to see that one. Turns to a ground state. I do muscles control. Overall Let's say your car traction. breaks down in the middle of the desert or in a howling blizzard. Your phone battery is Three dead. You didn't stock up on food and water like you maybe should have. How are you going to get out of this one? If you find yourself in a survival situation, you're going to have certain uh. priorities. Water, not dying of exposure, not being mauled by wild animals, and you know, getting back to Wi-Fi as soon as possible so you can watch SciShow. For most folks, you know, food can actually right be a lower priority. But there is a lot of bad survival info out there. Some tips seem too good to be true, <laughs> and they good. are. Others are oh, ingrained so. enough to be common knowledge, except they're wrong. So here's a list of eight survival tips Freeze you definitely any. shouldn't Absorption. follow, and what to do instead. First up, Freeze water. What water about all the Absorption. snow that's piling up eight? in the blizzard? That is made of water. Yeah. Snow can be safe to eat, especially if it's freshly it fallen. Yeah, While it can sense. collect contaminants as it falls, things like soot from wood fires and coal plants, that generally it's won't be like enough that. to hurt you. Snow that's already been on the but ground for a while is riskier state. since it might have accumulated, yes. like, who knows what, pollutants from the road, maybe. I had you to know, think you about can insert it. your own yellow snow joke here. But eating snow bad. might be a bad idea for a different reason. It has to melt inside your body, and that uses your body heat. Water has a high heat capacity because it has pretty strong bonds holding the molecules Emma. together. So you need a All lot the, of energy to break those to bonds to boil fibers. liquid water or melt ice. Energy your body would otherwise be using geometry. to keep you warm. Yeah. Plus, you'd have to eat a lot of snow to get enough water since Facial piles of snow of contain air. a lot of air. So to keep your body temperature from falling too much, find a way to melt the snow first. But the worst way to do that acid. is to like hold it again your skin to melt it. Don't do that. Still gonna oh, cool you is. down. If you're in the it's desert, changed. don't count okay. on cactuses as like secret jugs of fresh Earth spring water. Too. There's a lot of water in there, yeah, but there's also a bunch of noxious chemicals. Cactuses Ooh. use an unusual type of photosynthesis called yes. CAM. CAM photosynthesis Dude, uses way it. less water than there's other kinds, so it's handy in the desert. CAM plants gather CO2 through oh pores God. at night and store it in the form of organic acids. Like, of, like, then they can close now. those pores during the day to minimize water loss, using the stored carbon to get on with the light-dependent parts of photosynthesis. For storage, they mainly Thanks use malic acid, bio. which isn't so bad for you. It's in various fruits, although too much can irritate C3, your mouth. C4, but many CAM, CAM plants also Thank make you. oxalic oh acid. God. Oxalic acid is toxic because it binds to calcium which can mess up your body. It can also build up in your kidneys in the form of calcium oxalate, the Purple stuff bombs? kidney stones are made of. In addition to the bomb. acids, a lot of cactus flesh contains alkaloids, Negative which are a diverse family of, of 
cause an all directions towards the center of charge. Nice Negative fields are pulling really in. Your body. Positive Cactus charges juice are pushing won't out. Get you high like it did to Sokka and Avatar: The Last Airbender, but it can make you sick Oligo enough to cause puking or diarrhea, which will dehydrate Deep you things. and make matters worse. Fish hook barrel cactuses and young prickly pear cactuses contain what few enough of the unpleasant chemicals um, to be kind of edible I when like raw. Urban, they still don't taste but good, but they'll do in a bind. But you better be pretty confident in your botany skills. Right, Bodily fluids are also up. mostly water, so you might think you can recycle them. Drinking urine might help you survive ever so slightly longer, but it's only safe to do for a day or so. That's because the waste products in your pee are waste for a reason. If you put them back in your body, they'll build up faster than your kidneys can eliminate them. And that can send you into a state similar to kidney failure, with your body unable to process all of the potassium, nitrogen and compounds, and calcium you're throwing at it. As for blood, it's sometimes safe Amid. to eat Is in small Amid? amounts. In certain places, it's fairly common, but that's okay? more for its yeah. protein and iron content than as a source for water. In large amounts, that's, which you'd need to stay hydrated, blood contains more R iron groups. than your body the can handle and it becomes toxic. Your body tries to store it in places like Amid. your heart and liver, but that can group. lead to organ failure and death. Plus, you're at risk from bloodborne pathogens, so going full vampire to survive, probably not the best okay. idea. But let's Hold say you on. found Antigo. some water, and now you need a way to get home without GPS. And maybe you've oh, heard that moss, moss really always grow grows on the north sides of trees. This is one of those things that's actually true in general, but not 100% hmm. reliable all the time. So it's not like, so useful for navigation. Here in the northern hemisphere, the northern side of a tree will get the least sunlight thanks to the Earth's tilt. That means the northern side of the tree is most likely to be shady, cool, and damp, all it? things that moss oh, likes. Earth. Mosses are non-vascular plants which aren't as good at retaining water Bedding. as other types of plants. They essentially lack the plumbing to transport water inside of them, so they need over. all the moisture they can get. So if some other situation is creating good conditions on any particular side of a tree, moss can grow there just fine. It's not necessarily pointing north, Excellent it's just the Bedding. nice for moss side. Bedding You're going to need some shelter too, or at least a way to stay warm. Oh. And you might have seen people in old-timey books or shows giving a swig of booze to warm someone up, especially in a blizzard. This one almost seems intuitive oh because goodness, alcohol brings a flush of warmth to your cheeks, but that is the exact opposite of what you want if you need to stay warm. Alcohol is a vasodilator, meaning it opens up the blood vessels near the surface of your skin, probably by altering your brain's blood vessel controls. That increased blood flow is why you might yeah. feel or look flushed when you're drunk, but it also Super transports warmth towards the surface Version. of your skin where it can conveniently Bedding. diffuse away from your body Unequal and into the colder air nearby. Thanks, thermodynamics. When your body Excellent is trying function. to stay warm, it actually constricts Extend. those blood vessels to try and conserve warmth in your internal organs it actually makes in your you brain, cold. which need to stay at 37 degrees Celsius buster. to keep <laughs> ticking. Don't undo that hard work. And if you're cold, rubbing yourself to stay warm seems intuitive. The friction generates a bit of warmth. But once frostbite sets in, that is a horrible Man. idea. On a cellular scale, frostbite means ice crystals are starting to form in your tissues, and ice crystals are sharp. They can Electronic puncture activity. cell membranes and other cellular this structures, one. not uh -huh. to mention freeze the water Who's those cells were using to live. Rubbing will jostle those sharp chunks of ice around and cause them to rupture nearby that cells. Yeah. That's gonna make things much worse. Also, even though it's painful, yes. it's not good the to thaw aerone, those frostbitten bones if hormone. they're still at risk of refreezing. More ice it's forming steroid. again will do angio, more damage and risk more permanent loss of tissue. Frostbite mostly affects the no? extremities if hypothermia yes. actually sets in, meaning the is body's core temperature has dropped ADH? below 35 then degrees. The key is careful, slow reintroduction of warmth. Like? Plunging a victim of hypothermia in a hot tub could cause irregular heart rhythm or even a heart attack. The proper way to treat Frostbite and hypothermia so is like by a doctor, but when that's not possible, caution is best. Try to sit tight is. and don't Are risk doing away? more harm. Okay, Finally, on your way home, it's best if you can avoid being mauled, bitten, or stung by anything. But if you Seen are, be careful what advice you listen to, like that one myth that tells you to like slice open the snake of bite and no suck out the toxin. Thank you. The effects of snake bite vary based on the kind of snake and the venom it's packing. Some bites may cause severe tissue damage and 
internal bleeding, while others are neurotoxins. There's a bunch. Snake venoms are oh, fascinating. Fine, so in reality, this so-called treatment it. will increase the risk it. of the wound getting infected, possibly spread Carbon. the venom it's into the victim's bloodstream much reactivity. faster, That's what I was and confused. not actually ah. remove very much venom. In other words, Reactive. don't Reasonable do it. Salt. An article published in the New ASK England Journal of Medicine in 2002 strongly Those discourages incision and suction for snake the bites. Instead, they recommend keeping the wound below the renin. level of the heart, keeping the victim is. warm, avoiding tourniquets or any kind of restrictive clothing or jewelry, and getting to the hospital as soon as possible. Hospitals can administer antivenom to neutralize the bite. Antivenom is made up of antibodies that are carefully made An to bind enzyme. to the venom and stop it from having effects on your body. Since different snakes make different kinds of venom, one of the main things is to remember as much as you can about what the snake looked like. You don't need to, like, catch the snake and, like, bring it along with you, though. That's not gonna help. Nobody's gonna like that. And some kinds of antivenom work for multiple okay. kinds of snakes. It depends on the exact cocktail Perfect. of antibodies. So you're best off leaving the treatment, hey, to and professionals, okay, because so I don't think you have a venom-binding antibody serum in your it's back no. pocket. And if you do, that should be refrigerated. And last but not least, suppose you're stranded on the shore <laughs> instead of in a forest and got a nasty jellyfish sting. Should you German just pee on it? Besides sounding totally gross and weird, it's not worth it. Oh, pee doesn't work. Micro. And it might even make things worse. Jellyfish tentacles Conjugate contain acid. stinging cells called mitocytes, which discharge tiny harpoon-like stingers when they touch you, plus Continuity the venom. Oh, and some of that venom no. can poke holes in cells or cause all kinds of biological oh, mayhem. No. But not many of the nitocytes some on the stinging I just don't care about because they're like physics. First touch it. So the trick and is to get MCAT, it off so. you without triggering the thousands and of others. The myth claims that urine will neutralize those nitocytes so they don't go off and sting you. You, but certain chemical doers, changes can oh fire off nitocytes as well as touch. Like alcohol is known to trigger them. And at least one study has shown that urine can do so as well. A 2017 study published in the journal mm. Toxins found that many popular sting treatments, including scraping the stung area with a credit card oh, or shaving horrific. cream, don't work. Sea water can help you rinse them off, but it won't chemically prevent them from firing. That's where jellyfish live, after all. Instead, they found that a good dousing with vinegar is best, which is just the chemical acetic acid. That will actually neutralize the ones that haven't stung you yet, maybe by bringing the pH too low for them to function. Then, the tentacles can be carefully plucked away by tweezers and heating pads will help ease the pain of a sting. Now, you may never need to use any of these tips. I certainly That's hope well. you don't. But there's a lot of misinformation out there and emergency survival is something you don't really want to take chances with. So a little bit of You're scientific rigor could be the best way to know if a tip could save your life or make things much worse. Thanks Correction. for watching this okay. episode of SciShow. If you want to keep learning more about the weirdness of human and bodies base. and the world we live in, you can go to youtube.com slash SciShow to place. subscribe. Eight animal friendships that will give you all the feels. That's a wholesome video. We'll take it. Eat things. In the wild, it's easy to imagine that every species uh, is out for itself. But this, animals of different species form all sorts like of relationships in nature, and Blue some of them are downright every, friendly. Yes. That's what you call mutualism, a relationship where both organisms benefit from the arrangement. Uh, kind of like a, a good scratch my back, boy. I'll scratch yours, because neither of us can scratch our own backs because our arms are wrong. Such animal partnerships show just how interconnected the animal kingdom really is. is. So today we're going to talk about aortic. eight unexpected but very real animal Those duos. From hunting partners to grooming buddies, like these animals make interspecies friendships. I can only think of glucose, Coyotes fructose. and badgers are both common predators Sucrose. in much of North America. But rather than fight for food, are the two have been known to work together as hunting binding. partners. You see, badgers generally Starts hunt ground gene. squirrels underground. They put the dead ends period. in their tunnels, then the scare them into that trap and dig them out. Sounds terrible. Mm. They are not friends. Not friends. Coyotes hunt these squirrels above ground by waiting until they venture far enough from their tunnels to pounce. And because their styles are so different, if these two predators team up, 
they can both benefit. When squirrels detect a badger, they often run above the ground to escape right to where the coyotes are waiting. And when squirrels detect the coyote, they usually retreat to their tunnels, putting them right where the badger wants them. A 1992 study mm -hmm. found that when working together, coyotes captured 34% more squirrels than working alone. And while it's harder to count the prey badgers catch when they're in the dirt, badgers that work with coyotes spend more time underground. Biologists figure that's because they're hunting more Is major biochemistry? More no, way, I was an English and creative Both of these species major, are pretty but smart I'm starting and social an educational and live YouTube channel long lives. About so it's not too surprising that they're able to form this kind of relationship. But scientists don't see this these an MCAT everywhere. Book, they seem to occur more an often MCAT where no there are more coyotes and I'm badgers. pretending like I'm going to med school. Because there are a ton of them around, it's they're fun. bound to run into each other. And that means there's more opportunity for an accidental assist to lead to a it's lack of competition. They also seem to happen in areas where there's a lot of dense, small bushes. Festival These make it harder for both hunters to succeed solo, so the benefits of teaming up are all that more appealing. Energy Not release. just predators that work together, though. Right, Prey species safe. can also team up for extra protection. One of the most well-studied mutualisms is one Good that occurs energy. between snapping shrimps and gobies, Antibodies? a kind yes. of small fish. Uh -huh. Dozens of species of these animals pair up. The shrimp is really good at digging, so it digs and maintains a burrow for both You're of them. Famous seven the years Gobi, ago. meanwhile, has better long-distance eyesight, so it watches Most people predators. are watching Michael's In many pairings, right the two communicate through touch. How's Michael streaming? The shrimp taps oh, the it's because it's with late its night. To late night, it sleepy time. There, and the Gobi flicks this its is what tail to tell the shrimp the really it's late. brewing. Some species in this setup are <laughs> obligate partners, meaning they literally don't make it if they don't have their brother from another mother, or like, I guess, phylum from them. another phylum. That's Even the when the partnership is optional, though, biologists Kick. found that what if you Kick? take away a shrimp's fish buddy, it eats less, presumably because it's more Energy worried about being vulnerable while foraging. Grounded. And in studies, gobies that That's don't care with shrimps um, tend to disappear without their like well-maintained panic room. The skitty. Of course, it's not always a single shrimp hate. fish pair. Both the shrimps and the gobies uh -huh. will live with their mates, too, bringing the twosome to a foursome or even a fivesome, matrix. since the shrimps frequently form thruples instead of couples. Like this partnership makes a lot of sense from an evolutionary perspective. Mm -hmm. Gobies are generally fond of hiding so places, so it seems like they no. dart into what a shrimp cake? burrow on occasion. <laughs> and the shrimps probably wouldn't mind that if having a goby roommate like, meant I know it doesn't matter to me, to I'm pretty sure. But then over time, selection favored individuals that formed partnerships, and the species yes, began something to about concentration of reactions. It's chemistry nonsense. Important. Some scientists think they're seeing this happen in okay. real time. They found species okay. of shrimps and gobies that are doing their individual Energy jobs release. together, Grounding. but without the edge. specific communication system. Edge. So basically, it well, it's the no, beginning no, no. of okay. what is expected to be a beautiful friendship. Sometimes, though, da, 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 da. a burrow isn't cozy enough. Sometimes what you really need is a turtle kind of butt. Chain. Take it from oceanic crabs. They have been known to make a home on the butts of sea turtles, specifically Brothel. the little area between the this tail be, like, and the upper shell. See, the crabs can't swim Brothel. very far, so they live on anything that floats, but they prefer <laughs> places does mean where they can hide, which makes <laughs> turtle butts the obvious choice. It's a good home, too. The crabs on turtles tend to be big and healthy, suggesting they get plenty of food. They're also more likely to be monogamous, That's since there's room for two and only two. Like the isol, females are opal. more likely to be brooding eggs, uh -huh. a clear sign to biologists that turtle butt is awesome the habitat. For a while, it hydrogen? wasn't clear what, if anything, the turtles know. got out of having Low these rear-end residents. Scientists <laughs> used to think that the Low crabs ate the turtles' Not poop, hikey. which would have made this a strictly one-sided relationship. But studies of the crab's stomach contents revealed I that they actually feed like on barnacles and other organisms that attach to turtles. Since these can damage the turtles' shells and make it harder to swim, the crabs provide a valuable Minimum cleaning energy service. To an They're like live-in maids on your okay. butt. Some rove beetles live in the fur of small South African mammals, Activity. especially rodents. At Dude, first, scientists thought these one. beetles were parasites, oh, though that would have made equation. them the world's <laughs> only <laughs> blood-sucking beetles. But back in the 1980s, a pair of biologists questioned this idea. The mice didn't seem to care that the beetles were there, which is weird Wait, because these are not small beetles. They're about a centimeter long on a roughly 15 centimeter long mouse. The beetles um, could even walk across the their electron. faces okay. and the rodents didn't Let's do anything look. about it. But when the scientists Let's placed look. these beetles on another mouse species, Exothermal. things were totally different. The mice energy. immediately scratched them off and killed them. A closer look revealed that the beetles don't feed on the mammals directly, 
They eat the fleas and ticks okay. that do. So they get a nice cozy place to live and all the bugs they can eat. And it turns okay. out the beetles only Low attach to the mammals fur at affinity. night when they're active. During the day, they just hang it's out like in kilometers? the nest. That is most likely how this mutualism started. The beetles oh stumbled upon the feast what of is, parasites in the mammal's nest and decided to stick around. At some point, they got so friendly with their furry roommates that they started hitching rides. That way, they wouldn't miss a meal Crystal if the structure. animal decided to spend the day somewhere else. Some small mammals have several nests. Others don't have a formal nest and just curl up wherever they structures? fit. So sticking with the source okay. of their meal mm -hmm. is kind of important. And intrigatingly, this but beetle mammal pairing seems to happen Blanker. on other continents too. Energy there are a couple of species of road beetles in Australia yes. that sometimes hang out on rafts one thing from physics. there. So far we've mostly Still covered one. partnerships between species Oxidine that wouldn't otherwise bother each other. Oxygen. But predators Cyanide. and their prey can team up too. Look no further than frogs and tarantulas. Large spiders are opportunistic hunters that often eat frogs, but several species have learned membranes. to shack up Remember, with their potential food. The spiders let Everything. the frogs live in their burrows undisturbed, even Actually, though they still I had to memorize eat other frogs. They're somehow able to tell frog species Do I need apart. To and those? scientists think this recognition is chemical. Mm -hmm. You see, when spiders Only grab a potential I meal, first they taste point. it with chemical That's sensors. And researchers have actually taken the skin from a spider's Brilliant. partner frog species and glued it onto it. another frog that the spiders mm, usually eat. Lo and behold, when a spider yeah, grabs like a frog wearing one of these skins, that, like, it lets it go. Like, you you have no quarrel with me, little like frog. You are wearing the skin of my friend. The frogs clearly the benefit from this partnership because, like, they're not eaten everything. by the spider I'm and they get a the safe place trip. to hang out. In return, scientists I'll think the frogs this. eat ants and other tiny insects that would otherwise I attack the spider's moles either. eggs. It's not entirely clear how these particular frogs got so lucky, but the species involved mm. may be generally toxic or otherwise unpalatable to spiders. So it's possible that spiders don't really oh, want okay. to eat them in the first place, though how they learned to just let them chill in their burrow is still a mystery. Speaking of tiny bugs that like the to Lewis eat pigs. eggs, mites are usually considered I'm pests, but oh, if you're laying oh eggs in a popular egg-laying area, it's it's good to have them beetle. on your side, which is why some carrion beetles have struck a deal with them. As their okay. name implies, carrion Not beetles eat dead things, and they, they lay their moment. eggs in them too. Well, them and every other fly and beetle uh, in the vicinity. So to get a leg up on the competition, the carrion beetles let the yes. mites ride around on uh, them. The mites eat up all the other eggs Harvey and larvae they magnet. can find, leaving the beetles with the perfect nursery for a their dive eggs. Ball? In return, the mites a get a free ball? ride to food supplies they couldn't otherwise yeah, reach. Googling. It's so beneficial for the beetles and the mites alike thing that with the it book was that I was looking for things specifically that like, I wanted to know. The mites reproduce in the same brood like, chamber is? as the beetles, so the mites babies can attach to the beetle babies from day yeah, one. Them. But it's a delicate partnership. You see, if there are too many mites, they tend to start eating the beetle's eggs too, reducing Egg the brood's chance charges. of survival. Too few mites, or no mites at all, doesn't immediately harm the beetles, so you'd oh, think okay. that they'd err on the side of caution. But without the mites, critters other critters like passage. worms called nematodes reproduce unchecked, and the beetles end up carrying them along with them to each brood site. Those not-so-nice hitchhikers odd. can harm the beetles' young, That's either correct. directly or by competing with them. So without mites, every subsequent Black brood is a little less successful. Fewer survive, Black and those that do are smaller. So ultimately, it's in both the mites and the beetles' best interest to team up. Sunfish are the world's heaviest bony lactose fish. And glucose. They also have another ah. claim to fame. They've been known to host that definitely more than lactose. 40 different They're parasite sugar and milk, species. Guys. No one likes having They're parasites, but in the open ocean, there aren't any like cleaner fish stations to stop at. So these oceanic fish. travelers head to the surface and follow flocks of seabirds instead. Birds have no problem lending a beak They're once they get a snack though. in the process, mm -hmm. but it's not exactly easy for them to spot a fish that's the underwater, myelin. even one as big as a sun. Fish. So the sunfish angle their huge bodies sideways at the surface and just sit there, patiently waiting it for the birds to pluck off worms I think or other that's, parasites. That might have been with the PNS. Skin. People used to think that this cleaning behavior be, happened by accident. Wrong, sunfish spend a lot of time in deep, cold it's water, the so they thought this surface behavior was just them like basking They're in the sun so to weird. warm up. But scientists have found this idea questionable since there's no relationship between how long like, the fish spend a Pokemon, in the water a and how long they spend basking. It makes a lot more sense if the basking is for parasite removal specifically. These worms can cause serious Freeze. damage, oh, 
so it's in the sunfish's best shop. interest to get them off. Perhaps the cutest like pairing that. in the animal like kingdom that. is the one between common warthogs um, and banded mongooses. Not meerkat, mongoose. It's not quite Timon and Pumbaa. We got real close, but it's not. See, Four mongooses eggs. clean ticks and parasites off of the warthogs. If a group of warthogs runs into a band of mongooses, they signal their interest in spa services by lying down. Uh, then the mongooses approach and give them a full body anti-parasite treatment. The warthogs get clean, the mongooses the get a snack. And as the 2016 article awesome. of Suiform Soundings okay. describing the behavior notes, it's only one of a few known cases of a mammal cleaning another mammal species. And one other thing that stands out, it Over. only seems Two to happen in an areas with a good number of people, Either. too, which might explain how the friendship is formed. Two, uh, you see, something similar happens with Kawadis, a small South American raccoon relative that looks surprisingly like a mongoose, Blanks and tapers, an Would animal do. that is not all that different from a warthog. Both I'm mongooses sorry. and kawadis <laughs> like, spend a lot of time around <laughs> human settlements scrounging for food. And since garbage dumps are popular areas for wildlife, these animals end up spending a lot Fractional of time selection. around other species. Biologists think that they spend so Take much time eating next to other species that eventually they got comfortable enough to start Inkwon. picking food right off of them. As these eight partnerships show, not every species is out only for themselves. Whether it's for food, protection, or a little healthy Deep grooming, a lot of animals have figured out that life can be a little bit easier when you have exactly. a little help. After mean? all, when you're trying to survive in the wild, you need every friend you can get. Thanks At for some watching point, this episode actually of take, like, If you think these the animal friendships are pretty mean, you'll probably love our episode on well symbiotic bacteria. And to stay up to date with all of our like episodes, actually be sure to click on that subscribe button. It's important to me. But I, I do well in my fake med school endeavors. Just like how I plan to eventually take a, an LSAT. Like, I'll take all the practice LSATs. I just want to know that I could pass the bar exam, because one day I might be a lawyer. I don't know. I, I follow med school vloggers, graphic designer vloggers, and lawyer vloggers, because, you know, I mess around sometimes. Decided to take new career paths. Fine. I'll Oh. Damn it. Okay, I need to understand what happened with these shade balls earlier. I just know that Derek was trying to take all these out of his pool. Oh, oh, oh. I'm in! <laughs> I'm floating in shade balls! <laughs> this feels incredible! Cause like, I can hardly tell there's water under me. It feels like just being in a ball pit. <laughs> but it's kind of like quicksand! <laughs> oh no! That's how we lost it. I feel Eric. like this is the <laughs> internet's fault uh, because I made this video about the shade balls Playing. on LA Reservoir Something and a lot of people asked, can you swim in shade balls? And I'm like, it's a drinking reservoir. Obviously you can't swim in the drinking water. But then I thought, Something. you know what? We know the people who actually made these shade balls. And so You're I could call them up and this. order them. And, and sure enough, I purchased 10,000 shade balls to try to swim in. Now. There is a scientific and the safe way to test this, I'll definitely do go in the shallow on. end, but I'm going to do the YouTube sure. way, which is to jump in the is deep there end a section? and just see if I can swim. I have all the words, but are they in here? No. Not sure where they are. They're here somewhere. Oh, it was probably right about now yeah. that I thought back to my well, conversation with the shade ball, ball manufacturer. Right so, oh. You don't recommend swimming in shade balls. No. So do you think it's a bit dangerous, maybe? Dangerous. So dangerous, in fact, that he regularly refuses requests from residential customers. They didn't even want to sell me shade balls. I appreciate you making an exception for our channel and for science, and we will not promote this as a thing that people should do. We will show people what it, what happens, and therefore that they should probably not do it. What makes system. shade balls inherently more dangerous than other plastic balls is that they're half full of water, well, so they're okay. heavy. This bag of 1,200 shade balls weighs 300 kilograms, or 660 pounds. Yeah. So when I ordered uh, 10,000 of these things, I didn't really think about how hard it would be to get them home. Yeah, now we have them oh all God, in the back yeah. of the U-Haul. Now the only challenge is getting them out. After and driving the largest vehicle I've ever attempted across LA, I hired a moving company. And a system signaling. And that's whatever the heck that is. There's that one. It's time to release the balls. Absolute record period. Go. A mark. 
I died 184 times in Trapper 4 Celeste. So does that mean that you made it through them? Did you do it? Did you do it? They just kept putting all these balls in. I'm kind of surprised. 6,000 shape balls doesn't quite cover the whole pool, but it's, it's just about there. And you can see already the balls have sort of arranged themselves in crystal structures where they're close packed and then there's some boundaries between these grains. We basically got a single layer of balls on the whole pool. Could be. I'm going to jump in and try to swim with them. Oh no. We'll see how that works. Unimportant and if I can do that, then we have uh, three binding sites of our 600 side. more a that we can put on top. Cipher, Which brings us back to RNA. Two. One. Eight strawberries on the way up. What does eight strawberries mean in Celeste? Alright, I'm swimming. <laughs> so this is breaststroke. Virtual and oh, and, this uh, was something that asked me about earlier. I can swim, but I am getting uh, yeah. a lot of balls in the face. <laughs> I get a distance. Oh, a few observations. There's For objects whose purpose okay. is to block out sunlight, a surprising amount still gets through. That's because even packed as tightly as possible, spheres only cover about 91% of the water surface. Light coming through the cracks and reflecting off the balls makes these really interesting patterns on the bottom of the pool. That's pretty cool. When swimming through shade balls, the other thing that hits you is the noise. They make so much noise so close to your head that it's virtually impossible to hear anything else. I feel like you're getting an extra workout, frankly. I'm going to try a different swim stroke. I'm going to go over to uh, front crawl or freestyle. Oh. Oh. Options of cold, I feel like that I got my own <laughs> Concentration, equivalent. Okay. I feel like I'm getting knocked around like in a rock tumbler. Our Swimming in shade balls made me reflect on Here's drag, sandwich. the force that opposes motion when moving okay. through a fluid. Drag is typically proportional to your velocity we'll squared. See, R, R. Why is down. that? Well, let's imagine Oxygen. these shade balls Urban as particles of their bond. own fluid. Two and the faster you go, the, the more of them you encounter time. per second. But also, the faster they're moving relative to you, and hence the Video impact acting. they have on you okay. as you push them out of the way. So okay. that's why drag is proportional to v squared, because you run into more of them, Medicaid. and they're moving faster relative to you, so they have a greater impact. Swimming is a good workout. Swimming is shaped balls. Next level. Okay. Next level. Yes. So I'm not actually the best swimmer, right so I brought over some friends, uh, Christian and Jordan. Alright, let's try it. Three, two, one. Butterfly is even more challenging because not only do you have to push the balls forward, they also get pushed down and up and out. How was it? That's Insane! It looks hard. You get hit in your face and your shoulders. So, with it clear that you can swim, things. albeit with difficulty, in a single what? layer of shade balls, it was time to test if you can swim so in multi layer shade, shade balls. So, poetic stem cells. Red bone marrow. You know this? Am I welcome here, Ken? <laughs> no. Uh, you're welcome here, Ian. I don't know what we have to offer. <laughs> this is, in fact, how most of LA Reservoir is covered. Fine. <laughs> Concentration. It looks as though you could, like, float on the top. So I'm going to see if I can, like, run across these shape balls. It's going to end Typical poorly, pathway sure. for moving. Three, no. two, one. Created waste transportation. Oh, that's what that was. <laughs> Similar attempts to slide across the surface of the shade balls were also doomed to failure. 
strong acid. If each ball is base. almost half full of water. So when fully submerged, it only supports Baseball. around 300 okay. grams. Oh, that that means saying. to support my body entirely above the water, I'd need that? more than 260 that? shade balls trapped <laughs> under me. Okay. This is amazing. We're holding it. <laughs> <laughs> what have you guys let go? You right, let, do three, it two, one. Oh! I'm still, I'm still floating. Yeah! <laughs> but what about the central question? Can you swim in multiple layers of shade balls? Not getting very far. I don't think you can swim in shade balls. I found a kind of unorthodox style, swimming mostly beneath the shade balls. <laughs> A valent bond characteristic. Air electrons have a lower melting. It's like the guy in the boat said. What? You boat? just don't move. I was, I was swimming, swimming as hard as I could, and I just Sharing couldn't like go anywhere. Took it. But don't just take my word for it. Watch Jordan right. try yeah, butterflies. That makes sense. We're conductors. Amazing. <laughs> Unlike in the single layer where the balls could easily move past Something each other, molarity. with multiple layers, the balls kind of get trapped against each other and act more like a solid, providing significantly more resistance. Uh, so oh, I wanted to see oh, if I could use this to my advantage. I'm going to lower myself out. gently down with the hose. I don't know. <laughs> and see if I can float on top like what of potential all these, surface. Uh, these shade balls. Oh, that thing. All right, Something about go. a voltage. MF sign. Wild Atkins? What is a wild oh, oh, oh. What the heck? I'm in! <laughs> I'm floating in shade balls! Force oh, this feels gravity. incredible! Projectile? Like, I okay. can hardly tell rings. there's water under me. It feels like just being in a ball pit. <laughs> yes. But it's kind of like quicksand! Opposite oh, of no. changing gravity. This is the EMF sign. Oh, that I is exactly buttons. like quicksand! I remember. Oh my goodness! If you don't move, you're good on the surface, but then if you start moving around, all the balls get enough energy to sort of shift, wow. and then you start sinking down deeper and deeper and deeper. Now, after all this, the one question I'm left with is what do you do with 10,000 uh, shade balls? Well, I've decided uh -huh. that I am going to sign Twilight each one films. and Our mail it out to a things. Patreon supporter. So if you want to receive them. one of these balls signed by me, Go and sign up to be a Patreon supporter. Now, I my plan is to send these out to basically every Patreon supporter I have everywhere in the world. I'll put more details in the description below. Obviously, the shipping costs are going to be horrendous, but it is your support on Patreon that allows me to do things like this. So Ooh, this is my way video. of saying the most radioactive place on earth. That was good. That was good. It's timely. Chernobyl show. Negative. The onions? That's why I always remember them. Oh. Yeah, not deep. Uh, it's overloaded. Radiation is away. frightening. At least certain types of it are. I mean, my Geiger counter doesn't go off near my mobile phone or the Wi Fi router or my microwave. That's because a Geiger counter only carbonyl? measures ionizing okay. radiation. Oh. That is radiation with enough energy to rip electrons off atoms. And it's measured in units called sieverts. If you're exposed to more than two sieverts all at once, you'll probably die okay. shortly after that. But we're exposed to low levels of ionizing radiation all the time. Bananas, for example, are That's rich in potassium, and, and some of that potassium okay. is naturally radioactive. So when you eat a banana, you're actually exposed to about 0.1 microsieverts of radiation. That's one ten millionth of a sievert. Okay. Let's use a banana for scale of radiation doses. You know, since people eat bananas, we become radioactive too. So you're actually exposed to more Which radiation becomes if you sleep an anus. next to oh someone God. than if you sleep alone. The visceral But chloride. I wouldn't worry about that because that dose is Bryosos. insignificant compared to the natural background radiation of Earth. Mm. I mean, there's ionizing mean? radiation coming out of the soil and the, the rocks and the air and even from space. 
the level of radiation here in Sydney is about 0.15 microsieverts per hour. And that's about mm -hmm. average globally. The level's usually between 0.1 and 0.2 microsieverts mm -hmm. per hour. But there are places yeah. with significantly higher levels. So who on earth do you think receives the maximum dose of ionizing radiation? Deuter Let's answer that Deuter question by going to the most radioactive places on yeah. earth. Stop. Some places you'd expect Deuter to have high levels of radiation might surprise you. I'm in Hiroshima and right. that is the Peace Dome. It was about 600 meters above that bombs. dome where the world's first nuclear bomb was detonated over a city. It was detonated there to have maximum destructive impact. But the level of radiation today, show. almost 70 years later, is only 0.3 microsieverts per hour. I'm about to get into uh, an elevator. We're going down to the mine shaft. This is an old uh, uranium mine. This is the mine where uranium was discovered. <laughs> These videos are interesting. I like edutainment. It's also the place where Marie Curie obtained her raw material. 1.7 microsieverts per hour. Is this what it's about 10 times the natural background like that you would have. Documentary on PBS a while Nowadays, back. most of the uranium has been removed. Yeah, but I'm filming a wall, documentary for TV about uranium. Piece, and you can see under this. UV light, it fluoresces. Look at that. Fluorescent Western. uranium ore. Which of these become This famous? is the lab <laughs> of Marie Curie. The antibody she won two Nobel Prizes, one in physics yeah. and one in chemistry. And uh, she conducted a lot of her work here. And this is her office. Nope. She would have sat right there. Apparently, there are only a few parts of this area which okay. are still radioactive. Uterus stone. One Become is this doorknob. Mm -hmm. Well, it climbs not that much, but... But it's cells. like 10 times the background? Yes. More than 10. And another is the back of her chair. You can still detect alpha particles coming off this spot oh right here. Apparently, after she was working in the lab, she would come, open the door, leaving traces of the radium only here, species. and then okay. go and but pull I'm out her chair. Decent Welcome to, to New Mexico. This is the Trinity bomb test site where the world's first nuclear bomb was set off. Right here, Slow right in this spot. Parietal cells? This whole area was vaporized. In fact, there was so much heat liberated by that HCL. bomb that it fused all right, of the desert stuff. sand okay. into this green glass. Okay, that one's and you can roll. still find it here. They've actually named this mineral after what the is test. The pleura? It's called I'm Trinitite. assuming that was the one that's adjacent to cells now. Yeah. This is the only place on Earth that this has ever been made. The level of radiation here is about 0.8 microsieverts an hour. The trinitite itself is a little bit more oh. radioactive. I've got readings of two or three microsieverts an hour off them. Now, which place has higher levels of radiation than anywhere we've seen so far? The answer is an airplane. You know, as you gain That's altitude, easy. there's less atmosphere above you to shield you from cosmic rays. Affinity so the level of radiation time. inside the plane can go up to 0.5 microsieverts per hour at 18,000 feet up to one microsievert per hour at 23,000 okay. feet, over two Never microsieverts per hour at 33,000 feet, and over three microsieverts per hour at even higher altitudes and towards the poles. That is Chernobyl nuclear reactor number four. It melted down on April 26, 1986. So what happened was so much heat was mm -hmm. generated inside this that reactor insane. that it basically no, blew the top I off, spreading Blue radioactive us. isotopes throughout this whole surrounding yes. area and over into Europe. This and that is why we can still meat. detect the contamination here today. Now right now it's reading around five microsieverts an hour. If I stayed here for one hour, Doodle. my body would receive a similar dose Doodle. to what you'd receive when you get a dental x-ray. So oh, this is not still. a huge amount of radiation. Oh. And one of the oh, reasons Coxie. why the radiation the level is oh. not too high oh, is because they actually removed a couple oh. meters worth of topsoil from this whole area, and then they dumped it somewhere. That's why we can stand here. We're uh, driving into the Fukushima exclusion zone now. I'm just 
just watching as the levels on my Geiger counter go up as we approach the zone. Need to know this. See those black bags at the side of the road? The Japanese are doing now exactly what the people in Chernobyl did, collecting up meters and meters of topsoil. So all that toxic topsoil that has all the radioactive stuff in it. In Handmaid's Tale, they have like the colonies that are like really toxic, where they send all like the people who've like misbehaved. Do you think that's the where they put it? Probably overkill. It's like it's some just like radioactive to stop radioactive ground. dust from getting into my so lungs. They make them work. This is definitely one of the most radioactive places where I've been. Even though the release of radioactive material was less than Chernobyl, only about ten percent. Because it's much fresher, only three years since the accident, much less of it has decayed. So I've been getting readings up around five to ten microsieverts an hour. And uh, I think we won't be staying here for too long because of that. I'm about to go into the hospital at Pripyat. And this is where the firemen were taken after they fought the fires at the Chernobyl reactor. And in the basement of this building, they have left all of the firemen's clothing. Once they realized it was so contaminated, they, they chucked it down there. Miami. That here? So as you can see, there's a huge pile One of that gear there. Right outside the door, I'm getting 500 microsieverts an hour just outside the door. 1,500 microsieverts an hour. You know, if we stayed here for a couple hours, we'd receive our annual dose of background radiation. Yeah. Overloaded. <laughs> that basement was the most radioactive place I visited, and it's one of the most Let's radioactive places on Earth. If I'd stayed down there for one hour, I would have received 2,000 microsieverts. Urge. That's a year's worth of natural background radiation. Yes. Every yellow Probably pixel here d represents okay. a banana. Now that might seem like a lot, but consider that in a CT scan, the patient receives about 7,000 microsieverts. That's three years worth of natural Ooh. background radiation. It's been estimated that the people living around Fukushima will receive an additional 10,000 microsieverts over their lifetime due to the nuclear power disaster. For comparison, U.S. radiation workers are limited to a maximum of 50,000 microsieverts per year. But that's less than another occupation, astronaut. An astronaut on the space station for six months will receive about 80,000 microsieverts worth of radiation. But not even they are exposed to the highest levels of ionizing radiation. So can you guess who is? The answer is a smoker's lungs. A smoker's lungs on average receive 160,000 microsieverts worth of radiation every year. That's due to the radioactive polonium and radioactive lead in the tobacco that they're smoking. So not only are they exposed to carcinogens and toxins, they also receive very high levels of radiation. So it's not the people of Fukushima or Chernobyl or radiation workers or even astronauts who receive the highest doses yeah, that explains of ionizing lung radiation. Cancer, though. <laughs> that honor goes to your ordinary average smoker. Hey, as you can see, over the last few months, I've been traveling around the world, actually filming a documentary for television. It should be on in the middle of next year. But being in places like Chernobyl and Fukushima reminded me of this book, The Day of the Tripids. It's about a post-apocalyptic world in which plants take over. I know it sounds like a crazy idea, but it's actually a brilliant book, so you should really check it out if you're looking for something to do over the holidays. Now, you can download this book for free by going to audible.com slash veritasium, or you can pick any other book of your choosing. Actually, I haven't seen this Kurtz Kazal video. <laughs> Many of our viewers have asked us a very serious question. What if we made a big pile of bombs and exploded every nuclear weapon in the world all at once? Strangely enough, we couldn't find a good source to answer this question to our satisfaction. So, we gathered together a few scientists to calculate what would happen and find an answer to this extremely important scientific problem once and for all. Currently, there are 15,000 nuclear weapons on Earth. 
The US and Russia both have around 7,000, while France, China, the UK, the Pakistan, India, style, Israel, and North Korea own around okay. 1,000 between them. But how much destructive power is this really? Let's try to put these numbers into perspective. On Earth, there are about 4,500 cities or urban areas with at least 100,000 inhabitants. Some are bigger than others, so we'll assume that on average we need three nuclear bombs to completely wipe out one city. This means we could destroy every single city on planet Earth with our nuclear arsenal, killing more than 3 billion people, roughly half of humanity, in an instant. And we'd still have 1,500 nuclear weapons left. Now that's what an expert would call overkill. So we can say with confidence that we have a lot of nuclear weapons and they can do a lot of damage. But what if we make a huge pile of all 15,000 bombs and pull the trigger? Let's drop our nuclear pile in the middle of the Amazon rainforest, just to show nature who's boss. Our warheads, piled haphazardly, fit into a small warehouse. A typical US warhead has the power of 200,000 tons of TNT. So 15,000 warheads would be the equivalent of 3 billion tons of TNT. For scale, this is enough to rebuild the whole island of Manhattan with every building and skyscraper using stacks of TNT. The closest thing we can compare to the energy gathered here is a volcano. One of the deadliest volcanic eruptions in recorded history took place in 1883 on the island of Krakatoa. The eruption was so powerful that 70% of the island and the surrounding archipelago was destroyed, killing tens of thousands of people. Its effects were felt around the world for days after the event. Our nuclear pile contains 15 times the energy of the Krakatoa volcanic eruption. So let's finally push the button. Three, two, one. In a second, a fireball 50 kilometers across vaporizes everything in its way and creates a blast wave that flattens 3,000 square kilometers of forest. Every living thing within 250 kilometers will start to burn. The explosion will be heard literally around the world as the pressure wave circles the Earth tens of times over the next few weeks. Millions of tons yeah. of incinerated material are catapulted into the atmosphere. The mushroom cloud reaches the outer reaches of the stratosphere, pushing up against space itself. After things have calmed down, a small crater, about 10 kilometers across, is left in the center of the worst wildfires the planet has seen in millennia, spreading throughout South America, burning down forests and cities alike. And now, the unpleasant part begins. Extremely radioactive material will kill living things very quickly, and a large area several kilometers around the crater is now uninhabitable, as is everywhere for hundreds of kilometers downwind. Much of the fallout is carried high into the atmosphere by the mushroom cloud and carried around the planet. The amount of radioactive material in the environment doubles worldwide, which still isn't civilization ending, but we may see more cancer for a while. A portion of the particles will flow to the edge of space for years and cause a nuclear winter that could lower global temperatures by a few degrees for a few years. This explosion was pretty bad if you're in South America and especially Brazil. The Amazon rainforest is pretty much history, which is not great. But human life will go on. Okay, but what if we explode more nuclear weapons? Let's suppose humanity decided to mine every bit of uranium on Earth and build as many nuclear Jesus. bombs as possible. At current usage, it's estimated that there are around 35 million tons of uranium in Earth's crust, enough to power human civilization for over 2,000 years, or to build millions of nuclear warheads. For the sake of argument, let's say we create a pile with a yield of 10 billion Hiroshima bombs, which makes up a cube three kilometers high that contains roughly the energy of the asteroid yes. impact that ended the age of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Except it's also nuclear. Three. Two, one. Uh, Our pile explodes in a fireball stretching so high into the sky that it's visible from half of South America, with so much power that the ground just splashes like water, forming a crater 100 kilometers across. Bedrock on the scale of whole mountain ranges is vaporized in an instant, <laughs> while thousands of tons of material is catapulted wow. away with such speed that it's ejected into space. Some leaves Earth forever, while most of it comes raining down as hot, burning debris that heats up the atmosphere to oven-like temperatures, killing most big animals and causing firestorms all over the world. 
The Earth's crust rings like a bell, struck by global earthquakes stronger than anything in recorded history, decimating cities around the world, while hurricane-force winds flatten every single tree in South America and wildfires consume the continent. The abundance of hydrocarbons in the Amazon burned to form ash are cast into the atmosphere, darting the sky and keeping sunlight from reaching the surface, dropping temperatures to near freezing worldwide. The ensuing global winter may last for decades and results in the extinction of every large animal species, humans included. We could also mention that every corner of the planet is covered with radioactive fallout, but at this point, it doesn't matter that much anymore. This is humanity's extinction event. The astronauts aboard the International Space Station get to enjoy a great view for a while, but it's not unlikely that the spray of rocks blast into orbit will destroy the station. Those lucky enough to be in bunkers or in submarines deep below the ocean surface may survive the longest before they exhaust their food supplies and have to venture out for more. They'll find the world a charred, freezing, radioactive wasteland. The planet itself doesn't the care at all. Series. After just a few million years, the wounds of the explosions have healed and life is thriving, arguably even more so than when humans were around. If intelligent life emerges again, it might be able to work out what happened. When they study geology, they'll find a bizarre and very thin layer of rock covering the entire world, enriched in radioactive elements like uranium and the other nasty things it decays to, mixed with rare earth metals and plastics that humans used. They would probably be very, very confused. <laughs> Videos like this one take well over 1,200 hours to finish. Over the years, we put more and more effort into research, conversations with experts, illustration so and animation, sound design and fact-checking. For this video, we put a lot of extra work into our sources document. You can read how we got to the information in the video, what our experts thought about it, <laughs> where they disagreed with each other. Okay. We can take the time to do this because of you, our viewers because you watch and share our videos, buy our posters oh and support us on patreon.com. If you like what we're doing, please consider becoming a patron or get one of the nice things we Definitely made with stop love. Three minutes. Thank you for watching. Black. Building a more space. Idea. Let's do it's me. Imagine NASA announced today that they found aliens. Bacteria on Mars, weird alien fish in the oceans of Europa, and also ancient Alkaline alien metal. ruins on Alkaline. Titan. Alkaline. Wouldn't that be great? Well, no. It would be horrible news. Devastating, even. It could mean that the end of yeah, humanity cool. is almost certain, <laughs> and that it might be coming soon. Why? Why would the most exciting discovery of our lifetime be bad? Let us imagine the development of life from its inception to us today as a flight of stairs. The first step is dead chemistry that needs to assemble itself into self-replicating patterns, stable and resilient, but also able to change and evolve. The second step is for our early life to become more complex, able to build more complicated structures Look and use the available out. energy much more efficiently. On the next step, these cells combine to become multicellular beings, enabling unbelievable variety and further complexity. The step above sees the species evolve big brains, enabling the use of tools, culture and shared knowledge, which creates even higher complexity. The species can now become the dominant life form on its planet and change it according to its needs. First, shy attempts to leave its planet are happening. This is where we are now. It's in the nature of life as we know it to reach out, to cover every niche it can. And since planets have a limited carrying capacity and lifespan, if a species wants to survive, it will look for more places to spread to. So the steps above the current ones seem logical colonize your own solar system, then spread further to reach other stars, to the possible final step, becoming a galaxy-wide civilization. It's very likely that this is a universal principle for civilizations, no matter where they're from.
If a species is competitive and driven enough to take control over its planet, they'll probably not stop there. We know that there are up to 500 billion planets in the Milky Way, at least 10 billion Earth-like planets. Many have been around billions that, of like, years no long enough. Many, like, but we're observing zero system, galactic civilizations. Not the solar system, the we universe, should be able to see there's something, no bacteria on but there's Earth. nothing. Like, well, not Space organism. seems to be empty and dead. This means something is preventing living things from climbing the staircase beyond the step we're on right now. Something that makes becoming a galactic civilization extremely hard, maybe impossible. Okay, this is the Great stuff. Filter, a challenge or danger yeah. so oh, hard to overcome okay. that it eliminates almost Actually, every species that encounters it. There are two scenarios. One means we are incredibly special and lucky, the other one means we are doomed and practically already dead. It depends on where the filter is on our staircase. Behind or ahead of us. Scenario okay. one, the filter is behind us. We are the first. If the filter is behind us, that means that one of the steps we passed is almost impossible to take. Which step could it be? Is life itself extremely rare? It's very hard to make predictions about how likely it is for life to emerge from dead things. There is no consensus. Some scientists think it develops everywhere where the conditions are right. Others think that Earth might be the only living place in the universe. Another Everybody candidate cares. is the step of complex animal cells. A very specific thing happened on this step, and as far as we know, it happened exactly once. A primitive hunter cell swallowed another cell. But instead of devouring it, the two cells formed a union. The bigger cell provided shelter, took care of interacting with the environment and providing resources, while the smaller one used its new home and free stuff to focus on providing a lot of extra energy for its host. With the abundant energy, the abundant. host cell could grow more than before and build new and expensive things to improve itself, while the guest became the powerhouse of the cell. These cells make up every animal on the planet. Maybe there are billions of bacteria-covered planets in the Milky Way, but not a single one Says. apart from us has okay. achieved our level of complexity. Or intelligence. We humans feel very smart and sophisticated with our crossword puzzles and romantic novels, but a big brain is, first and foremost, a very expensive evolutionary investment. They are fragile. They don't help in a fist fight with a bear. They cost enormous amounts of energy. Oh. And Bro, despite so them, it name. took modern humans 200,000 years to get from sharp sticks to civilization. Being yeah, smart does not mean you get to win automatically. Maybe intelligence is just not so great, and we're lucky that it worked out for us. Scenario 2. The filter is ahead of us. Plenty of others died already. A great filter before us Ooh. is orders of magnitude more dangerous than okay. anything we encountered so far. Even if a major disaster killed most of us or threw us back thousands of years, we would survive and recover. And if we can recover, even if it takes a million years, then it's not a great filter, but just a roadblock to an eventual galactic civilization. On universal timescales, even millions of years are just the blink of an eye. If a great filter really lies before us, it has to be so dangerous, so purely devastating and powerful, that it has destroyed most, if not all, advanced civilizations in our galaxy over billions of years. A really daunting and depressing hypothesis is that once a species takes control over its planet, it's already on the path to self-destruction. Technology is a good way to achieve that. It needs to be something that's so obvious that virtually everybody discovers it, and so dangerous that its discovery leads almost universally to an existential disaster. <laughs> a large-scale nuclear like war. Nanotechnology that gets out of control. Genetic engineering of the perfect superbug. An experiment that lights the whole atmosphere on fire. It might be a super-intelligent AI that accidentally or purposely destroys its creators or things that we can't even see coming right now. Or it's way simpler. Species competitive enough to take over their planet necessarily destroy it while competing with each other for resources. Maybe there are runaway chain reactions in every ecosystem that once set in motion are not fixable. 
And so once a civilization is powerful enough to change the composition of its atmosphere, they make their planet uninhabitable 100% of the time. Let's hope that that's not the case. If the filter is ahead of us, our odds are really bad. What we can hope for. This is why finding life beyond Earth would be horrible. The more common life is in the universe, and the more advanced and complex it is, the more likely it becomes that a filter is in front of us. Bacteria would be bad, small animals would be worse, intelligent life would be alarming. Ruins of ancient alien civilizations would be horrible. The best case scenario for us right now is that Mars is sterile, that Europa's oceans are devoid of life, and the vast arms of the Milky Way harbor only empty oceans hugging dead continents. That there are billions of empty planets waiting to be discovered and to be filled up with life. Billions of new homes waiting for us to finally arrive. How likely is it that we'll find life outside of Earth that is similar to us? Well, that depends on how many planets there are out there in their star's Goldilocks zone, the area around the star where water can be liquid. Because stars come in all sizes and configurations, this zone is different for every star system and requires a little bit of physics to figure out. If that sounds like fun to you, this quiz from Brilliant helps to break down the maths for exactly how this is calculated. Brilliant is a problem-solving website that teaches you to think like a scientist by guiding you through problems. They take concepts like these, break them up into bite-sized bits, present clear thinking in each part, and then build back up to an interesting conclusion. If you visit brilliant.org slash nutshell or click the link in the description, you can sign up for free and learn all kinds yes. of things. <laughs> and as a bonus for quite a strange viewers, the first 688 like, people what is will also get 20% <laughs> off their annual membership. And if you do Was find there just life a on the planet, it may be wise to leave them alone for a while. If you're an easier nut. I, I mean, I love gray video, actually. Yeah. On the I internet, EGP my little robot's in there, and he's gonna go on the set for my Krausus that's gonna be over there. How machine learn? Rules for rulers, always a good video. Yeah, let's let's learn about dictators. Do you want to rule? Yeah, Do you this see will be the last video. In your country and know how to fix them. If only It'll fill the whole the void. To do so. I remember well, when Gray came out with this video, right everyone was like, this is such a Gray thing to make. This lesson in political power. Ask yourself, why don't rulers okay. see as clearly as you? This is the Instead, acting in such selfish, self-destructive, short-sighted ways. Are they stupid, these most powerful people in the world? Or is it something else? The throne looks omnipotent from afar, but it is not as it seems. Take the throne to act, and the throne acts upon you. Accept that, or turn back now, before we discuss the rules for rulers. No matter how bright the rays of any sun king, no man rules alone. A king can't build roads alone, I'm can't Anchor enforce Anchor. laws alone, can't defend the it's nation like or himself alone. The power of a king is not to act, but to get others to act on his behalf, using the treasure in his vaults. A king needs an army and someone to run it, treasure and someone to collect it, law and someone to enforce it. The individuals needed to make the necessary things happen are the king's keys to power. All the changes you wish to make are but thoughts in your head if the keys will not follow your commands. In a dictatorship where might makes right, the number of keys to power is small. Perhaps only a dozen generals, bureaucrats, and regional leaders. Sway them to your side and the power to rule is yours. But never forget, displease them and they will replace you. Now all countries lie on a spectrum, from those where the ruler needs few key supporters to those where the ruler needs many. This foundation of power is why countries are different. You never think about the many keys for few rules are the same. First, get the key supporters on your side. With them, you have the power to act. You have everything. Without them, you have nothing. Now, in order to keep those keys to power, you must second 
control the treasure. You must make sure your treasure is raised and distributed <laughs> to you for your returns. hard work and to the keys needed to keep your position. Yeah. This yeah. is your true work as a ruler, figuring out how best to raise and distribute resources so as not to yourself. topple the house of cards upon which your throne sits. Now you, aspiring benevolent dictator, may want to help your citizens, but your right. control of the treasure is what attracts rivals. So you must keep those keys loyal. Oh my god. But there's only you see so all that much Bitcoin treasure in your vault. So much wealth your kingdom I don't think I had noticed that so before. Be aware, every bit of treasure spent on citizens <laughs> is treasure not spent on loyalty. Thus doing the right thing, spending the wealth of the nations on the citizens of the nation, hands a tool of power acquisition to your rivals. Treasure poured into roads and universities and hospitals okay. is treasure a rival can promise to key supporters if only they switch sides. Benevolent dictators can spend yeah. their take on the citizens, but the keys must get their rewards, for even if you have gathered the most loyal, angelic supporters, they have the same problem nice. as you, just one level down. Being a key to power is a position of power. They too must watch out for rivals from below When was this above. already three Thus, years ago? Thus, the treasure they get must also uh. be spent to maintain their position. The loyal and dim may stay by your side long. no matter what, but smart Probably. key supporters will always watch the balance of power, ready to change allegiance if you look to be the loser in a shifting web of alliances. In countries where the keys are few, the rewards are great, and when violence rules, Three? the most ruthless are attracted, and angels that build good works will lose to devils that don't. So buy all the loyalty you can because loyalty in dictatorial organizations of all kinds is everything, for the ruler anyway. Okay. Thus, the dictatorship exposed, a king who needs his court to raise the treasure to keep the court loyal and keep raising the treasure. This Feel is the self-sustaining core of power, oh, no. all oh. outside is secondary. Now, a king with many key supporters has real problems. Not just their expense, but also their competing needs Arabic. and rivalries are difficult okay, to balance. The more complicated the social and financial Arabic. web between Maybe them all, the more able a rival is to sway a critical mass. The more key supporters a ruler has on average, the shorter their reign. Which brings us to the third rule for rulers, minimize key supporters. If a key in your court becomes unnecessary, his skills no longer required, you must kick him out. Bacteria After a successful coup, the new dictator will purge some it of disrupts. those who helped him come to power I while working with the underlings of the previous first. dictator, which from the outside seems a terrible yeah. idea. Why abandon your fellow revolutionaries? Are the old Which dictator's one? supporters not a danger? But the keys necessary to gain power yes. are not <laughs> the same as those needed to keep it. You can, Having someone you have on all the tools now. who was vital in the past you but useless space. now is the same as spending the money on the citizens. Hold them Treasure with nuclear war and become their new and by definition, a dictator that pulls off a coup has promised totally greater treasure to those switching sides. The size of the vault has not that changed, so, so the treasure must be split among fewer. A dictator that sways the other, right like, keys, takes control of the treasure, cuts unnecessary spending, kills unnecessary keys, will have Easter a long eggs, right? and successful career. Seeing the structure unveiled, you they might be excited to get started and control a country to the best. Okay. Like referendum. That's cute. Benefit That's a thing from the your podcast. Ponies. Or you might be exhausted, smart man. wishing this is to really remove, complicated. but seeing the structural <laughs> difficulties now turn to democracy for salvation. And so let us discuss a lot of rulers <laughs> as representatives. You again might have grand dreams of the utopia you wish to build, but <laughs> no City man skylines. rules alone, and never more so than in democracy. Presidents and prime ministers must negotiate with their senates Additional and parliaments and vice versa, and they all have their own key supporters to manage. In a well-designed democracy, power Everyone is fractured among go through many and is taken like not with force, but Easter. with words, <laughs> meaning you must get thousands or millions of citizens to if not like you on election day, at least like you better than the alternative. With so many voters and such fractured power, it's impossible to, as a dictator would, follow these rules 
and buy loyalty. That's great. Or is it? Of course not. Don't think of citizens as individuals oh with gosh, their individual a Marty desires, there. but instead as divided into blocks. The elderly or homeowners or business owners or the poor. Blocks you can reward as a group. Democracies have wildly complicated tax codes and laws, not as accident, but as reward for the blocks that get and keep the ruling representatives in power. Farming subsidies, for example, have nothing oh, to do bulk. with the food a nation needs, that's but a, entirely with how key the thing, vote of the farming the block with. is. Countries where that farmers vote don't are. swing elections don't have farming subsidies. If a block say. doesn't vote, such as younger okay. citizens, then no Physics. need to divert rewards their way. Even if large in number, they are irrelevant to gaining power. Which is good news for you. One less block to sway, and the treasure you give your key blocks oh has gosh. to come from somewhere. If you want long years so in much office, more rule to go. three is your friend in a democracy just as much as a dictatorship. You can't eliminate those who don't vote for you, but there is still much you can do. Once in power, make it easier for your key blocks to vote and harder for others. Establish voting systems that Music. reduce the number of blocks you need to win, the more rivals you get. Very okay. handy indeed. Draw Very election respond. borders to predetermine the results for you okay. or your cronies, and have party pre-elections with Byzantine rules to determine who blocks you can vote for. Mix and match the above for even better power perpetuation. When and? approval ratings couldn't be lower, yes. yet re-election rates Betty couldn't be higher, you'll know you've succeeded. Now, enough with thinking about the citizens. Even That's in a democracy, there still are very influential individual <laughs> key supporters you need on your side because their money or influence or favors keeps you in power. While you can't just promise to give them treasure directly you, as a dictator today? would, you can create loopholes for their investments, right. pass laws that they've written, okay. or print get out of jail free cards that make for their straight. actions. Not a wheelbarrow of gold to the door, but contracts for their business. No? You as a ruler do have roads to build or computers to maintain the or buildings to reconstruct. No man rules alone, Sorry. after all. Yeah. Or you okay, could so take the go. moral path and Bend. ignore the big keys, but you'll fight against those who didn't. Good luck with that. Corruption Excuse is not some kind of petty crime, but rather a Definitely. tool of power in democracies and dictatorships. But more on that another time. So accept the <laughs> favor to sway like... the key blocks and you will get into power, ruling oh, with actions that look contradictory and stupid to those who don't understand the game, privately helping a powerful industry you publicly denounced, or the passing laws does. that hurt a block that voted that for you. But your job isn't to have a consistent, it's understandable lactose. ruling Glucose. policy, but to balance lactose. the interests of your key Glucose to fructose. power, big Sucrose. and small. That is how you stay in office. Now, with all this headache of being Below a representative, you may wonder, <laughs> looking at Rule 3, why couldn't you skip all this block-building, yes. favor-trading nonsense and just something. bribe the army to take power? We must finally turn to taxes and revolts. You must understand Rule 2 and how the treasure is raised and used to hold a country together. If we graph the tax rate of countries versus the number of key supporters the ruler needs, there's a clear relationship. Okay. More democracy, lower taxes. If you're sitting comfortably in a cushy democracy, you may scoff at this, but your fellow citizens who don't earn enough don't pay income taxes and get rebates, bringing the average tax rate down. In dictatorships, this doesn't happen. Dictatorships and often forego and tax paperwork in favor of just taking wealth directly. It's common for the dictator to force farmers to sell their produce to him for little, then turn around and sell it on the open market, or pocketing the difference at an unthinkably yeah. high equivalent Gotta tax take rate. That potassium so taxes in Gotta democracies are low in comparison Boy. to dictatorships. But why do representatives lower their taste? Well, cutting taxes is a crowd pleaser. Dictators okay, have okay. no need to please the crowds and thus can take a large percentage from their poor citizens to pay key supporters. But representatives in a democracy can take a smaller percentage from each to pay their key supporters okay. because their educated, freer citizens are more productive <laughs> peasants. Like, 
four rulers in a democracy, the more productivity, the better, which is why they build universities and hospitals and roads right. and grant freedoms, not just out of the goodness of their hearts, but because it increases citizen productiveness, which increases treasure for the ruler and their key supporters, even when a lower percentage is so. taken. Democracies are better places to live than dictatorships, not because representatives are better people, but because their Edition. needs happen to be aligned it with a index. large portion of the population. The things that make citizens more productive also make their lives better. Representatives want everyone productive so everyone gets highways. The worst dictators are those whose incentives are aligned with the that. fewest citizens, I don't watch those this who have the fewest keys to power. The this explains when it why came out. It was the like worst a morning, dictatorships I was have something in common. Gold or oil or diamonds or symbols. Like if my, the wealth of a nation right is mostly this. dug out of the ground, it's a so terrible it's like place to live because a gold mine can run with very dying slaves and still produce great treasure. Oil is harder, Ian, but luckily, we're literally staying for like the last of this video. Come on. Without any citizen involvement. With citizens outside <laughs> this cycle, they can be ignored while the ruler is rewarded and the keys to power and kept better. loyal. Thus, we live in a world where the best, smartest democracies are stable, the worst, the richest end. dictatorships are stable, and in between is a valley of revolution. The resource-rich dictators build roads only from their ports to their resources and from their palace to the airport, and the people My stay quiet so not because the this is fine or even because they're scared, but because the cold truth is starving, disconnected Great. illiterates don't make good revolutionaries. Now, a middling dictator without resources must, as mentioned before, so take far. a large Damn amount it. of wealth directly from his poor farmers and Protein factory food. workers. Thus, and two roads see. won't do, and so he must maintain some minimums of life for the citizens. But keeping the workforce somewhat connected and somewhat <laughs> educated like and Is it like somewhat really story healthy based? makes them more able to revolt. Or do you just feel now attacked by the game? The romantic mm -hmm. image of the people storming the gates and overthrowing their dictator is mostly a fantasy. If you run a middling dictatorship, the people only storm the palace when the army lets them to Made remove you G. because you lost control yeah. over your keys and are being replaced. This is why the after popular <laughs> revolts in middling dictatorships, Made the new jobbers. ruler is often the same as the old, if not worse. The people didn't replace the king, the court replaced the king, using the people's protest they let happen to do it. The very things That's a all. benevolent dictator wants to build to cross this valley uh -huh. take treasure away from the keys to power Elf and Elf. make the citizens more able to revolt often ending in a stronger ruler, Phosphatase. less likely to build bridges Phosphat and more loyal to his keys. On the other side, the best democracies are stable, Routine not just Phosphat. because the large number of keys and their competing desires makes dictatorial revolt near impossible to organize, but also because Phosphatase the revolt would destroy the very wealth it intended to capture. The high productivity if you of the citizens. Something, Plus, is that those when you helping the would-be dictator the in a democracy know he plans to cull key supporters once the in best. power. That's what a coup is. Personally. So potential key supporters must okay. weigh the probability of surviving the cull and getting the rewards Ponder. versus the risk of being on been trying to go in and play Dragon Age. And I finally they downloaded it because it was only like $5. In a stable democracy, that's a terrible that gamble. Maybe you'll be incredibly we don't watch wealthy, videos but on probably on you'll Sunday. be dead and have made the lives of everyone you know worse. The math says no. Being but on Mark the right really side of the coup the in a dictatorship video. means having so, the resources sure to get you here. and your family what the peasants lack, health care, education, and quality of life. This is what makes Sorry, the competition for power so fierce. But in a democracy, most already have these oh my gosh, creatine, so why isn't risk that, it? Like, so the more the wealth of a nation comes from like, the productive citizens of the nation, the more the power gets spread out and the more the ruler must maintain the quality of life for those citizens, the less the less. Now, if a stable democracy becomes very poor, or if a resource that dwarfs the productivity of the citizens is found, the odds of this gamble change and make it more possible for a small star. group to seize power. Because if the current quality Rats of life there. is terrible, or the wealth not dependent on the citizens, okay. coups are worth the 
risk. When democracies fall, these are usually the reasons. These rules for rulers explain not only why some men are monsters and others are merciful, but everything about politics, from the war to foreign aid to political dynasties to corruption, all of which we can talk about at another time. But for now, you aspiring ruler may be disgusted by the world of politics and have decided to avoid it entirely. But you cannot, for rulers come in many forms. Yes, kings, presidents, and prime ministers, but also deans, dons, mayors, chairs, chiefs. These rules apply to all and explain their actions. From the CEO of the largest global corporate conglomerate who must keep his board happy to the chair of the smallest homeowners association, managing votes and spending membership and fees. You cannot escape structures of power. Ooh. You can only turn a blind eye to understanding nice. them. And if you ever want Analyzing the change it. you dream about, there's a zeroth rule you cannot ignore. Without power, you can affect nothing. You may not like these rules, but surely better you on the throne than someone else. And who knows, maybe you'll be different. That's strong. Rules is fault. Dang. Which we made it. Why did I not mention my suffering citizen status yet? <laughs> mm. I can't. Wow, look at me. What, what am I? Do you guys want to see the line that my glasses are going to make? Being here this long? All that makeup that's just like. <laughs> Gotta take off the makeup wipe. Release the hair. I'm getting it cut Saturday. Will be the last time you guys see this. We will be back to the this next time. Here, we'll be like here. I'll be cute again. Just that. Thanks for hanging out on an educational journey with me, friends. But there are twelve million people on Earth who are not citizens. Wait, I need to I need to know details, but it may be like depending on Seattle. Yeah. yeah. Dude, it will. You will be the long haired man. But yes, I might I might debating. I'm I might do some doodling on my tablet because I have some design stuff to do for work in the morning. And I don't want to wake up exactly early, but I don't want to not have an idea of what I'm doing when I wake up, so I might be laying in bed with my tablet. <laughs> uh, but anyways, guys, see you Sunday. Else, love you guys. Hope you learned something. Or, you know, even if that's how to take over the world or destroy. See you next. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>